Okay. I'm starting this stream a little bit later than normal. However, on the plus side, so uh, I think this, at least in recent memory, is the longest it's taken me to actually get a stream started. And uh, hello, Kuan. Yes, you, you were first in chat. It was very quick. Um, yeah, so it's a little past four at the time of me starting the stream. It's definitely a little bit later than I expected. However, I actually don't think this is quite as bad as a lot of my previous times when I was late to start. Because this time the character is already, you know, set to go. So I have to do literally no setup. In fact, I'm actually just going to kind of jump right into it. And at the start here, so I'm level 32 now. To be clear, um, just I, I always like to give this as a heads up for people who aren't aware of how I like to do these. Uh, this is meant to be a 40 to 60 testing run. And, you know, obviously I'm not level 40, but, you know, the entire point of these types of test runs are instead of doing a full 10 to 60, because the reality is, and I can say this with firsthand experience, having literally just played through it this morning, uh, I got this mage up from level 1 to 32 in the last, I don't know, however many hours while I was, like, casually doing other stuff. And it's the exact same thing that you'll see on any mage run that I'll do. Because mages, I mean, they're good for leveling, but the thing about low-level mage play is it's basically the same for all three specs, uh, which kind of means it's one of the reasons why I've said, like, Frost and Fire aren't bad at low levels, but honestly, so far with Frost, I've been just pressing Arcane Explosion a lot. Now, it has some other stuff going for it, like, uh, I mean, shifting powers on the mage regular tree and comet storms fine uh frozen orb is fine uh, like there's a decent amount of stuff that's like solid with uh frost but i've still been like for the most part right now just been using arcane explosion right at low levels for aoe because generally like the problem with blizzard at low levels is this hits a fairly small area and when you're trying to round up a bunch of mobs especially like for retail you're pulling mobs from different, like, areas and trying to group them all up in one tight space. And having to play around a small location with Blizzard and also having a cast time... Honestly, having a cast time on anything is already kind of bad. But then when you have to do that and place it on a specific location and have the mobs sit in there for the damage to actually be done... Or you could just press Arcane Explosion, which does almost as much damage, but allows you to be, like, kiting while moving and stuff like this... It's just the utility of this spell is so much stronger, which is kind of why Arcane is so strong at low levels, just because Arcane Explosion is broken, and you just play into that even further. So, you still have it, right? As a Frost, like, you still have the option to keep going with that. So, Frost isn't bad, but, you know, that's the main thing. So, the entire point, right? All of that to say, uh, hello, um, Audest. I, I don't know if I pronounced that correctly. All the reason I'm saying this is the reason why this run is starting at 32 and why a lot of the other runs start at like 40. And honestly, this run would have started at 40 had I had more time to get set up. Because right now, there's really not a ton special about Frost. It's like a slightly different flavor of Arcane. But, you know, if you... I think the Fire Mage run is actually a very good example. As you start to get to higher levels and you start unlocking more and more of the talent tree... The specs kind of come into their own towards the end. And when you have the full kit online, which like for fire, you don't even get into like 36 or something. Um, and even then, it, it still doesn't really get its full potential until later. But when fire comes online for real, like it feels completely different to how Arcane plays, but it is still very strong in its own right. And I think we'll kind of see that with Frost as things go on. Because right now, like for instance... As I said, Blizzard is just not even really worth pressing at this level. But I've looked ahead and I've also talked to uh, one of the mages of my guild, Bang, who is really good at Frost and like talked to him about it and like some of the later talent picks. And I have a feeling that as you get to higher levels, Blizzard will actually be worth playing around and you'll get like other good synergies, like some of the ones in particular. This is what I've gone so far as far as talents. The mage tree at this point is pretty set in stone. Uh, there's not a whole lot that I'll really be wanting to do. I think while I normally went for some of like the more survivability-oriented stuff on other classes, 
I'm probably going to go down here for, like, Frost Nova stuff, because Frost Nova is, in a weird way, like, actually beneficial to your damage from Frost Mages. I guess it kind of makes sense when you think about it, but you get my point. Like, it actually has damage impacts because of the, the whole, like, rooted targets, shattering them gives you more damage and whatnot. Um, and then there's, like, some stuff down here, obviously. It, this is pretty straightforward. Like, you'll see this on all the mage runs. For Frost so far, I've mostly just been going with, like, generic damage multipliers. Uh, I rushed Comet Storm as early as I could, because Comet Storm's obviously pretty good. Any sort of burst AoE, we all know this. Like, buttons where you could press it and it does a lot of damage, they're good. It's the reason why Orbital Strike for Boomkins is good, even though it's, by all accounts, pretty terrible at max level. While leveling, Orbital Strike is pretty sweet, as we all saw in the Boomkin speedrun. So... Obviously, Comet Storm is actually good for Frost Mages at max level, but uh, while leveling, this is like a no-brainer. You pick it up ASAP. Uh, hello, Anolana. Uh, Blizzard is not worth pressing. <laughs> it's true about the company, too. Oh, yeah. Shit, unintentional burn. Uh, Neko no Kenshi said, love your content. Thank you. I'm glad to hear it. Uh, Comet Strike is super fun. Yeah. Um... So, okay, so what am I going to be doing for talents? The class tree is pretty straightforward, I guess. Um, since I have the run completely set up and ready to go, I might as well explain some stuff beforehand, give people time to get here before I, like, actually just jump into stuff. In fact, you know what I could do? Uh, so what I'm going to be doing right now, just because, honestly, I feel like it, and because it's not like a... We're not doing the speed run for the timed aspect of it. Um... Like, I have a bunch of speedruns where I try to optimize the route and min-max the time. So here, I'm actually going to fucking do Lich King Dungeons, because why not, right? Like, I barely ever do Lich King Dungeons. They're not bad. It's, like, just slightly less efficient than Burning Crusade. And by the time you get to 30, like, this... You can still do dungeons at this level, and it's not terrible. But it's just, like, questing ends up being faster. But there's kind of, like, this weird slush time from, like, 30 to 40 where... While well, questing is faster, and obviously for actual speedruns I do it, I'm going to be honest that having slow flying is just such a drag. So, because we're just testing Frost Mage anyways, and it doesn't really matter, like, the speed, I'm just going to say fuck it and do some dungeons to fill the void. I'll probably still quest after I've done, like, gotten done explaining what my talents are going to be, just so I'm not, like, sitting here doing nothing, but I figure this is a good way to kill two birds with one stone. And then when I get to level 40 and I have fast flying, then I will do quests, because at that point it feels pretty nice. Uh, is this on live? Yes. Uh, yeah, I mean, whenever I do dungeons, it's on live servers, because if it's on PTR, you're not going to find people for dungeons. Um, so yeah, this is live servers. Uh, you should be able to snipe me. Uh, Buddy Man said early speed. Uh, welcome to the stream, Buddy Man. You did get here pretty early. Uh, Trevlik people said awesome timing. You just started leveling a frost mage. Nice. Yeah, I'm kind of interested to see how it plays at higher levels because I like. So there's many specs that I've played where we think that it's going to be not super great, and I end up being surprised. Frost Mage is a little bit different in that I already know Frost is going to be good. The only question is, is it going to be really good, or is it just going to be fine? Like, I I would be surprised if I end up putting Frost below, like, A tier. Like, I think it, personally, my prediction is it's, like, low A tier. But the thing about Frost is, like, Mage in general, it just has so many good tools. There's a reason why Arcane, I would say, is, like, top 5 in general for, like, fastest leveling specs. And... Fire was a case where I thought Fire was going to be, like, okay, but not super great, and it ended up being very strong, like, competitive with Arcane at higher levels. Um, not better, I don't think, overall, but still very good. Definitely A tier in terms of, like, leveling specs. Um, and I think Frost has the potential to get there, because while there is some jank in its kit, right, with, like, how Blizzard works, the reality is at this level... That doesn't hurt Frost at all, because, like I said, you can just press Arcane Explosion. So it ends up being a worse version of Arcane, but a slightly worse version of one of the best leveling specs in the game is still a good leveling spec. And it's not like Frost doesn't have anything going for it. So if Frost was literally just strictly worse than Arcane, then, of course, that would be like... Yeah, you know, maybe that's not super great, and, you know, it, it's kind of like the situation you run into with Feral where Guardian Druid is really, 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 really good, and Feral Druid is, like, a pretty much worse version of Guardian. But Frost is still pretty solid, 
and it's only slightly worse than Arcane in specific instances, but it also has really good kiting potential with like all of its slows and stuff that it applies. So in some ways, it's like a safer Arcane. Whereas Arcane can do more damage, but it requires you to be like really active about how you kite. So far, my feeling with Frost is like, I can do comparable damage, but it's a little bit safer. Let me just uh, get everything set up. I need to use my experience potion. And I think those are all the consumables I have at this level. And then just bear with me as I uh, get all this stuff set up. I'm trying to make sure I don't, like, get distracted and uh, waste my time. Or waste the group's time here. I also like how Frost has, especially at low levels, a lot of aware... No, that guy's going the wrong way. Up here. Frost has a lot of instant cast abilities. Like, Flurry isn't the craziest thing I've ever seen, but it's, um... It's fine. And it just does a nice instant chunk of single target damage. I should also note, I said before, Blizzard is not worth pressing. That is more so like when you're in open world questing. Obviously here where the tank is able to just sit there and keep the mobs grouped up. Yeah, Blizzard's fine. But generally speaking, the reason I don't like to do dungeons a ton is because it's a little bit different than questing. So I think this maybe will give an actual nice way of looking at things where we'll have dungeons at the start to kind of look at. It's like, oh, how does it play when you have people to just sit there and tank stuff for you? And then how does it play when you actually need to do all your kiting and stuff like that? And as we know, like, Arcane can do its full damage rotation while moving, in most cases, uh, at least at lower levels. But can Frost do that? Like, is that going to severely hurt it? We'll see. Anyways, uh, let me respond to chat a little bit because I see some people are uh, joining in here. Up there. Uh... This early on? We're having fucking connection issues? Let me just make sure everything's good. Uh, okay. Well, I didn't disconnect. The stream probably froze for a second, according to YouTube. But I don't think that actually had any significant impact. Anyways. It's good now? Okay, cool. And this boss uh, both on Wrath Classic and Retail, you can kind of ignore the entire staircase thing. It maybe helps to have one person AoEing them, just so, like you don't get overwhelmed, but literally the only part of this fight that matters is the stupid crystal handlers. And uh, I should note, one of the reasons why I decided I was going to do Wrath Dungeons, combination of like, I was bored and I wanted to do something different than the usual route, uh, and then I was like, oh, maybe I should do dungeons. Wrath Classic dungeons are generally, or Wrath dungeons in general are pretty good. But also, later on in the stream, I'm actually going to be doing some dungeons on Wrath Classic. And I think what I'll probably do is at least briefly do some Titan Rune dungeons, just because I want to knock that out. And I also still have to finish my Titan Rune Gamma Guide. So there's not a ton to say for those new dungeons, because they are decently similar to how dungeons played in titan rune beta but since i want to do my dailies anyway and i'm going to be playing wrath classic i think it'll be cool to at least showcase that once and also i know there's a lot of people who like don't play wrath classic at all and have never seen how the hard modes work and a lot of times when i've showed the wrath classic hard mode dungeons to my friends they've been like oh that's cool like i didn't realize wrath actually added new content like that so Maybe some people will see it and it'll make them want to play too. We'll see. But also, the main reason is later on in the stream, I'm going to be leveling up a character in Wrath Classic. Obviously not the entire way, because it's, well, still a very long time to level in Classic, even with the changes. But right now in Classic, it's actually super nice to level a character. Uh, there's obviously, like, the experience buff, right? But on top of that, the quality of life features that they've added in the ICC patch are amazing. It's like retail levels of quality of life in Classic, and it actually does help with leveling. Which, you know, I know some Classic purists are going to be really mad about because, oh no, my Classic, you know, they're adding retail features, like this is the end of the world. But obviously as somebody who enjoys playing both versions of the game, and, you know, the thing I like about Classic is exper experiencing like the old class design and stuff like that, not necessarily, you know, having to pull teeth with some of the old annoying features. So the fact that we're now getting like retail features to make classic more streamlined, but we still get like that classic gameplay and stuff. It's literally just the best of both worlds for me. So 
I've been having a lot of fun with that, and I think it will be fun to showcase that. And honestly, going forward, I'm probably going to do some more Wrath leveling content because I'm actually very excited about it. Uh, I don't know if I'll start doing Wrath speedruns just yet, because I know I've teased that for a while, that it's something I've been looking into. And initially it was going to be like a more further out thing, like kind of closer to December, once like everything had settled down with patch 10.2 and there wasn't like any guides that I still had to make, I was going to start looking into that. But at this point, I'm actually kind of really excited to try it, so maybe I will start doing some Wrath speedruns sooner than I had initially expected. We shall see. Um, let's see... What else did I miss? Uh, oh, uh, Neo said, Hey there, you're six. You might not be able to chat that much, but you're going to stay and watch. You have epilepsy. Oh, shit. Epilepsy, um, that's the thing with, like, the, the flashing lights, right? Uh, so, I mean, hopefully there's no flashing lights or anything on the stream. I guess Arcane Explosion is... I don't know. That, does that count? I don't really... I'm not an expert at epilepsy. I Maybe I'm confusing it with something else. But that's, uh... I'm sorry to hear that. That sucks. Definitely. Either way, I appreciate you tuning into the stream. And you don't need to worry about, like, you know, not talking as much as you usually do. That's fine. You know, obviously not a concern. Uh... Neko no Kenshi said, You've heard Mage in general has been in a few of the realm firsts. Uh, well... So, you need to kind of separate solo speedrunning, which is what I do in, like... If we're talking about, um, and obviously specifically for retail, Mage in Classic is a very, very different beast. So, obviously, it's no secret that Frost Mage, especially for Classic World of Warcraft, like Vanilla Era, is very, 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 very powerful. That is just kind of a separate thing, though. Because the reality is, Frost Mage in Vanilla has ridiculous AoE potential that nobody else has. When you get to retail, generally speaking, while leveling, like, most classes have the same general damage potential, I would say, compared to one another. Uh, I can use the... What's the thing that summons Drakuru? Aren't I supposed to be able to summon him? I don't know, maybe it didn't work. Use Drakuru's elixir at his brazier inside Drakthern. Does it specifically have to be that top razor? Oh, whatever. Okay, I guess I can't turn in this quest. Uh, I figured I could do it at both, but it's not a big deal. Um, let's just keep going. And I will take a moment to just open these things, then clear out my bags. New appearance. Nice. It's this ice crust cloak. Um, yeah, so, all that to say, Mage is definitely a very strong class. Like, that is no secret, right? It just in general, across... Oh, that that was fucking Jakuru's Elixir. Maybe I could have used it. Too late now, but... I didn't realize. I thought this was my one of my fucking flasks. Whatever. Um, any reason for leveling on Wrath Chromie time? Just feel like it. Yeah, th this isn't, like, new speedrun tech. Wrath Dungeons are not bad. They are slightly worse than TBC Dungeons. Uh, I'm just doing it right now because I feel like changing it up. So I'm going to be doing this and maybe some other dungeons until uh, 40, and then we'll be doing the standard questing route. But, uh, what was I saying? Yeah, Mage in general, very strong class, very versatile, especially because even if Frost isn't good, right, like Arcane usually is, uh, fire is really good a lot of the time. So classic, it's very strong. In retail, mage generally is not like the best in the game anymore for solo leveling, even though it is like in classic. In retail, it tends to not be. It's still very strong, but it simply can't compete against some of the stronger leveling specs up there when it comes to like literally just pure solo, just for a variety of reasons, right? Mostly tankiness. Mage can definitely kite really well, and that's good. And in most cases, that's more than enough. But a lot of specs are still able to do more damage at low levels and face tank everything like Guardian Druids, right? So they are still not absolutely amazing for that. Mage in like world first, like fresh expansion launch comps, 
that is probably almost always going to have like one of them in the group of course that gets kind of weird because the strategies that people use for like the world first leveling stuff is always a bit janky it's the reason why every time there's a new expansion i just level completely solo and i try to go for like a good solo time for fresh expansion launches and well i up until dragonflight i've managed to achieve that dragonflight i obviously got screwed because area 52 was down for like six hours but uh, I still think, considering I could barely play for the first six hours, I actually think I did really well on Dragonflight launch. Unfortunately, it did mean I wasn't able to stream it, because after three hours of that, I just turned off my stream. Um, but at all other expansion launches, that's what I've done. But Mage, obviously, is just good in general, and a lot of the time, the like world-first strategy is like you'll see four people funneling one person to try and get them uh like to a really high level or something so like stuff like warlock mage for like the portals and basically just teleporting somebody around to different places so they go off they level in one area and like the four other people can go do something either like pre-complete a dungeon and then warlock summon them to the final boss or they go like I, I, I don't know, like, do something else. There's always some weird strategy, and it usually involves having four people, including a warlock and sometimes a mage, doing something in one area while the other person levels. And then, you know, in Dragonflight, it was even weirder, where you had, like, now was getting people to funnel him items for profession leveling and, and all that crazy shit. So definitely mage is good for a lot of reasons, but uh, it's... Not always the same reasons, uh, depending on what content you're doing. But I guess that is one of the strengths of mages, right? They are pretty versatile. Like, if you're not bringing them for their just general good damage, you might be bringing them for their portals, which for leveling is actually pretty good utility. It's one of the reasons why you don't really need to be a dark iron on a mage, because they have portals to Ironforge, which lets them completely bypass one of the biggest time sinks in the run of, like, travel time all over the place. So that is definitely very good. Oh my god. Okay, I have threat and I'm not getting healed. This is spooky. Let me just uh, stand back for a little bit then. Uh, let's see. You think Gundrak is worth doing normally? Um, Gundrak is good. I don't know. It's So the problem with Wrath Dungeons, right, is... There's a lot of dungeons in a variety of different expansions that if you could specifically queue for them and still get, like, the random dungeon bonus, which, as we've mentioned, is quite significant, those dungeons would be good. Honestly, you could even point out, like, Temple of the Jade Serpent is another great example where it's a really, really efficient dungeon. But a lot of the other dungeons you may get in MOP, in fact, I'll just say in instance chat, jump into the water, there's a shortcut back this way yeah so for wrath classic i always do this i would imagine most people in retail know it by now um but this makes titan rune gamma gun track much easier because you can skip pretty much all the trash that said unfortunately gun track in wrath classic actually has some of the most difficult bosses difficult by wrath classic standards but sladron I would say, unironically, Sladron is, in Wrath Classic, the hardest of any Titan Rune Gamma boss. Uh, where did everybody go? Oh, they they tried to run up in the middle of there. I think somebody went up there, and then the rest of them got baited and followed that person. And they were trying to get up from there. I was so confused. Um, anywho. Uh, yeah, Sladron is rough. And there's also some, like, annoying things on the other bosses... I still believe, like, Drakari Colossus, it's not hard, per se, to deal with, but especially because when you do this skip, like, I usually pull these Drakari Golems, they come tethered to this uh, mob, and it's not impossible to deal with, but a lot of tanks I see do this skip aren't prepared for the two Drakari Golems, and then they just start whacking people, and the whole thing spirals out of control, so... This is another pull that can be a little bit spooky, even if it does make Gundrak really quick when it's done properly. And then, within the context of Wrath Classic, the new Mythic Plus affixes, follow me. Uh, so, best part about this, back the way we came. 
down here. Oh, no, this guy's pulling. Ah, oh, fuck. Well, I'm still going to show them the skip because it's cool. It's obviously in my Gundrak dungeon guide. But if you guys haven't played Wrath Classic, you may not know my the typical route for this. Um, okay, they're pulling shit. <laughs> I'm not going to ditch these guys. Hopefully they follow me so we can do the skip. At this point, it's kind of a moot point. Uh, hello, Mateus Nunes. Good to see you. And I gotta get mine. I, I guess we need the Drakari history tablets for the dungeon quest. Anyway, so. It's like... Not a big deal, but... It's a fun skip! So here, if we go all the way back... Don't you usually do Draenor? Yes. Yeah, this is not like a new routing change or anything. This is literally, I just felt like doing Wrath Classic Dungeons. I feel like I'm probably going to have to answer that question a lot. Which, you know, is what it is. I don't mind. Um, you're leveling a Frost Mage following my last Arcane Mage stream? Awesome. Yeah, so my favorite part about Gundrak by far is this skip. Because so few people actually know it exists. And it's such a cool skip. There, This random ass tunnel, like underwater... That you can just completely bypass this section. And there is a similar skip if you just jump off the cliff over here. But it's not as cool, you know? And the amount of times where I've done this, like, underwater tunnel skip in Wrath Classic and just had people in party chat go like, what the fuck? I never knew this was here. Like, it just makes my day every time. Because it is really cool. You need more of those hidden skips in other dungeons? Yeah. Honestly, I really like Wrath dungeon design. Overall, it's one of the reasons why. So, for context, as of yesterday, I have finally finished every single Wrath dungeon guide, which is something I started doing obviously when Wrath Classic came out, uh, you know, a year ago. I made a guide for every single Wrath Classic dungeon, and they honestly did pretty well, and I got really good reception for those. And I had a lot of fun making them. And personally, I think my guides are the best, obviously, but. Uh, one thing that I can say that I take pride in is whereas, like, a lot of other people at the start of Wrath Classic made some generic clickbait garbage dungeon guides that didn't actually do anything, not only did I put a shit ton of effort into my guides, but I also followed through with it, and I have now made guides for both Trial of the Champion and all three uh, ICC dungeons. So I've officially completed every single one of the guides for Wrath Classic. And obviously, I also covered the, the hard mode ones, which uh, those guys have done well, or have performed good as well. Um, but I had a lot of fun making those guides both like a year ago and today in ICC, because there's so many little cool tricks that you can do in Wrath Dungeons to just save time. Like, there's that little tunnel skip, which is really neat. I also like, in general, just the way that Gundrak works with the fact that there's this central water area that lets you bypass a lot of the trash. Uh, where are they going? Oh, they're probably getting the little tablets. So I guess I'll just sit here and wait. So that aspect of it in general, I find really fun. But also a good example is like recently in the pick of, or I almost said pig of Sauron. In the pit of Sauron guide, there's a little skip that you can do uh, between Ikken Crick and Scourge Lord Tyrannus that bypasses like the hardest trash in the dungeon. And Every single time I do that in, like, the random Dungeon Finder in Wrath Classic, it's, like, the same thing with the Gundrak Tunnel Skip, where nobody knows that you can even do that. And everybody, like, always moans about how terrible that trash is, but then it's like, well, you can just skip it if you do the strategy properly. And, like, showcasing cool little tricks like that, and then actually getting the runs done and recording it and, you know, showcasing that to random groups, um, I always find that really fun. So I... Have had a lot of fun making those Wrath Dungeon Guides, and honestly, I'm really excited to do that in Kata as well, because I actually think Kata also has really good dungeons. Uh, I think a lot of people will criticize Cataclysm, many parts about it, but I actually think... Oh, fuck, I got silenced. Um, I'm just gonna ice block this, this is spooky. Uh, but I think Kata's dungeons are one of its strongest parts. I love Kata dungeons. There's some that are, like, iffy, but overall... I think there's a lot of similar stuff. Honestly, dungeon design... I, I love a lot of the older dungeons, really. TBC dungeons kind of suck, if we're being real. But 
There have been a lot of really good dungeons from, like, Wrath onwards. Mists of Pandaria dungeons, I would say, like, in, in terms of expansions, you know, around that time frame, Mists maybe had the weakest set of dungeons. There's some really good ones, and then there's, like, Siege of Nizao Temple, which, like, Siege of Nizao Temple really fucking sucks. Um, there's so much roleplay, and, like, you have the gong and whatnot, but I really don't like that dungeon, like, at all. Um, I forget, can you, yeah, you can just go over here, and the quest giver is staying in the doorway. There we go. All right, let me take a moment to just catch up on chat a little bit, because I missed a few of the messages. Of course, you start streaming right when you were about to go for a walk. Ah, sorry. I mean, hey, you can watch it while you walk. No, a lot of times I watch stuff on my phone while I walk. It's a good distraction. Uh, Blizzard ability references are just absolutely sending you IRL. <laughs> yeah. Uh, is Frost not an optimal spec for Wrath content due to resistances? Oh, no, that's not a thing in retail. Uh, that is not a thing at all in retail WoW at all. Honestly, I, I don't even think it's a thing in Classic, right? Like, obviously, in Vanilla Classic, there is resistances. Like, we're talking original Vanilla. Um, pretty sure by the time you get to Wrath Classic, like, enemies resisting your abilities isn't actually a concern. Obviously, resistances still play a small factor. But even then, it's not like, as big of a deal, because, like, I remember reading about the formula, but, it, like, the formula is different in Wrath Classic than it is in, um, Vanilla, right? Where, in Vanilla, wouldn't you completely resist damage, like, entirely? And I think by the time you get to Wrath, it's, uh, partial resistance, what words partial resistances and you get like scaling damage reduction from effects the higher resist you have and there's like certain breakpoints or something like that i forget exactly when we were doing a new barack i looked into it because i had to use some minor frost resist stuff i think most of it you were covered by like frost absorb pots and auras and whatnot but then it's also something that i'm going to need to look into for syndragosa so there's that Vanilla resists stop all the damage by Wrath, it's just ER. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. I vaguely remember hearing that. Also, uh, before I forget, if you are enjoying the stream so far, you know, you could throw it a like, because that obviously helps with the algorithm and stuff. Just want to throw that out there early on, just to remind people. Yeah, the um, the Pit of Sauron running skip, that's what I was talking about, Anilana. Hello, Ken W, good to see you. Uh, let's see. Let me, uh, scroll up and just, uh, catch up where I was before. Grats on finishing the ICC guide. Joyous Journeys is amazing. Yeah. And I'm really happy to have the guides done. Uh, admittedly, I probably lost a good amount of potential views because I only managed to have Forge of Souls ready in time for the patch actually dropping, which... Just me being stupid and, you know, falling behind on scheduling stuff. Admittedly... I think the biggest thing is, like, doing testing for, like, raids and dungeons in 10.2 has drained a lot more time than I thought, especially because I'm organizing my raid testing group, and, like, having to coordinate all of that, it's, it's such a fucking headache. I told myself I wasn't gonna do it this tier, and then I just did it anyways, and just said fuck it, and, I don't know, like, I would rather organize my own raid testing group and actually get it done, and you know, be able to test the content rather than not be able to do raid testing at all. But it it's a lot <laughs> because, you know, I mean, I, I'm effectively trying to put together a raid team for a specific set of hours in the day by pulling from people across multiple different guilds who have multiple different schedules. And a lot of times it doesn't line up and, you know, then I have to double check to see and then sometimes people are like oh i can make it for like the first hour but not the second and it's like okay well do i have somebody who can make it for only the second hour and not the first and it's, it's just it's a lot <laughs> it's a fucking lot so that is kind of consumed a lot of my time thankfully it is almost over um i well i i say thankfully it it has been fun like i enjoy testing but i'm not gonna lie when it gets to like week 
six or seven of raid testing and a lot of people start getting burned out and you really struggle to like fill the roster week to week it makes it even harder for me because you know early on first week i had 30 people ready to go for raid testing easy peasy uh also did i miss a quest or something oh no i have it it's just not showing up on my tracker okay well i gotta get all the little goblets and whatnot um, yeah, like, week one of raid testing, I had 30 people ready to go. We literally had too many, we had to split into two groups because the raid was too laggy. And having 30 people meant, like, everybody's game was stuttering and nobody could actually do anything. So that was, like, a good problem to have. I barely had to do any work. I just, I said I was forming and everybody signed up. And now it's, like, pulling teeth to try and get people to come. And then, you know, people will say, well, I don't really want to raid test, but if you really need people, I'll be there. And it's like, okay, well, the reason I'm asking you to raid test is because I do really need people because at this point, a lot of people don't really want to raid test, but then I feel bad saying that because it's like, okay, well, you've already told me that you don't really want to do it. So I feel bad telling you, yeah, I, I, I kind of do need help, but it's like, it's true. Um, so it, it's just a lot of stress, and I, I had a lot of shit to do this past weekend, last weekend. Obviously, I had the streams. One of the reasons why, at least for right now, I've cut down to only one stream day every weekend. We'll go back to two days in the future, but at the moment, it's just I, I have way too much shit going on. Um, quite frankly, it's already really difficult to set aside time to do one streaming day per week. It's still a lot, but... This is at least, like, something that I can kind of manage to fit into my schedule, whereas, like, two days just drained up way too much time. Um, what was I saying, though? Uh, oh, yeah, so uh, all that to say, fell behind on it. Um, I could have, like, rushed the guides out, but I didn't want to because, you know, the guides ended up being really long. In fact, Pit of Sauron ended up being the second longest dungeon guide I've ever made. Which surprises me, because you would think, like, it's a Wrath Classic dungeon, but there's so many, like, little weird quirks to that dungeon that I felt needed explaining. So, I, like, I spent time trying to trim the script, and it, it was quite long, I shortened it down, and it was still the second longest guide I've ever made, right behind, I think it was Iron Docks was the longest guide that I had made up until that point. Uh, so yeah, definitely ended up being really long. I suppose, in theory, the longest guide that I ever almost made is I scrapped a guide for Lower Karazhan in um, in Season 4 of Shadowlands. It was actually aside from Tazavesh, which I had never planned to make a guide for that season because everybody kind of already knew Tazavesh. Uh, but I made a guide for all of the returning dungeons in Season 4 of Shadowlands at that point. Aside from Lower Karazhan. It was the only one that I didn't make a guide for. And part of that was because I literally, I was writing my script for the Lower Karazan Guide, and I was on page 11 of the script, and I was, like, around two-thirds of the way finished. And to give you an idea, like, the finalized version of my Pit of Sauron Guide was, like, almost eight full pages. Um, or it was almost, it was seven full pages, almost eight pages. Um, and then my Iron Docks Guide, which I said was the longest that I had made, was around eight pages pages in the script so the lower karazan one was at 11 pages and i was still only two-thirds of the way done and by that point the season had already been out for a week and i'm just i was like fuck it I, i'm not finishing this um but i guess that even unfinished that guide was already going to be the longest dungeon guide i had ever made and the reality with um videos like that is, or kind of like all types of videos is the time investment starts to become like exponential because it's like the longer the video is especially an edited one like that it's like then you know if you're, it's a really long dungeon well the script needs to be really 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 long obviously which means i need to test a lot of other things and get footage for like you know random things that may not necessarily be clear in like my regular testing footage and lower care is already just a long dungeon in a vacuum but then also, the recording is going to end up being really long because the reality is most of my recordings when I like read it out and stuff and have to do like retakes and because things didn't sound right the first time, that ends up 
uh, taking like twice as long. And then, you know, I have to trim the audio, make it sound good. And then there's like 30 minutes or whatever of actual then video editing and any like bonus effects I want to put on. And the longer it starts to get, it, it just spirals out of control where, you know, I would say like a 20 minute video compared to a 10 minute video takes like significantly longer. It's not necessarily like one to one, like a 20 minute video doesn't take like twice as long to make as a 10 minute video. It's like more like three times as long to make. Basically everything starts to scale at that point and everything gets longer and longer and takes more time to finish. Uh, so all that to say, um, the Wrath Classic Dungeon Guides are finally all finished, and I'm very happy that they are because, uh, honestly, as I'm just saying now with the Lower Kara one, there have been many cases where I don't get to finish all of them for a variety of reasons. Like, I definitely wanted to finish that Lower Kara guide. Hell, I did many, many testing runs of it on the PTR, and then at, by the time I was actually ready to publish it, it had already been out, and I'd done multiple testing runs on live servers, and I literally wrote 11 pages of a script for it, so I definitely invested a lot of time into it, and I wanted to get it done, but at a certain point, you just need to cut your losses. And I was definitely bummed. I'm always bummed when I have to cancel a video, especially when it's one that I've already spent a lot of time making. It's a bit easier when it's, like, something that I cancel in, like, the conceptual phase, which still sucks. A lot of times I've had a lot of good ideas where I just sit there and I'm trying to think about, like, how I want to translate this into a video, and I just, like, nothing really clicks uh, you know, in my head on, like, how I want to make this. I'm like, yeah, there's a lot of good ideas here, but I, I can't really, like, think of a clear way to make this, and I scrap it. But it's even worse when you invest a lot of time, and you're like, you want to make this just for whatever reason you can't. Um, but I'm glad that didn't happen. I'm glad that I was able to follow through with the Wrath stuff. And now I still need to finish up the, uh, the Titan Rune Gamma stuff, but thankfully the whole titan rune gamma guide should not be too difficult and i also don't feel quite as bad for it uh because my titan rune beta guide is still i would say 90 percent accurate like 90 percent of the information you need to do titan rune gamma dungeons my beta guide still covers that and as a result the new guide that i make is going to be pretty short because I'm not going to, like, repeat the same information. I'm going to say, here's what's new, and if you want to learn about all of the actual mechanics, it's identical to beta dungeons, go check out my previous guide, and that is still relevant. And that's always great, because it, one of the worst things that can happen is when I finish a video, and then some bullshit makes it, like, outdated. Cough, cough, secret Thaldrazis quest line. That one really fucking stings. Because um, I... I, I mean, obviously, that was only, like, a, what, what four-minute video or something, so it wasn't the biggest loss in the world, but another thing that kind of sucks, it, it's actually, I would say, even worse. You know, everything that we just discussed about, it sucks, obviously, scrapping videos. Um, it sucks even harder scrapping videos after you've already published them, because that actually hurts you on YouTube. Uh, there is, like, this weird kind of rebound effect where you, whenever you have to like unlist a video. So I've unlisted a lot of videos in the past, but a lot of times when you like hear me talking about unlisting videos, it's usually because it's not performing well anymore. It's like very old or something. And I just don't want it taking up recommendation space. Uh, but the like secret quest line in Thaldrazis, that's a completely different story where I obviously had to unlist it because it was no longer accurate. Blizzard fucking patched it within, like, three days of it existing. And obviously I can't keep it up there because I don't want people, uh, like, you know, getting misinformed by that. Um, I still need to put a pinned comment explaining the whole situation on the, the speedrun itself, which I'm not going to take down the speedrun. Obviously it fucking sucks that they nerfed that, but, like, you know... The, that one thing being nerfed doesn't change the speedrun itself. Um, you know, it, it still functions. The general process minus the Thaldrasis questline still works uh, in terms of demonstrating, like, what you can do for fast dragonflight leveling. So I'm not going to take that down. But obviously the guide on how to set up the, you know, uh, secret questline in particular, that obviously had to be taken down. And that definitely sucks because I put a lot of work into testing it and making the video and shit. But on top of that, YouTube basically does like a mini punishment. I, I don't really know exactly how it works in the algorithm. I think it's more so that like it was 
allocating like impressions or something for that video and then because the video no longer exists it takes like a little bit for the algorithm to adjust so i don't think it's like any active punishment on youtube's end but you definitely notice like a significant drop in your views whenever you have to like take down a video shortly after you make it that sucks um so i waited until at least tuesday like a full 24 hours after the um thing happened to remove it but at this point it is gone obviously you were about to level an alt and they nerfed that yeah ah <sighs> yeah i'm not gonna i'm not gonna talk on like at length about my thoughts on like blizzard for doing that because it's just one of those things where while it does really suck i said myself in the video that i figured there was a good chance that blizzard did that I was hopeful that maybe they would leave it untouched because up until the point when I had mentioned it, it had technically been in the game for multiple months. And I'm like, surely they're not going to like nerf it right as I start to make it like available to everybody who wasn't already in the know, right? But it's it's just a baffling, constant, never-ending decision process from Blizzard where something stays broken and like I, I believe that, you know, considering they nerfed it after my video, they probably were not aware of it. Okay, fine. But, like, at a certain point, when are you going to realize that constantly approaching design like that, where you only nerf things after, like, the actual general populace becomes aware of it, it just creates such a terrible sentiment. Like, I, if, if they want to nerf it eventually, okay. But then I think stuff like that, especially when it benefits the player base... It is just one of those things where, like, just fucking common courtesy, announce it. Say, like, hey, we're going to be nerfing this on X date. Use this while you can. That way it stops the, you know, time-old or time-honored tradition of, you know, I'm, I'm blanking on the expression. Um, but you fucking, like, exploit before it gets nerfed, right? Uh, there's an expression that people always use for that because it makes sense and it's what Blizzard does. Um... But it, they do it with everything, right? It's They did the same shit with uh, the barter bricks at the start of the patch. And it's even more annoying, like, with the barter brick stuff. Because the barter brick stuff, like, I literally made them aware of that. Or I, I tried. Obviously, they didn't listen. Um, I tried to make them aware of it. Other people tried to make them aware of it. And they just kind of had their head in the fucking sand. Exploit early, exploit often. Yeah, that, that's what I was thinking of, Goose Comics. Thank you very much. My brain is just not working today. Um, so they knew about the barter brick stuff, or at least they would if they actually read the fucking feedback and stuff that people posted. They knew that the barter brick quests were repeatable. And the thing about barter bricks is like a lot of people say that barter bricks were very obviously um, like it was a very obviously an exploit. Everybody should have known about it. But what you need to understand is that when you're testing it on the beta, early barter bricks were fucking impossible to get. Like, it was not a well-designed system. I still don't really think it is. But the original implementation especially, it was, like, so difficult to actually get your hands on barter bricks in the original, like, design of that system. And pretty much the only way to actually get them on the PTR for 10.1 was by doing the repeatable quest. So myself and basically everyone else was like, okay, well, this currency is obviously required for a lot of different recipes. And right now, the only actual way to get it more than like barely enough to afford anything is to do this repeatable quest. So clearly this must be Blizzard's intention, right? Considering the currency acquisition is fucked. There's a lot of important stuff tied behind it. And it's been reported and made aware of to Blizzard multiple times, and they have changed nothing. Okay, this must be intended. Like, it honestly did not even cross my mind that this was an exploit. Early on, I'm like, maybe this quest isn't repeatable, but then like a month later, when it's still untouched on the beta, and barter brick acquisition hasn't been changed whatsoever, like, I just said, oh, it must just be intended to be repeatable. Okay. And it's a quest where you have to manually turn in items. So it's like, your brain goes, okay, you're, it, it's like an old vanilla era repeatable turn in, where you turn in items and get stuff. And to me, that just made logical sense, right? But then... Hours after the patch goes live, when people like me have already farmed a shit ton of barter bricks to get our recipes and start selling stuff, because 
I wasn't doing it because I wanted to exploit the bug. I did it because I wanted to get the recipe as soon as possible to start selling stuff. Because duh, obviously if you're the first to a market, it's important. So I wasn't viewing it as, oh, I got to farm barter bricks ASAP before they fix this bug. I'm like, I want to get my recipes ASAP before other people do the same thing and get their recipes later on. So I was selling rank three reputation contracts like an hour after the patch went live because I did all the unlock stuff really quickly because I practiced it. And then I did a bunch of the barter brick turn-ins, got my recipe for inscription, and started selling contracts. Uh, so I was doing that, and then four hours later, they fucking nerf it. And the thing is, after the fact, they did a very light boost to barter brick drop rates and, like, world content stuff. So it wasn't nearly as fucked. It was definitely way worse than those initial few weeks. But then a lot of people are like, well, very clearly you're supposed to farm barter bricks through this, this, and that method. And it's like, but yeah, it didn't work like that. They only did that after the fact because they realized, oh, fuck, we really fucked up here. We need to at least somewhat boost the rate at which people can get barter bricks. Otherwise, we have completely screwed the entire economy due to our negligence. But it's still not enough. And of course, the people who got it early still have an advantage of the recipes. And at that point, Blizzard can't even really take it away because, like, we didn't fucking exploit anything. We just did the quest that had existed in the fucking PTR for months without being changed and then did it on live servers, assuming it was just part of how you unlock this currency. And, you know, what are they going to fucking do about it? So, obviously, the correct solution is to just say, oh, I guess we fucked up. Okay, we'll leave it there. And then maybe put in a little post about barter brick acquisition that is not meant to be done through these quests, but obviously we don't want to screw over players, so we're going to leave it in for now and help do it on the next weekly reset. If you give people enough heads up, like, nobody's going to be mad. But yeah, the way they design their fucking game in terms of changes like that is just... It is honestly aggravating. It is so fucking stupid. And... Like, I know some many people try to defend Blizzard on this and say, oh, it's just how they've always done things. But like, well, it is one of those things where obviously I'm not going to quit WoW because they fucked us over again. Like, it, it is at the end of the day, a fairly minor thing, but it definitely is a pattern of behavior that just really, really, really pisses off a lot of people. And like, if somebody told me that they were really into professions and they quit the game in 10.1 after getting fucked over by the barter brick thing i genuinely would not be surprised now obviously i'm not super into professions i did it because i knew about it um but like if i had missed it i wouldn't have been broken up about it i'd be like yeah that sucks and then moved on but if that was like my main form of content and i was just told now that i'm infinitely behind on that just because you know i didn't know about like the the quests before blizzard patched it out from under everybody i'd be pissed too and, you know, there are examples. It, what kind of sucks is they're actually fairly good about tweaking this stuff whenever it impacts raiders. So ironically, I'm in the group of people that is usually least impacted by this stuff. Like, for instance, whenever there was like an infinite artifact, artifact power grind back in, um, or at least a really broken infinite artifact, artifact power grind. I can't talk. Uh, there was a quest in Suramar, or world quest in Suramar back in Legion where you could spam it like over and over and over and get absurd amounts of artifact power. And it was a huge power spike. And Blizzard actually sent out bans for that because it gave you player power. And, you know, while they did fix it and roll things back, and like, I'm glad that one was definitely a very, very, very obvious exploit. But, um, it still sucks for people with professions that that shit didn't get rolled back. Like, honestly... I wouldn't have even been mad if my barter bricks had been rolled back and my recipes had been unlearned and stuff after they did that. Like, obviously, I had no idea of it. So the people saying shit like, oh, people who use those quests should be banned. Like, that's obviously insane, right? But if Blizzard had said, hey, this was unintentional, we're rolling back, you know, everybody's barter bricks and unlearning any recipes purchased or whatever and we'll be looking for a solution i would have been like well that fucking sucks because obviously you should have noticed it in the beta but okay fine at least everything's fair now um but it's rarely like that it's almost never like that anyway i don't even know how I... oh yeah i got on this quest or i got on this rant because of the fucking stupid secret quest line garbage i'm yeah so obviously i'm still mad about that um definitely extra salty this time because, well, I've been burned by Blizzard on that in a variety of different situations where, like, it affects my 
actual stuff in the game. This time it impacted my YouTube channel because of, like I said, the impact it has in the algorithm to unlist the video. And like, I sure, I could have just kept the video up and misled people, but I'm not going to do that, right? I already feel kind of bad leaving the speedrun up itself, but um, like I said, I, I, I'm in the process of... I, I meant to do that earlier and I, I just forgot in, while setting this stuff up. Um, I'm going to type out like a big pinned comment for that video and leave it under there just so like anybody knows like, hey, this this doesn't work, but here are some ways you can, you know, replace that section of the run with something similar. And of course, when I make my, or, well, I, I was going to say Dream Surge leveling guide, it's going to be a full 60 to 70 leveling guide that just happens to include Dream Surges. Uh, when I do that, of course, I will go into more detail on, like, you know, the fastest ways to level now that that has been nerfed. But uh, in the meantime, I will probably, or I will definitely put out, like, a little paragraph in the comment section there just to elaborate on that and explain. Because I think that that video still has value outside of the secret quest line, but I still d did need to take down the other one. Anyways. Um, hello, George Isaacson. How was the grind going? It's going good. Uh, still doing the Frost Mage stuff now. When I get to 40, we'll do the, the regular things. It's also not a huge concern, right? Because at this point, we're not even 40, which was the intended start point of the speedrun. Imagine spending time in the game you pay for to do stuff available in the game to everybody. If Blizzard decided to zero all your progress for the last X hours, they'd be drowning in reef refund requests. Yeah, I mean, I completely agree. Trust me, like, I, I do not think it's a good solution, but it's... I, I, I mean, honestly, I don't know. Like, what, what is the correct answer there? Obviously, the correct answer for, like, the barter brick situation that we've been talking about is to just actually use your PTR for the purpose it's therefore testing and detect this stuff early on especially when multiple people i i can say at least i reported it i i'm fairly certain other people knew about it as well because i talked to a few people about it um so i'm pretty sure other people along with me reported that so clearly we all know what the best solution is and that is to do your jobs as developers Detect this shit early, especially when the people using your test servers point this out to you, and make sure that something that is that broken, or clearly in their minds that broken because they fixed it, uh, does not make it to live servers. That is obviously the correct solution. But Blizzard fucks up, that stuff makes it to live servers, and they don't want it on there. What is the correct method, right? Because at that point, you have effectively two options. You could either do what Blizzard did, nerf it, and don't really provide a viable catch-up method, and now there are players like me who have multiple recipes unlocked, well, everybody else will have to spend weeks getting those same recipes. Or, you could do what I said they maybe should have done, which is roll back, what I'm saying is specifically the currency, right? Just remove any barter bricks, unlearn any recipes, etc. And it's not an ideal solution, for sure. Which is why I think Blizzard didn't do that, because they didn't want to have to face the backlash of that. Because I think the entire thing they're counting on is there are going to be less people upset about being at like a two-week disadvantage because they're thinking, well, there's a reason, by the way, that they don't put this shit in their patch notes, right? Like, everybody knows about the Barter Brick exploit, or a lot of people know about the Barter Brick exploit. Um, I've obviously talked about it before, so, you know, if you're watching my videos, you probably know that it happens. Uh, and I talked about it in my Discord before the patch even happened. I even made a video on it. So a lot of people who've watched my channel already knew about it going into the patch. And um, obviously, we all knew that it got nerfed. People in my Discord were posting about it like within four hours after the patch went live saying, ah, oh, fuck, Blizzard just nerfed it, right? So it's no secret that it has been nerfed. And yet, surprisingly, mysteriously, if you look through their patch notes at the time, it makes no mention of fixed a broken method that allowed people to get a ton of barter bricks within the first four hours of the patch. Funny how when they fuck up like that, they don't even own up to it in their patch notes. Because then you're going to have people who never knew about it reading that and going, wait, what? There was a, a way to get a bunch of barter bricks in the first four hours that I missed out on? When did that happen? And why have I, I been like compensated for the fact that I was not able to benefit from that bug? And like, and, and all that shit, right? So... 
what Blizzard is effectively counting on is the people that are getting fucked over by this don't realize that they're getting fucked over by this, so it's better to just slam the door in their face before they ever realized it was open than to effectively re-roll all the progress and actually put people at an even playing field. Because, yeah, if you re-roll, or if you roll back people's progress, then you have to actually admit, hey, we fucked this up, we're doing this in the name of fairness, but then you're going to have a lot of people who are upset and don't understand. Neither solution is good, as we know. Um, but Blizzard chooses the easier option, even if it maybe isn't the one that is fair. And and once again, I am speaking at this 100% from the perspective of somebody who, in this particular case, actually benefited from their decision. So I only stood to gain by them choosing the solution they did. In fact, the sad irony is that by Blizzard nerfing the acquisition rate of um, Barter Bricks, I actually probably made a shit ton more money off it than I should have. Because that meant that now I had a recipe that other people would take weeks to acquire and I could sell with very limited competition. Um, and I still, I think that's fucking bullshit, right? I don't think that's fair. So, yeah. Uh, it's just the fucking... Fucking Thaldraz's secret questline is another classic example of that. Anyways, I've beaten this topic to death. Let's move on. Uh, you respect my integrity on this? Yeah, thank you. I, I would hope everybody has the same response, and... I mean... This is just, like, the basic shit that I've been hoping from Blizzard for a while, and we just haven't gotten it. Apparently, we're using crystals on portal keepers. Uh, I guess the monk just realized that the crystals exist, so now he's running around hitting all of them. I guess it's not the worst idea, because Ikaron isn't in the pool, so it's better than nothing. And in Wrath Classic, these crystals do basically nothing to single targets, but in retail, they actually scale properly. Ironically, it's one of the few cases in which... Uh, retail scaling is better than classic scaling, but technically speaking, I think it's using the retail scaling system just improperly for the hard mode dungeons, and that's why it no longer really works. So what's the frost rotation look like at the moment? Because you have zero idea how frost works these days. Well, I mean, the end game frost rotation is definitely going to look a lot different than what you're seeing here. Having talked to, as I mentioned before, uh, one of my friends in my guild who plays frost mage, uh, he said, like, a lot of it revolves around, like, shattering your targets. Oh, shit. So you get, like, a root effect on people, or, like, you at least put some sort of freeze effect, and you, like, consume your freeze effect to, like, increase the crit chance of your spells and stuff. And, like, Glacial Spike apparently plays, like, a big thing. It revolves around, like, building icicles and then spending icicles with Glacial Spike. Obviously, I don't know exactly how it works in raids. Right now... Right now, it's basically I spam Ice Lance. That's it. I spam Ice Lance and Comet Storm and Frozen Orb and other instant cast abilities, and then I Arcane Explosion to finish off mobs and AoE. And if I think they're actually going to live long enough and stand in the same place for long enough to benefit from Blizzard, I press Blizzard. Uh, but obviously, leveling rotations are not always the best example of what things look like. And for single target, what I've been doing is building up to five ice spikes. Oh, that is not my frost spell. Build up to five icicles, and then you spend them with ice lance. And I guess I could, I won't have to use shifting power for a while, so I can just use it single target here. I generally save it for AoE. Comet Storm is the best one. Yeah, Comet Storm is definitely very nice. Turn this in. And uh, I'm like 37 and a little bit. I could probably just go to WAD and do some stuff in WAD to get up to 40 from here. We've done enough Wrath Dungeons at this stage, I feel. Or in that appearance. Uh... I still have a few things that... Nice, there we go. That I need to read in chat. 
37 in just an hour, yeah. That's why I don't put the timer on there. Let me scroll up and just read everything. Hmm. Yeah, Joyous Journeys is definitely amazing. That makes wrath leveling feel so much better. Is every week time walking now? Yes and no. There is an event going on right now called Turbulent Timeways. Uh, so this means that every single week a time walking event will be available until it ends on October 31st. So right now, yes, time walking is every week. Normally that is not a thing. It's a special event that they do every now and then. Uh, is Blizzard going to release Ruby Sanctum? Well, yeah, I'm definitely, I mean, they're definitely going to release Ruby Sanctum. It would really make no sense to not do that. What I'm unsure of what they'll do is how they will handle the Ruby Sanctum release. Because, like, what is the gear in Ruby Sanctum relative to uh, ICC? I guess no point looking at it on retail. But if I look at, like, Wowhead and then Wrath Classic, Ruby Sanctum... I'd imagine it's still in the files on Wowhead, so you could probably look at, like, the... Uh, let's see. Okay, so the description for Wowhead says it was added in 3.3.5. Uh, it's one boss, and then there's, like, little mini-bosses. All three of the mini-bosses, as well as the boss, drop Emblem of Frost. Uh, the final boss, Halion, drops loot. That is seven item levels higher than ones in Ice Crown Citadel. New trinkets, etc., etc. Okay, so what are we looking at? 258 gear for normal 10 man. And then, like, Heroic 25 is 284. And what was Lich King gear again? Lich King gear is like. I forget. I, I think Lich King gear is what? Two, 284, I think, as well? Or is it 277? Um. My memory on that is is fuzzy. Uh, but yeah, so it looks like it is slightly better than ICC loot from what I'm looking at for uh, words here. Um, for Ruby Sanctum. But it's like, it's only one boss. So it's kind of comparable to Trial of the Crusader, but even less impactful. And... Well, Trial of, the, Trial of the Crusader wasn't like a huge step up compared to Ulduar, especially with the changes they made. It's the same as the Lich King? Okay, yeah. Um, I think Lich King loot is slightly better than the rest of 25 Heroic, right? Or is Lich King still the same? I could be wrong in that. I, I've not looked into ICC a ton. Um, still looking for a guild and Wrath Classic to do ICC with. But... Um, like, Trial of the Crusader added, you know, a whole open area, it added a dungeon to, like, the ICC, uh, it's half a tier above the rest of ICC, gotcha, yeah, that's what I thought. Um, but yeah, so, like, the Ice Crown patch obviously added, like, new daily quests, in addition to, obviously, the entire new raid, it added the new dungeons, the whole associated quest chain, a new badge, and stuff like that, so... What I'm wondering, more specifically, is how they will implement Ruby Sanctum. And I'm definitely sure they're going to do it, but I don't really know how. Because, think about it this way, Anixia's Lair, which was released in the middle of the Trial of the Crusader patch in Original Wrath, was just released alongside Trial of the Crusader in Wrath Classic. But it also wasn't like a step up it wasn't comparable to how ruby sanctum is a harder content i don't know i really have no idea how they're going to handle it uh, the main thing that i'm wondering is whether they'll add some sort of like new titan rune omega dungeon or whatever and pulling like one of those random things out of my ass um just for the sake of adding like a new tier of loot above everything I have a feeling they won't, though, partially because they already haven't really changed any of the mechanics in Titan Rune Gamma Dungeons. It's like, 
The same thing with a new reward structure, and there's like one new buff that you can get that is loosely tied to like Trial the Crusader. So thematically, it's like a little bit similar. But considering they haven't done a whole lot with that, I think they're pretty happy with the state of the affixes, which is fair. They're honestly not bad. Uh, so if they're keeping it like this and they're not adding any way to get like ICC catch-up gear, then I don't know. I think that would be interesting. Or they could just like alongside Ruby Sanctum add new vendor or new items to the Defiler Scourgestone vendor, which is the hard mode dungeon loot. And now you can buy ICC gear, but it's like twice the cost. Or it would probably be like ICC 10 man gear with like the way that they've been doing it. I don't know though. We'll have to see. But I'm definitely curious to see how they approach that stuff. Let me round this stuff up. And I have a few talent points I need to spend. Uh, oh yeah, so I was going to talk about this earlier, but... Oh fuck, what am I in combat with? Can't even see it. Oh, my frozen orb was still active and it pulled something. Okay. Uh, so, the main thing that I'm going to go for in the bottom section of the tree is... I'm first going to take Splitting Ice. Then I'm going to take Freezing Rain. Then I'm going to take, um, I think, Freezing Winds. And then put two points into, uh, yeah, this one, Hailstones, just to get more Icicles and stuff like that. So that means within my next eight points, I, it's very easy to get. I just need to have Splintering Cold and then Icy Veins. So uh, I'm going to have to take every one of these or these points regardless. Each of your Icicles deals 10% additional tam damage. Uh... I can't talk today, apparently. Uh, yeah, I'll take this. And I think I want to get to Icy Veins earlier, so I'm going to put one point into Snowstorm, and then I can like then take another point and put it into Icy Veins, then I'll put two more points here. So that is one, two, three, four points, and then I have two more points to spare until reaching the bottom of the tree. The location doesn't matter because I don't need to actually branch into anything else. So, uh, not this, not that. I think I go Brain Freeze and Frozen Touch, probably? I think that, yeah. The brain Freeze and Frozen Touch as, like, the final two midsection points seems reasonable. And then over here, I can do... Uh, what do I want to do? I guess Ice Nova and... Oh, uh, Richard Ice. Seems good. Do I want to put this... Put it under Shift Q. Uh, actually does not terrible damage for what is, I believe, mainly meant to be a utility spell. Huh. I wonder, is... Ice Nova actually used in endgame stuff. I guess it does root enemies in combat. So in theory, it would give you something to trigger your shatters. So I could definitely see that. Anyways, uh, let me scroll up and read the other messages that I've missed in chat. In just a moment. I'll cast a Frostbolt here. Uh, good question about Ice Nova. Ice Nova, I know you do. I'm more wondering about... Or, wait. Frost Nova. Yeah, I, I was thinking Frost Nova, I know you do. Um, I think Ice Nova. They such similar names. Frost Nova and Ice Nova. That's just so confusing. Um, I would imagine you do use it, though. This right I can use... Fuck, that just kills. Okay. Yeah, there's that whole little mini game of like building up your freezes and then shattering it for bonus damage, but I haven't even got into that yet because at this point, you know, you're just instant cast abilities are one shotting things, so it doesn't even matter. Good problem to have, honestly. Anyways, let me scroll up again. Uh, let's see. 
Dustin, Pet- Dustin Petrosky said, Hey, Haraldin, been loving leveling my alts while following your past streams to speed it up. Awesome. Glad to hear it. Um, oh, yeah, and then Chori talked about... Uh, that was something I think I started on. I, I think I gave a suitable answer, but yeah. In summary, the main reason why TVC is so good compared to the other expansions is early on, the dungeons are... Overall, like, on average, much stronger. Because, aside from Escape from Durnhold, like, 7 out of 8 of the dungeons that you get at, uh, like, levels 10 to 20 are really, really good and efficient and worth doing. So, that is the main reason why TBC is just head and shoulders above the rest. You can still hit Escape from Durnhold, you can still get fucked, but it's one chance out of... You know, a lot of other dungeons, and generally speaking, you're not going to get completely screwed. But you can. Happens. Um, but, like, Wrath has a lot of good dungeons. And I think if Wrath dungeons were, were like, reordered a little bit to make it so all of the really good ones were kind of front-loaded, just like TBC. And maybe if TBC dungeons were rearranged a little bit, so... Black Morass appeared in, like, the 15 to 20 range, suddenly TBC would be a lot less efficient. And you could argue similar things for, like, Missa Pandaria. If uh, things were slightly changed up, it could end up being really good. Okay. I think, yeah, I can go turn in Kiana Moonshadow and then do the other quests. Also, um... Hold on, let me... Up on my yak really quick. For any other Honkai Star Rail enjoyers, I'm actually quite happy with how this turned out in terms of uh, the character. So, obviously, character's name is Herda and it's a Frost Mage, but uh, I put together this transmog with, like, just whatever I happen to have unlocked. And I actually think it's pretty solid. It's not, like, amazing, but... I wasn't sure how close to the design I'd be able to get with just, like, whatever random shit I happen to have in my transmog collection. I think it's, like, you look at that and you go, yeah, no, that that's that's the character. Like, it definitely has a strong resemblance. So I am very happy with how this one turned out. Some of them, like, um, the Chinksha Rogue outfit, I think, was fine. But it was definitely, like, a bit further off the actual design than this one. This actually has a pretty good resemblance, if I do say so myself. Um, okay, I think I picked up all the quests that I need. I can just go do the other shit. Um, Dark Iron, where did this, I'm, I, I started reading a message and then it got uh, bumped. Dark Iron Engineering Mage portals to everything. True. Yeah, that is like the ultimate transportation spec. And oh, I just saw, what is that pop up? Uh, Jan Wooter... Arensen, did I pronounce that correctly? Donated, was that pounds or euros? I think that's pounds, right? Or is that euros? I oh, fuck, I always, I, maybe that's euros. I get the symbols confused all the time. I'm sorry, European people. But uh, Jan Wooter Arensen donated 11, some European currency. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. I wish I knew which type it was so I could say it correctly. But either way, I appreciate the donation. Uh, thank you. And you put a little, like, fast emoji, I assume, for the speedrun and stuff. Um, I, I think that's why I, I was in the middle of reading a message and chat shifted and I was like, well, what's going on? And then I noticed, like, the thing lit up. I think that's what happened. Um, what was, uh, what was I saying? Uh, what consumables am I using for XP boosts? There is currently only one XP consumable, and is this thing, Draft of Ten Lands, gives you 10% increased experience and you can only apply it while under level 50 it technically speaking works above level 50 if you manage to apply it and then level up like whatever you man- level you manage to get within the hour after you apply it under 50 it still works so the farthest i think i've ever managed to get is i think i made it to 61 at one point in one of my speed runs it was i think the cult here and druid run and I got to 61, and I still had the Draft of Ten Lands rolling. Maybe it wasn't that one. I forget. Uh, but that was, like, the farthest I managed to get. Because, well, 50 to 60 is fast. 
it's hard to get too far into Dragonflight in, uh, after hitting level 50 in just under an hour, uh, especially with all the travel time and stuff after finishing Chromie time. But that's the only one currently. Uh, hello, Mateus Nunes. I think I already read that, but either way. Can't hurt to repeat it. Does Fury use one hand or two hand? Uh, Fury pretty much always uses two handers uh, for Titan's grip and stuff. Technically speaking, single minded Fury like exists, but it's it. I don't know. Single minded Fury. It's like it's not actually a thing in practice. Um, at least I've never seen it actually be good in terms of balancing. There's an entire like little subset of the tree that is dedicated to single-minded fury, but it just doesn't have nearly enough support to make it work. So, I, I'm i actually curious, like, I, I don't know if single-minded fury has ever been good, at least ever since Titan's Grip was a thing. I know it has existed at various points in time, and there have been some times where it literally was not playable, like, the support there, or wasn't there for it. Obviously, within Dragonflight, with the new tree, Blizzard tried to add some ways to get it, but I'm pretty sure that it's just not even remotely viable with the current setup. But I could be wrong, I'm admittedly not a very big Fury expert, like, at all. So, maybe there was, like, a time where Single-Minded Fury was really good. Who knows? Uh, Neko no Kenshi said, Hey, Harold, and depending on how far Blizzard decides to go with Classic, what is the last X-Pack you would prefer to see? Um, I'm probably the wrong person to ask for this, uh, because I, I um, so uh, I'll give the, the logical answer. The last X-Pack I think they should do is Legion. And I actually, I think there is... A very, very good chance, like, I would put 90% odds on us getting Mop Classic. I think that is a very, very, very safe bet. Because we are almost certainly getting Cataclassic. Um, I am at, like, 99% odds for Cataclassic. And uh, I would say if they make Cataclassic, there is just almost no reason to not make Mop. Because Cataclysm is definitely one of those expansions where it has a very mixed reputation surrounding it. I personally think it'll be a lot of fun. I've expressed many, many times that I think a Cataclassic is going to be a blast and I'm going to play it a lot and I'm very excited for it. But I know a lot of people will say they don't think Cataclassic should exist at all and they think Cata was terrible and the death of WoW and blah, 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 blah. And... Whatever. And Blizzard is almost certainly going to do Cataclysm. Um, so I think if we get that, it's logical that we get Mop. Now, the weird thing is Wad, of course. Because I would definitely play a Wad Classic. But a lot of people wouldn't. So, whereas you could honestly release Cataclysm with, like, some very slight changes, and I don't really think people will complain too much, and there's going to be a decent amount of people who would actually play it, uh, you can release Mop with virtually no changes, and a lot of people would play it. Mop was a very good expansion. Um, but Wad, while Wad has a lot of redeeming qualities, and I personally had a lot of fun playing it because, you know, a lot of the content was very good, it is no secret that it is a very flawed expansion, and you could not just re-release Wad and expect people to play it. Duh. Right? But Legion, of course, is very good. And then, you know, the question is, okay, well, if we think that they're going to do uh, Legion Classic, which I feel like they probably will eventually, because Legion was a very well-received expansion, a lot of people, I think, would play Legion Classic, at least. I have a lot of friends who have told me that they would love to see Legion Classic just because that was their favorite expansion by far. And, you know, in before, a bunch of people saying, Oh, Legion was so overrated. Legendaries were garbage. Oh my god, it, was, it sucked. It, I liked Legion. You know, there are so many people who try to say that, like, people look at Legion with rose tint and goggles. And, like, I'm not going to sit here and deny that those weren't flaws. But I still had a lot of fun with the expansion, despite its flaws. Like, its flaws made it a little bit more tedious at times, but the rest of the game was just so good that nobody really cared. And they did improve all of that by the end. 
End of Legion was just an amazing experience, but even at the start, it was a fun but flawed experience. And another, like, really cooked take that I have seen on, like, Reddit and other, you know, f fan sites and stuff over the past few years is that Legion actually was bad because it started the borrowed power that ruined Shadowlands and BFA. Which is like such revisionist history and just absolute brain dead thinking. Because just because Legion had quote unquote borrowed power doesn't mean that that is what made Shadowlands and BFA bad. Like, Shadowlands and BFA were bad because the implementation of their systems was fucking dog shit. It has nothing to do with, well, uh, Legion legendaries paved the way for that. And it's like the only argument that you can make is that Legion Legendaries made Blizzard think that this is what people wanted, so they decided to give us a warped, unrecognizable version of that, you know, in the next few expansions, because this is what you wanted, guys. But that is not a knock on the Legion design. That is just Blizzard completely misunderstanding their customer base. This has nothing to do with whether or not artifacts were good. Artifacts were good. Artifacts were fun. I liked interacting with artifacts. They had meaningful changes to your gameplay. The progression actually felt pretty good. Early on, you actually got to choose which nodes you got, but it didn't lock you out of anything else. So I got to like beeline for Rage of the Sleeper when leveling my Guardian Druid and playing it in early dungeons, and I got to feel really good about my decision to prioritize Rage of the Sleeper because it was fucking broken, and... I still was able to unlock all the other stuff later on, and if somebody wasn't like me and didn't pick Rage of the Sleeper on their Guardian Druid early on, and was like, oh man, that spell's really broken, well, you can still unlock it. it. You just get it, like, a few days later, after doing a few things to farm artifact power and whatnot. Uh, so it was a perfectly fine system. Legion Legendaries were obviously problematic, and like, yeah, you can fault Blizzard for that, but honestly, I really don't think it's that big of a deal because sure the original implementation was bad but it was the very first time they had tried anything like that like you expect the first implementation of anything to be rough the problem with shit like azurite armor and covenants and fucking conduits and whatever garbage was in those expansions is that it was not a first implementation it was like a fifth implementation and they somehow managed to make it worse that is why Legion or fucking Shadowlands and BFA suck dick. It's nothing to do with Legion paving the way for that. Like, Legion somehow managed to have better systems than both BFA and Shadowlands, despite coming before both of them. Like, that, that has nothing to do with the expansion being worse. That is just incompetent design on Blizzard's end. So, yeah, no, Legion was perfectly fine. And obviously, another thing that, like, I shouldn't even need to say, but it's somehow an argument that people use is, like, well, uh, at the start, people wouldn't like Legion Classic because it had all this tedious stuff. Like, Blizzard can change that, you know? <laughs> like, the entire point of Classic is they've made a lot of quality of life changes outside of the whole no changes thing at the start. In more recent years... We've had actual major quality of life changes, like I said, with, you know, the recent leveling changes they've made to Wrath Classic that are fantastic. And we'll probably end up seeing stuff like that for Cataclysm to make it even better and iron out some of the problems people had with it. And we'll almost certainly see that in later expansions like Legion, adding in like more legendary targeting and acquisition stuff that came in later patches to the earlier ones to overall make the experience feel better. That's like a no brainer. And if you have Legion launch with that stuff, suddenly it's just a good expansion, plain and simple. But then, of course, it all goes back to the question of what do you do with WAD? Because, like, yeah, sure, Legion Classic would be great. I think there's going to be a lot of people who would like that. But, like, something that I've heard people suggesting that, quite frankly, just wouldn't work is you just skip WAD Classic and just go straight to Legion. And, I mean, obviously, we've never done this before. <laughs> That is something that we have no frame of reference for. What happens if you add an expansion, but nobody has played it, and then you immediately add another expansion? Like, how would it look if, like, we go from Mop to Legion? So, I guess there's two ways to do that, right? You either make it so WAD just doesn't exist at all, and we're literally going from 
Siege of Orgrimmar straight into Nighthold, which, honestly, that could be kind of interesting. I'd be curious to see how that would play out, but I think that would be an absolute fucking nightmare to balance. And classic, keep in mind, and this is why goes back to the, I, I'm not going to spend another hour talking about Classic Plus this live stream, because it always gets brought up. Um, but it's why the people who think that Classic Plus will ever exist are absolutely like high out of their minds, because the entire point of Classic, and I'm not saying it should be this way, I'm not saying I don't want something like Classic Plus that people describe. I'm saying from Blizzard's standpoint, the entire advantage of classic is they literally get to reprint existing content that they already released years ago and make new money off it it's just a no-brainer for them it's the reason why we're almost certainly going to get cataclysm no matter what people think about it because they just get to re-release an expansion and if like not that many people play it who gives a shit it's still free money for zero development cost why would they not do that it is just a no-brainer so Having to, like, completely revamp, like, the transitional period in between expansions just because we're going from Mop to Legion, I just don't think that's going to happen. That's way too much effort to put in. So then, another suggestion is you just include the WAD content in there, but we just launch straight into Legion and skip over WAD, like, as a regular expansion that plays out. But how would that look? Because there's two ways that you could do that. You could either, like, give people the WAD content in, like, a pre-patch, and then effectively, instead of getting pre-patch talents, you have a pre-patch expansion. A pre-expansion expansion. So, the week before Legion comes out, everybody on the MOP uh, classic servers gets to level their characters through WAD content and get to the new max level and then farm as much WAD gear as they can... Honestly, that would be kind of interesting. I think something like that would be maybe a little bit fun. But I think they should do something like that, but a little bit more official, right? Where we actually do, like, the whole skipping WAD thing doesn't happen. And we do actually get a WAD classic, but it is not like a typical classic expansion that lasts for, like, a year or two. Uh, or, like, a year and a half or whatever classic expansions have been lasting for. Uh, I haven't really kept track of the time exactly um but i think like a three month wad classic like event quote unquote could actually work out quite well something where we we get have one month of like uh i, I maybe it wouldn't even be one month maybe it's like uh actually i yeah, actually no I, I take it back one month would be perfect we have one month of high mall one month of Blackrock Foundry, maybe, yeah, that is even too much. It could be just two weeks of High Mall, then maybe, like, one month of Blackrock Foundry, and then, like, one month of Hellfire Citadel, and then, like, a month or a few weeks of Legion Prepatch or something like that. I don't know. It, maybe not exactly in that time frame, but I think you get the idea. A extremely accelerated release schedule for WAD content that allows people to at least experience it. Maybe not, like, in full, but you get, you get a taste of WAD. And I think that would actually just genuinely be fun, because say what you will about WAD, and I know there's going to be some Doomers who never played it, WAD content was actually really fucking good. There just wasn't a lot of it. That isn't, like, the most unpopular opinion ever. I know a decent amount of people share that opinion. But there's a lot of people who didn't play WAD who think it was just a universally bad expansion, and no, it actually wasn't. Uh, it was quite good um, for what it had. It was just, you know, a as an expansion, I, I take that back. As an expansion, it was bad. Um, but to be clear, the content within it, very, very good. Good raids, amazing challenge mode dungeons. That would be really fun, getting to, like speedrun getting full challenge mode golds in like a few month time frame and speedrunning Blackrock Foundry and Hellfire Citadel progression. Honestly, I would really enjoy that, I think. Um, is that a hot bar mod? <laughs> like, I, I just saw the, the response to it. Don't think so. Such a bad design. Um, Oh, I see it. I thought, so the way I read it, I, I quickly scrolled down to the uh, bottom of the chat just to see like the most recent messages. And I saw 
Spicy Nuff saying, is that a hotbar mod? And the first thing I said is, I don't think so. It's such a bad design. And I thought that Nathan was talking about my UI. And I was like, God damn, okay. Like, saying my UI is so bad, there's no way that people would actually make it a mod. I see now that that is not what he was saying. <laughs> and he was responding to somebody else. But I didn't see the at Deku at the start there. So I initially thought it, that's what it was in response to. And I was like, wow. Like, I'm just catching strays here in my UI for absolutely no reason. Um, but no, it is not a hot bar mod. It's um, it's just the default UI with uh, some settings. If you message me on Discord, I can, uh, after the stream, copy-paste it. A few people have asked me for my UI layout, and I always just, like, toss it in there and just copy-paste, bing, bang, boom. Uh, what other potions do I need? I think it's just flask, right? Throw this here. And then bear tartar. That arcane inch sitting above everything else is pretty bad design. Yeah. I mean, to be fair, I would never set up my bars like this at max level. This is definitely just for leveling. Like, the Arcane Int is here because when I'm using my other leveling consumables, it also reminds me to refresh Arcane Int. Generally speaking, when I have a raid buff on, like, actual endgame stuff, I put my raid buff on zero. Uh, that's where, like, I have Battle Shout on my Warrior bound to zero. Uh, but I, I agree, that's definitely not good in general, but for leveling, it works for me. I think that, that just overall helps. Since your WoW account has been banned... Oh wait, how did your WoW account get banned? Did you post about that earlier in chat and I just haven't got into that message yet? Because that is like a, a plot twist. Or was that like something mentioned before that I just forgot about? But that sucks. Um... You missed the mission table gold? Yeah. Well, if I'm being honest, out of all the things in uh, in WAD, I definitely don't miss, miss how fucked the economy got because of the mission table. Like, obviously, being able to do that, it's nice for people to make money, but it had some pretty bad lasting impacts in the game. Uh, Let's see. Would Blizz keep that no flying decision for WAD to get that true WAD experience? Uh, no. Um, I forgot that they did that, right? Yeah, that's actually... It, it's so funny to think back on, like, how the game used to be, where Blizzard did... Blizzard is, like, such a fucking weird company, man. That That, that is, like, understatement of the year right there, but, like... I, I just, it, it's funny when, like, when Deku says that, and then I just remember, like, yeah, they did have this random crusade against flying, like, a few expansions ago. I completely forgot that was a thing, but now that I remember it, I remember, like, how much backlash there was, and it's, like, it is just the classic example of... I guess they still kind of do this. Credit to Blizzard, at least in a, some ways, they have gotten better at listening to the community when, like, literally everybody in the community is like, please, God, no, we don't want this at all. What the fuck are you thinking? And, like, Blizzard would just say, fuck you, we know better. They definitely did that a lot in so many cases over the years, and I completely forgot about the flying one, where... They just decided in WAD that flying was, like, bad for the game and we're going to prevent you from getting access to it until they, like, added Pathfinder. And unlike the current Pathfinders, which, like, I think the way that they have Pathfinder now is fair. It's like, you need to do... Uh, well, obviously in Dragonflight, right? We don't have it yet because we have Dragon Riding, which is a completely different thing. We went from flying is toxic to the game and it must be removed to now you get, like cracked out flying mounts from day one of the expansion so definitely a design shift and you know for all my complaints with dragonflight that is a design shift for the better credit where it's due um but like yeah the original design of pathfinder and just the way that they approach the player base of like 
we don't want you to be flying because like it means that we have to work harder to design our game like just baffling i completely forgot about that yeah i well it started in wad so i know yeah nathan said they did it in a bfa too for sure um but i completely forgot that, that whole crusade against flying started in wad and i think it's kind of a response to like the classic andy um like criticisms of modern wow of like oh the world doesn't even feel alive anymore when you can just hop on your flying mount and bypass any obstacles uh back in my day we need to run uphill both ways going through the barrens to reach our quest objective and like that type of shit and i'm like 99 percent sure that's why they did it because like those type of people like to complain and obviously now they have classics so like you know whoop de doo you, you got what you wanted kind of but yeah, that whole design back in WAD, it's interesting. And, I don't know, like, in some ways, I kind of get the whole flying kills, like, world engagement. And I that's why I kind of think the whole Pathfinder stuff is nice. But that's why, you know, Pathfinder is the best of both worlds. We still get the early expansion... You know, you gotta move around and actually, like, get from place to place. And then later on, when it's just, like, a really annoying inconvenience, you don't need to slog through that. And it just, like, you are actually able to get from point A to point B in a reasonable amount of time. So I think that's definitely the better way to handle it. Pathfinder definitely feels like it was made out of spite for the WAD backlash. Well, I don't even think they wanted to do Pathfinder initially, right? Like, wasn't Pathfinder, like begrudgingly put in into non-jungle and there was like what were the original requirements i remember it was just ridiculously annoying to get for anybody that didn't grind the shit out of reputations and stuff and a lot of people were complaining that it was just frustrating to get and then i also saw a lot of complaints after wad ended of people who were trying to level their alts and they're like what the fuck i have to jump through all these hoops to get pathfinder just so i could fly in wad so Definitely a lot of backlash to that. Let's get Snowstorm Icy Veins, and I can put Icy Veins there. Uh... I kind of like that for Bar Layout. Flying is not something you want, but you, you think you do, but you don't. Yeah, it was a classic example of that. <sighs> I mean, obviously, time has proved us, the players, right. Um, in many ways, about Blizzard's just blatant arrogance with that stuff. Um, maybe not in the ways that we would have hoped. But, yeah. It, it was definitely frustrating to deal with at the time like i i feel a certain sense of i guess satisfaction knowing in hindsight that i was correct about like all the complaining i did back in like wad and you know <laughs> legion and bfa and stuff and i i feel like generally speaking when i talk about like how garbage something is i'm usually proven right with time and uh unfortunately for a lot of the blizzard stuff when you go back that far I ended up being right for the wrong reasons, which, you know, I we, we all know what ended up happening in 2020 with Blizzard. I don't need to tell you guys about that. <laughs> There's a lot of problems with old Blizzard. Um, so, eh. I will say, though, uh, on, a, on a slightly related note, a little bit unrelated, but still, uh, I know a few people on my Discord were talking about how finally the Microsoft merger is going through. And that means Bobby Kotick is fucking out of here. And I, for one, could not be happier. Goddamn good fucking riddance. Fucking Gallywix is gone. And I don't know. I'm not like, I'm not on some massive amount of copium that it's actually going to improve the company or the games or whatever. But I do hope that to some small degree, the like hyper monetization and like, you know, playtime metric driven design maybe softens up a little bit now. A little bit. Like, I think that that is an acceptable level of copium. 
where it's not like, you know, you're off your rocker, there's no chance that's going to happen. I think that's, like, reasonable now that fucking Bobby Kotick isn't at the helm. But we'll see. I mean, it, it's not over yet, but it is, it's like three months, I think, until he's gone and it's like official or something. I don't know. Either way, it's it's good news. Uh, no matter how you sli slice it, it's good news. Um, you do think it'll be very better? Yeah. It It is definitely not going to be worse. I think that is the only thing that we can say for sure. I think it is almost universally agreed upon that while big corporations are never your friends, Microsoft, as far as they go, is definitely better than Activision. So, it's an improvement. Uh, whether we're going to see any meaningful improvements, who knows? But it it is definitely either a neutral or a good thing, and I think that's something to celebrate. Uh, hello, Naomi. You came here from a break from the pain that is weekly keys. Yeah, I feel that. Uh, you're breathing in that medicine Microsoft copium for sure. That's completely fair. I do not blame people who are. Uh, there aren't many that are worse than Activision. Yeah. Yeah, unfortunately. Man. How times change. Fucking... Think just like three, four years ago, Blizzard was considered one of like the best, most reputable game designers in the industry. Crazy. How quickly that has changed, or how quickly that did change, and how far they've fallen at this point. Oof. More like six. Yeah, I, well, I, obviously, okay, Blizzard's reputation has taken a beating for a while now, but the turning point when everybody, like, yeah, I, I viewed the World of Warcraft devs differently, but I think for myself and a lot of people, the moment we completely lost faith in Blizzard being the company that we thought it was, was obviously with the whole 2020 shit, right? you know, all that fucking, um, the Cosby suite stuff, you know, all know what I'm talking about. Um, that was definitely different, I think. Uh, because yes, obviously PFA was not a good expansion. WAD, even though I enjoyed it, was not a good expansion. But Warlords of Draenor was like a blemish on, at the time, what was a pretty consistent track record. And, you know, stuff definitely didn't go super well for Blizzard in the years that followed. But it definitely wasn't until all the big stuff where everybody was like, oh, <laughs> this is bad. And, uh... You know, then it, it really started falling from then. There's probably more BFA drops expectations by half, and the lawsuit stuff comes to light, just plummeted it to rock bottom. Yeah. I think, though, I still had some faith by the BFA stuff. Um, if anything, for me, like, as, as a World of Warcraft player, like, Shadowlands had already come out by that time, so... I... I think my kind of take on all of it was when I saw the stuff about the, the lawsuit and all that, you know, garbage, um, I was just like, this might as well be happening with Blizzard, right? Like, with how bad they've been the last few years, am I really surprised that things are even worse behind the scenes than we even thought they were? But I think for a lot of people, especially those that weren't actively following World of Warcraft and you know, actively disillusioned with the company already, it was a little bit of a, a leap when they found out all that stuff happened. Um, like, I think at that point, Overwatch was still doing pretty well. But that's another, crazy how bad they managed to fuck up Overwatch. That is one where, like, you just don't even think you can fuck it up. Overwatch, I would have said, it, like, if you asked me years ago, like four or five years ago, if there was any way that Overwatch could fail from where it was at, I'd be like, no, it's literally just a money printer of a game. Like, they have a brand new IP with limitless potential, really popular, tons of fans, and it's like, they didn't even have anything, like, nailed down for Overwatch. Like, you know, as long as you kept the main format that people had been enjoying the game for, you could spin it off into, like, whatever the hell you want. And there are so many people that, you know, would have been on board for that. 
it is genuinely impressive how they managed to take what should have been a sure thing and fuck it up that tremendously. Really, really, really impressive. Uh, Legion brought a lot back. The systems were asked, but it was at least an improvement. Yeah. You don't care, you had a lot of fun in WAD. The only problem was content drought, but the content we had was top-notch. PvP was amazing. Raids and dungeons were fun. Completely agree, yeah. That's why I honestly wouldn't mind a WAD classic. But I think it should be kind of the way I described. Because, yeah, if a WAD classic went on for, like, a year, well, then it would be repeating the exact same problems original WAD had. But if you had a very, like, snappy, speedrun-through WAD type of classic... I think that could be very fun because as many people have agreed with me on it had good content for what it was it was uh not bad at all you know what i kind of feel like just doing more dungeons questing is getting is like actually just kind of numbing my brain at this point it's just um i i, I can't describe it i i've done i think something about this lock mode on cave i have done so many runs in the last, like, month, or months, plural, and I've done a lot of them on Alliance, and I've done this section of Lockman on Quests so many times that I, there's just, like, this feeling that I can only describe as, like, internal screaming going on right now. And it's just, like, every part of my body is, like, I, I don't want to be doing fucking Lockman on just anything else please so i think i'm just going to fucking do wrath classic dungeons until i hit time walking and i'm just gonna do time walking which you know i know i always say don't do time walking like i get it you know sometimes you just want to fucking spam dungeons and i think that if you really are trying to level a character as fast as possible it's like definitely the route that i suggested is the fastest um and I don't necessarily think that this is boring, but when you have done this, like, I, I think over 10 times in the span of a month, oh, it's rough. It's fucking rough. Uh, let's see. Uh, if anything, it kind of explains the hiccups of those expansions. Oh, yeah, for sure. In, like, hindsight's twenty twenty definitely. Um, I think by then Overwatch 2 was announced and everybody hated the fact that they were even doing it. I, yeah, I forget exactly what the time frame was, but that would check out, I think. Though, honestly, like, I think the original, so you have to keep in mind that Overwatch 2 ended up being fucking terrible, right? I have yet to play Overwatch 2 once, and I actually somewhat enjoyed original Overwatch I think Overwatch 2 is fucking trash, and I have no plans to ever play it. But the original proposal for Overwatch 2, I actually don't really think it was that poorly received. There were definitely people I knew who were not thrilled that they were doing that. But I think, like, my perception and what a lot of other people were thinking is... Okay, you know, they want to advance the series and it's like a way to give like a graphical upgrade and like add the PvE content, but it's not completely removing Overwatch 1 because the original pitch for Overwatch 2, for anybody that forgot, was you were going to be able to crossplay with Overwatch 1. Uh, it would just be like if you had Overwatch 1, you didn't lose anything. It's just people who had Overwatch 2 would get, like, the new skins and stuff, and uh, you would have, like, the PvE content, blah, blah, blah. And that seemed pretty reasonable. I was like, yeah, that's fine. But then, of course, as time went on, uh, Overwatch 2 warped into something completely different. But I think you kind of need to separate that with uh, what it originally looked like. Um... Not even P-Hub will be able to save Overwatch 2. <laughs> yeah. Not safe for work stuff keeps Overwatch alive? Pretty much. Kind of agree with that. Uh, You thought the same? You thought Overwatch would be the next CSGO? Uh, and then Brigida came out? Oh. Well, 
I hate to say it, but uh, I actually liked Brigida. I know I'm going to get a lot of hate for that. But Brigida was actually my favorite character. And in fairness, I played post-nerf Brigida. I actually, I wasn't playing Overwatch actively when she was like ridiculously broken. And I, I was like feeling torn about it because I obviously knew about all of the Brigida hate when I started playing her, but I just wanted to try out the character and I just really enjoyed the kit. I really liked the melee healer thing and my favorite part is like Brigida's flail. I loved like doing like long range flails and hitting somebody with like the very edge of the flail and like knocking them into position. I played, um, I also really liked Heroes of the Storm and of course, rest in peace that game. Uh, but I really liked playing crowd control based like tanks and stuff. Like my main three characters that I played in Heroes of the Storm, uh, I played Diablo, Artanis, and Chen. Three uh, like bruiser tanks, basically. And I really liked how they had like mobility and they could like manipulate positioning and stuff like that. And like Artanis, I think was. You enjoyed jo um, Johanna. Ah. Uh... Johanna was the paladin, right? Um, I actually don't think I played her a lot, unless I'm confusing that or her with a different character. Um, I on, I played mostly Artanis and Diablo. I I really liked Chen. I found his play style fun, but he was like never meta, so I just didn't really get to play him. Yeah, that was the Crusader. I thought so. I just wanted to to be sure. Um. Yeah, I don't know. I just, I never really played her. I'm pretty sure I, I played her a little bit, but I don't even remember what her kit was. I remember she had, like, the little shield thing that blinded people, but that's about all I remember. Um, you were a god tier Thrall, Uther, and Illidan. Oh, yeah. Thrall and Illidan were definitely pretty fun. What was the, I forget. I actually, for DPS, I played Tracer a lot. Tracer was pretty fucking stupid. She had the falling sword that teleported her. Ah. Um, God, it's been so long. I forget what DPS character I played. Because, wait. Did I press yes to the expansion thing? Maybe I did. I didn't mean to. Oh, well, I don't even care. Avenger Shield? Oh, yeah, because you had the two different alts. Jaina was your main DPS character. I definitely played Jaina a good bit. Murky was your go-to. Never really played Murky. I could never get into the murky playstyle, but I respect people who were able to play it well. I mean, I'll be completely real. Most of my playtime, at least in competitive, was Artanis and Diablo. Um, I wouldn't say I was a one-trick, because, like, I was able to play most of the tanks reasonably well. But pretty much in, like, every single season where I actually played, um, like, competitive Heroes of the Storm, like, a decent amount... Both Artanis and Diablo were very powerful tanks for, like, different reasons. Like, Diablo was a very good main tank, and Artanis was kind of, like, a good sub-DPS, like, off-tank for stuff. Um, I definitely preferred playing Artanis. Uh, Artanis was so much fucking fun to play. Getting those, like, ridiculous swaps you do, like, the dash, and then, like, throw out the little cube, and you just, like, zip them into your backline. God, that was so much fun. Um... And I'm pretty sure they were characters that I played, like, a decent bit that I'm just blanking on now. I, I remember now, I played Tychus a lot for DPS, who also wasn't very good, but I loved his playstyle. And that was another one I loved get comboing people with, like, the grenade. Like, they would try to run away, and I'd, like, grenade in front of them, bounce them back. Um, was there, there was another DPS. I'm trying to remember it. Where? This, this is not a skip. <laughs> This is, like, not an actual skip. This skips nothing. <laughs> like, oh. I guess if you don't pull this pack, if you don't, like, jump, but that's uh, not really important. Um, I wish I remembered. I There was some DPS character that I played a lot um, that I just completely am blanking on who it was. I, I don't know. I played Heroes of the Storm quite a lot, though. Uh, definitely quite a lot. You put in work in Dota 2, but that's about it. Yeah, I never really played Dota. I've also played League very little. I've had a few friends who tried to get me into League, but i never really been my thing. 
Dissing MDI skips totally out of line. Yeah. I mean, I could see that maybe being useful in MDI if everybody was able to pull it off, like, ridiculously quickly. But I don't know if it's really worth it. Maybe it is. I don't know. Um. Ah. I should also note, I stopped playing towards the end, so I, like, the very final few characters, I don't really know much at all about. Um, like, I don't think I ever played with Deathwing, or whatever, like, the last three characters they added were. I remember that they added Deathwing as, like, a character at some point, but I, I literally have, ne have never played the game since then. Um... You loved Varian at level 6 because you could choose to go between Arms and Fury. Oh, yeah. God, I forgot about Varian. I vaguely remember that. And I think, yeah, because it couldn't Varian also be like a tank? It, it My memory's fuzzy, but I want to say that Varian was able to be played as a tank. And... I remember the whole thing where you get to choose, like, what you actually play as. Maybe I'm just high. Uh... Are the tank and healer the same person? Huh? In this dungeon? Um... Oh, wait, shit, you might be right. Uh, I don't think they are. I'm assuming it's just, like, a group of- or two friends who are just playing together. And just happen to queue or something. Uh. Yeah, I don't. I don't think they are. Um. It is definitely odd. I will give you that, especially because the healer is in bear form. Which, like, normally I would say it's whatever, you know, there's not really a lot to actively heal here. So it's not necessarily weird that they're in bear form. But it is... Odd. I don't know. Maybe. Could be. Um, there was a tank build. You would choose between Taunt, Colossus Smash, or Twin Blade to Fury. Yeah. That's what I remember, because I remember there was there were times where like I would pick Varian as like kind of the the flex tank, and sometimes depending on like how the the game was going, I would actually you know instead of going with like a tanky build, I would pivot in the middle of the game to like one of the more uh, damage variants, so that I could just help with DPS. Like if I felt that like if we were snowballing already. And what we needed is just more damage to just put the enemy team in the ground. Then I would just go full DPS Varian and we would like solo tank it. But if we needed a tank because like our tanks weren't very good, then I would go Varian. I forgot about that. Yeah, I actually, I think Varian was like towards the end of when I started, stopped really actively playing the game. So that was like past when I played competitive a lot. But I definitely remember when I picked up the game for a little bit again. I played Varian a decent amount. It's funny, I completely forgot that he was a character, but now that you say that, I, I have the memories of playing him in multiple different games, uh, and I remember doing that. Yeah, very fun draft pick for that reason. That's why I always liked tanks like Artanis, who, Artanis was effectively a DPS if you played him properly. Because, I mean, while he was very good at, like, you know, soaking up damage and getting picks for your team and, like, throwing people to the back line, you could also just make Artanis work just as a, like, 1v1 bruiser. So, very fun to play. Oh, is he using a good appearance changing toy? He is, yeah. No, yeah, in that case, I don't think he is uh, the same person. Siege tank and medic was really fun. Yeah, I always liked having them on my team, but I was never into either one of them. What was it? Sergeant Hammer and Morales, I think, were the names of those characters. Uh, I really liked the medic, like, little dropship thing. There were always, like, fun utility where you just, like, have the dropship 
uh, like on a little objective and then immediately take the entire team like into a team fight and the enemy isn't expecting everybody to just drop in their heads. That was always fun. And then of course the tank had like some weird uh, like things that you could do with it. So I never played them too much. I, I let me see. I'm gonna look up the Heroes of the Storm roster because there was one DPS character that I vaguely remember I played a lot, and for whatever reason, I cannot remember who it was. It's like I have these vague memories of their kit. Heroes of the Storm characters. Um Who the fuck is Kira? What the hell? Oh, that's a Heroes of the Storm original character. Yeah, okay, well, she was never in the game when I played. Uh... Uh... Let's... They added Hugger. Oh, yeah, I remember. Wasn't Hogger one of the last characters they added? Maybe Hogger was literally the last character. Yeah, because I think what I'm looking at is actually the reverse order of when they added characters. I'm trying to remember what the last character that I ever played with was. Um, some of these I remember. Yeah, because I definitely played when Hanzo was in and Alex Straza. Uh, I don't... I think... Yeah, I might have stopped playing for good around the time when White Main released. I definitely played... It was around when Yurel came out that I stopped playing Heroes of the Storm. That was like the last time I played it. All the characters released since then, I don't think I played. I might have played a little bit when White Main came out. But I don't remember like Mephisto at all. And I remember hearing that like Orphea existed, but outside of that, basically nothing. And then I remember one of my friends who still played was telling me that, oh, they finally added Imperius, and I have no idea what their kit is at all, or anything like that. Um, oh yeah, I, I forgot, I played Garrosh a little bit. I, I was really disappointed with Garrosh, because Garrosh is like one of my favorite lore characters, but I did not connect with Garrosh's kit at all. And the, one of the problems with that is Garrosh, when he came out, was, like, very, very, very good. And I remember feeling like if I wanted to really push in competitive again, I would have needed to learn how to play Garrosh. And I tried, and I, I like, knew how to play him, but I just found him so boring. Like, his play style was just so tanky and so unengaging to me that I just could not get into it. So that always bugged me. I, I I don't... I just fucking press shifting power out of melee range. Whatever, I'm an idiot. Um, Trying to read this shit and... Uh, not paying attention to my actual abilities. So... Just being an idiot. Uh, Let's see. Anyone know if you can just buy WoW Game Time and play up till Shadowlands without buying Dragonflight? You can play up to 60 without Dragonflight if you have a sub. Yeah. You don't need, like, the entire game. Uh, oh shit, I'm in combat with something. Here, let me, um... Let me mount up real quick. Playing Nova with a super slow build with insane bullets? Oh, yeah. Um... Yeah, Nova was interesting. I remember playing her a little bit, but it wasn't really my playstyle. It was definitely cool whenever I had, like, a really strong Nova player on my team, because I remember them being really good, like, when it was played properly. But it was never something that I personally was, like, a big fan of. Uh, let's see. I need to spend at least a few talent points. Uh, let's go Splintering Cold, and what do I want to do here? I think Alter Time... Probably that. And I can put Alter Time... Probably don't need a Keybind for Slow Fall. If anything, I'll put Slow Fall on like 9 or something. That way I never press it normally. 
Uh, yeah, let me quickly find what character it was. So, I played a little bit of Zul'jin. I remember thinking Valera's playstyle was actually really cool, but I never got into it a ton. Um, I barely remember Probius. I don't think I saw very many people playing him. Lucio, I remember. I actually think whenever I healed, I played Lucio a lot if I ever was forced to play healer. Just because it was like... Um, it honestly was pretty easy. Oh yeah, I played Chromie a decent amount. I thought uh, Chromie's playstyle was kind of neat. Cho Gall, I played a lot. Um, mostly because I... I actually, I think I was pretty good at whatever the tank one. I think Cho was the tank. Yeah, Cho was the tank. Uh, I had a lot of friends who, like, whenever I was trying to get them into um, Heroes of the Storm, like, Cho Gaul was, like, a fun character to play because they wouldn't need to worry about positioning. That was the best part about him. Because, like, the worst thing about trying to get somebody into, like, a MOBA is teaching them positioning. and Like, you know, where is it okay to stand and where is it not okay to stand? And it's like... Well, if you stand slightly too far down this lane, you're probably going to get, like, ganked by this one random ability that you don't know exists. But, like, you know that stuff if you've played uh, the MOBA, like, enough time. So, I played a shit ton of Cho'Gall just because whenever I was trying to teach somebody the game, it was kind of, like, my go-to. And I was pretty good at Cho. And Cho also had, um, I really liked his ultimate, uh, Hammer of Twilight. I mean, they were both good. I think upheaval, like, with a coordinated group was technically better, if memory serves. But a lot of times, if I was just trying to play for, like, you know, I, I was effectively the carry, right? Hammer of Twilight was really nice, because it, like, allowed me to... It was low cooldown, let me get, like, a bunch of really easy picks by just, like, knocking somebody behind their team and stuff like that. So it was another one of those, like, Artanis-esque abilities where you just get to completely dunk on somebody who's out of position. And that's kind of what I was always really good at with, like, uh, playing bruiser tanks. And Cho was the perfect example of that. And that way I could just set up a pick for whoever was playing Gaul to do that. I also, I finally found, there were actually two characters that I played a lot. And now I finally remember. I played the shit out of Lunara. That was the character that I was thinking of that I could not remember. And I vaguely remember the kit. I played Lunara so, so much. Whenever I, like, had to play a DPS, that was my go-to. Because Lunara, I just, I absolutely love that playstyle. It was so much fun. Um, I also played Li Ming a decent amount. Uh, I think I actually, I probably played Li Ming more in competitive early on. Oh no, it's the Oculus! <laughs> uh... I'm actually curious how this is going to play out in uh, retail. I really like the Oculus in Classic because it's actually like it's scaled pretty well. And you get bonus rewards now for doing it, which works out well. But I do not expect people in retail to know it. I, I'm like 99% sure that scaling is just so fucked, though, in the retail version of the Oculus that it just won't even matter. Um, but yeah, I think... Now that I'm rem remembering all the characters, Li Ming, Lunara, Artanis, Diablo, uh, mostly those were all ones that I played. Those were like my main competitive picks. And um, then there were like a few others that I played a little bit. I really liked playing Rexar, but Rexar just... Like, Rexar and Chen were two tanks that I love their playstyle, but they just weren't really that good and competitive at least when i played i don't know if stuff changed later on i remember the butcher being pretty fun to play too but he was also kind of a weird one because like he had to dive super heavily so you either got the kill or you were completely fucked and you just ran out of gas uh sylvanas i remember being really broken i think i played sylvanas a few times just because like her when I still when I played, she was still like I think they were called specialists back then, and Sylvanas was just ridiculously overpowered because she could literally solo a tower if nobody came to stop her, and like she could solo an entire little fort with like the towers and all the other buildings, just because of how broken her little passive effect was, 
back in the day. So I remember sometimes I felt like I kind of needed to play her. And uh, what else? Oh yeah, I played Zagara a lot. That's another one I completely forgot about. Zagara, I, I really enjoyed the play style of Zagara. Uh, it definitely a bit of a, a more interesting one to play because it was like minion based and you had to like kind of spread your creep along the ground and like you slowly built up like a section of the map. So I kind of like that part because I had like my own little section of the map that I would carve out and that's what I would do. Um, okay, I'm going to pick my dragon based on what everybody else picks. Is the best comp in Wrath Classic is two ruby, two emerald, one amber, but scaling is weird. So I'm going to wait to see. Because if we have nobody picking Amber, then having a single Amber is very good. Uh, okay, we have one Emerald. This guy looks like he's going Amber. Uh, maybe? Okay, we have two Amber, one Ruby. Mm. You know, I think I'm going to go Emerald. I also don't pick Emerald a lot in Wrath, so it'll be a fun little thing. But I'm fairly certain, if I remember correctly, the uh, scaling on the Emerald's abilities are absolutely busted in retail. It ends up doing just an absurd amount of damage. Because when I tested my stuff for the Oculus Guide, I did a decent amount of testing on retail in addition to classic, just to get some like bonus footage of how specific abilities worked. And it was kind of one of those weird situations where I wanted to get footage of the Emerald Dragon, but I play a tank in classic and I wasn't about to get an entire holy set and heal dungeons just to play Emerald Drake. So I kind of needed to get a lot of my Amber and Emerald footage on retail. That was like kind of a weird situation. I'm also com I completely forgot how many of these characters, like, in Heroes of the Storm, I played and just completely forgot about. I played Vala a decent amount. Um, I played Zeratul a little bit. I played ETC. ETC was good, but so boring. I hated his playstyle. Like, his ultimate was really powerful, but such a fucking snooze fest to play around with. I did not really enjoy it. And then Tyrande was weird, because, like, Tyrande got reworked at some point, like, when I was playing, and she played completely differently later on. But I remember playing her a little bit. Anyways, that's... We, we talked extensively about Here's the Storm. Sad they let that game go to waste? Yeah, I think it had a lot of potential. It was really fun. Angela Gomez said, I've been using your routes a lot in the past month, especially since you've been playing with your girlfriend that's new to the game. After a couple runs, you thought it would be fun if you could come up with a route that involves the second best choices. Uh, I don't know. Did anybody respond in chat? Uh, no. Um, yeah, so I actually... I don't necessarily have a route with second best choices, but I have a section of my website that actually lists out uh, alternatives and, like, you know, other zones that are pretty good. My go-to recommendation is Stone Talon Mountains. I love Stone Talon Mountains. It's one of my favorite zones. It also, it has a special significance to me because it's, while it's a good zone, it's a little bit weird in terms of the pacing and like the end of it tends to fall off pretty hard. Oh yeah, that is some juicy shit right there with scaling damage. Look at that. Just a one tap. Um. So I love Stone Talon Mountains and for, like, you know, a little history thing for people who uh, weren't around since, like, my first ever video. But my first ever speedrun, uh, when I, like, so, I, I guess for context, right? I started doing this leveling stuff, like, officially, like, at, w in terms of videos and whatnot, back in the Shadowlands pre-patch. So, for many, 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 many years, I've done speed leveling for fun, you know, just in my free time. 
If I just feel like doing speed leveling, I'll do a speed leveling run. Uh, so I kind of generally already knew the route for years now. But it wasn't until Shadowlands where I actually decided that I was going to go for the world record. And I decided to make a video out of it and make a then leveling guide after the fact for fun. And in my first ever speed run, after I had done all my practice runs and I was finally ready to uh, like put it to the test and test my new route and see if it was good. Um, the day of the speed run, and this kind of happened a lot back then, Gorgrond was an unplayable mess. Like, if you go back, you can find it in, like, the WoW speedruns playlist on my channel. Uh, it's currently unlisted because it's a really old video and the editing is... Well, I, I didn't edit it because it was a speedrun, but the audio quality is terrible, etc. Um, but the first ever world record that I got, it was the first video I ever posted to this channel. Uh, Gorgrond was completely fucked. The It was laggy, I could not do anything... And because of that, because my route kind of hinged upon Gorgrond at the time, I had to rely on a backup strat. So the two backup strats that I used were, um, I went to Western Plague Lands, and I did, oh my god, I almost just jumped on my regular mount and then I would have walked off the cliff. Good thing I caught myself. Uh, I went to Western Plague Lands, and I did like the first half of that until I reached the point at which I wanted to continue with the route. And then I went back to Gorgrond and did a lot of stuff there. But because that, like, issue with Gorgrond had thrown off the rest of my, like, route, I had, like, a bit of experience at the end that I needed to make up. And I could have either continued along with my original plan, but, like, my original plan, I forget exactly what it was, but it was, like, I would have needed to continue in Wad, but the rest of Wad was, like, fairly slow. And then it, like, would have picked up when I got to Spires, but I was already so far behind at that point that... Um, I just had to completely change things up. And so I decided for the last, like, however many levels, I think it was like two levels or something, that I was going to just go to Stone Talon Mountains as like my backup zone. And because I knew that the front loaded experience in that zone was actually quite good. And I ended up barely getting the world record at the time uh, with Stone Talon Mountains as the final zone I went to. So I actually hit level 50, which was the cap then. The moment I, like, turned in quests in Malak Jin, I think, it's whatever the little troll village is in the south of Stone Town Mountains. So all that to say, uh, I always loved that zone, but after that speedrun, not only, you know, was it a zone that I just thought was really fun and good for questing, but it now has special significance to me because, you know, it's the zone where I finished my first ever world record speedrun. And that's like, that, that memory sticks with you, you know? So... I really like Stone Talon, but I have an entire web or a section of my website for comparable uh, things. You know what? I'm I'm just gonna ice block this. Fuck it. Does this even one shot? It actually looks like it did a decent amount of damage there. Either way, here I'll do uh do this boss and see. Um. So how much does the poison deal? Oh shit, they're already going. I need to make sure my poison is built up on the mob before I do anything crazy. So I have three stacks built up here. I need to build up stacks on the whelp so I can leech. And then, yeah, okay. So my suspicion was correct. Uh, if we look at the damage breakdown, this guy was playing the Amber Drake. And then this was the fucking Emerald Drake damage. Um, so yeah, I guess if you ever get the Oculus in Random Dungeon Finder, just go like triple Emerald Drake because holy shit, that's broken. Also, am I going to die? What the hell? Okay, I barely lived. I tried to leave Instance Group there and it like canceled my pop-up. Um, and now I can do time walking, but I think it's... Oh, it actually works. Wait, hold up. Did they fix it? Um. Yeah, because I'm in the time walking queue. And I'm still in crummy time. So uh, the reason I'm surprised is there was a bug. 
that I thought was still active, where while you were in Chromie time, you were unable to queue for time locking dungeons. And then somebody in my Discord the other day said that they it was working for them, but then I think they posted a follow up saying, "Never mind, like it wasn't working." Um, but I guess maybe I think yeah, you'll get a message when yeah, because Troy, you were the one who posted that, right? So did they end up fixing it? They'll get a message when trying to zone in. Um, okay, just to be safe. Let me... Uh, I'm going to turn in all of the quests here, and then I'm just going to go back to... I'll set my Hearthstone to lock mode on in case I want to come back here really quickly. But I don't want to be, like, caught out with um, no ability to enter the dungeon, especially considering the queue is apparently very long. It's a ridiculous DPS queue time. Sheesh. Makes sense, though. That's one of the problems of leveling a pure DPS spec. You're a mage, so when the queue pops, just teleport to Stormwind. Um, well, yeah, see, but the problem is, if I do it right when the queue pops, like it's going to take me to the portal room, and then I would need to fly to Chromie on the other side. If it was Orgrimmar, sure, because it's very close to the portal room, but I don't know if I'd be able to make it all the way from the portal room to Chromie and turn off Chromie time and the time it takes for me to, like, cast the portal or cast the teleport and then uh, exit the portal room. It, that's a pretty far distance. So I think I'm just going to turn in this stuff and then, I mean, honestly, I need to catch up on chat anyways, so that's a good chance to just sit there and wait for time walking and just read chat. Abathur overall, oh yeah. I See, I could not play Abathur. I never played Abathur. But I had a friend who was like a godlike Abathur, and I loved playing with him. Because, yeah, when Abathur was good, when you had a, like somebody who knew how to play Abathur, and they had like sick map presence, and they knew what they were doing, Abathur was so fucking nice. But uh, that was a very hit or miss character, where you either had somebody who had literally no idea how to play Abathur, and was just feeding the entire time because they just were so fucking bad. Or you had a god like Abathur who was everywhere at once and a massive pain to the enemy team. Kind of similar to Murky and Lost Vikings. Those are both like comparable characters. That's one of the interesting things I thought about Heroes of the Storm. Like the characters that I played were relatively basic. But one of the things I liked about it. What the? Excuse me? What was that Comet Storm? Like, just landed right at... I guess it. the positioning is based off where the mob is when you cast it. That's fucking lame. Um. Either way, yeah. I really liked that. Sergeant Hammer was another good example. Uh, I think Lost Vikings is... Lost Vikings is one of those characters where I, like... I don't think I ever saw somebody really play it well. I Well, actually, I take it back. I remember there was one really good Lost Vikings player who I got in, like, my competitive queue, and it was, like, he auto-locked Lost Vikings, and I groaned. I'm like, oh my god. And he actually did really good. I think I added him to friends after that, but I don't really think I played with him much. But I did message him, and I'm like, man, I've literally never seen somebody manage to actually play this character correctly. I'm very impressed. But it was definitely a very weird one that most people just did not know how to play. Uh, let me quickly set my Hearthstone and stuff. Sergeant Hammer could also solo every single building? Yeah. The thing about Sylvanas, though, it, why Sylvanas was so broken, is like, Sergeant Hammer, if people knew how to counter you, you know, the moment you started besieging the building, they already knew, oh, somebody go up there and deal with the Sergeant Hammer. And like, on pretty much every single tank that I played, I could 1v1 a Sergeant Hammer. I could just go up there and absolutely clean their clock. If they didn't really know what they were doing. And I mean, even if they did, it wasn't too hard to deal with. Sylvanas was annoying because Sylvanas was like ridiculously broken at soloing stuff. And even if you tried to gank her, she had so many escape tools and just broken bullshit. At least the version of Sylvanas that was in the game when I played was absolutely fucking busted. And I mean, honestly, kind of fun uh, when you were playing her, but very much not that when somebody else was playing her. On the enemy team, presumably. I didn't really get anything good out of that. 
everyone should go DPS Drake because the last fight is broken. The boss literally dies in like five seconds. Um, well, I mean, I think as I showed there, the M or the healer Drake actually does more damage. I get that the boss is broken in terms of scaling, and I'm pretty sure any Drake is better there, but I highly doubt that Amber Drake, that at least stacking Amber Drakes is better there. Um, because the thing about the the boss fight, right? Um, let me just grab this and I'll go. Uh, the thing about that boss fight, or rather the Drakes in general, is Amber Drakes are actually not good for damage. It is a this is one of like if you watch my Wrath of the Lich King Oculus guide, which you know that is out of all of the dungeon guides I made for Wrath Classic, the Oculus guide is my most popular one by far. That one has good views just by my regular video standards, not even like my dungeon guide standards. And I think it has close to 50,000 views at this point. Um, and I've gotten fairly good responses from it because obviously I put a ridiculous amount of effort into that guide and um, discussing the strategies and stuff like that. And one of the main things that I talk about in my Oculus guide is dispelling the idea that the Amber Drake is good for damage. The Amber Drake is very weird. The Amber Drake's actual initial upfront damage is terrible. It is the worst dragon for like regular spammable damage. The entirety of the Amber Drake's damage comes from detonating the whatever I forget what it's called, the time charges that it places on the mob. And it's been a hot minute and I don't play Amber Drake in any of the Oculus runs that I do in Wrath because somebody always picks Amber Drake and it's not stackable. But I know you have, like, the full time stop ability, and the time stop thing is there for utility, because you time stop the boss whenever he does the enrage. But I've seen a lot of people saying that the Amber Drake is really good because you can chain the time stop thing, and the boss can't do anything. And, like, to an extent, sure, but people who say that also have never played with a good Ruby player, because if you know what you're doing as the Ruby Drake player which I always play the main Ruby Drake. I play Ruby Drake and I tell everybody, do not do, or because you do two Ruby, right? So I have two Rubies. I tell the other Ruby players, spam one in the boss. I will handle the taunting. And it, like, if you're playing Wrath Classic, right? And, and this applies to literally everybody, not just tank players, right? Because you can do all of the dragons regardless of your role. So if you want to make sure every single Oculus run you ever do is piss easy, learn how to be the main Ruby Drake. Because that is what I do in every run. Now, I also play tank, but if you are a DPS player and you at the start of the dungeon say, hey, tank, if you want, I can be the main Ruby Drake for the final boss fight. I think a lot of them will, if they don't really know what they're doing, will say, sure, I don't care, right? Because if you know what you're doing as the main Ruby Drake, you can basically take no damage. Uh, there are are like very small periods of time where you will be like taking one or two hits but provided you time it well and you make sure that those points in time when you are taking like one or two hits from the boss are outside of the window in which he's enraged you'll take like 20 percent of your health and damage and then you'll be dodging all attacks on the entire party for the next like 20 30 seconds and the boss cannot do anything to stop you and the only thing that you need for that is one Emerald Drake. Now, having two is still good. Technically speaking, the most optimal comp in, like, pugs, and this is why in my guide I recommend two Ruby, two Emerald, one Amber, it is having the second Emerald there as a backup. Now, the, the last dragon is interchangeable with Emerald and Amber, I would say. Hell, you could even get a third Ruby, and it really would not be that bad. Uh, I also, I need to leave crummy time, so I'd like to return the present timeline. The last dragon could be honestly anything. The reason that I say it should be emerald is because their damage is roughly comparable. The damage of a second and onwards amber dragon is almost the same as emerald and uh, a third ruby. A uh, third ruby is definitely the weakest. A second ruby is massive. I always say, whenever I join an Oculus Pug in Wrath Classic, I'm like, I don't really care what you pick as long as we have a second Ruby Dragon along with me. That is the most important thing to making sure that your group goes well. Um, but the Amber Dragon is, I would say, the weakest out of all of them. Uh, because 
having one Amber Dragon to detonate the time charges is really good, but you honestly get diminishing returns. Now, the thing about Amber Dragons is, technically speaking, for that final slot where I said, like, you want two Ruby, one Emerald, one Amber, and then there's that final slot, technically speaking, a second Amber is the best there. If they are coordinating their abilities and having one of the Ambers detonate all the t time charges at the right point in time, no pun intended, uh, if they're like actively like not overlapping their abilities and they're not wasting any time charges and they're making sure that one of them is building up the time charges while the other one is detonating it, because it's like you have the t the channel into the boss that builds up charges on him or something like that then you have the time stop that immediately applies a bunch of charges and stuns the boss and then you have your auto attack which does like no damage but detonates all active charges so technically speaking a second amber can be nice if they know that their only role is to build up charges in the boss and then have the other one detonate those charges but in pugs most of the time they're just kind of going to be slamming their abilities and having a second Amber who is just pressing abilities and not actually understanding how it works is almost always going to be worse, both in damage and utility, compared to just having a third Ruby or, more realistically, a second Emerald. Because while I did say before, if you have a really, really, really good Ruby player who knows how to manage their dodge stacks and knows how to, like, cover the abilities on all- or cover the incoming damage on all the other dragons, they can basically solo the entire fight and nobody takes any damage. But most of the time in Pugs, that's not what's going to happen. Generally speaking, in Pugs, you're not going to have a Ruby who really knows what they're doing, and there's going to be a lot of hits that go through. So in that case, having the second Amber as a backup, just in case you need to uh, like quickly spot heal a dragon that gets low, is very helpful. Not to mention, Emerald Dragons actually do pretty solid damage uh, in a vacuum. I actually think pure single target, Assuming you're not doing the thing I described earlier with, like, min-maxing the two Amber Dragons, uh, the Emerald Dragon actually probably does the most damage. Touch of Nightmare hits pretty hard, and if you keep your uh, Poison Dot rolling on the boss at three stacks the entire time, it's actually quite strong. So, definitely not bad to have that combo. How most Pugs play Oculus... One finger on one, one finger on two, one finger on three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Pretty much, yeah. Um, and honestly, you can kind of play uh, the Ruby Dragon like that, at least the, the second one. So if you really want to play it safe, at the start of every Oculus, just say, okay, who here has no idea what's going on? And if somebody says, I have no idea what's going on, tell them to be the second Ruby Dragon. Because quite literally, as the second Ruby Dragon, your entire job is to press one on the boss that way, the moment the ads spawn, you are cleaving them all down with, like, the chain lightning bounces or chain fire bounces, and it's completely removing the ads from the fight, because that, combined with the tank's damage, is going to make the ads die almost instantly. And that is all they need to do. They do not need to worry about the taunting, because the taunting stuff doesn't stack. Uh, the utility abilities on the Ruby Dragon, you only need one of them, but regularly... I've seen Ruby Dragons do more damage than Amber if all they're doing is sitting there spamming one in the boss. Because it actually has a higher initial upfront damage than Amber's, uh, not counting the charges. And the Ruby one also cleaves on dads, so it's really good. Um, that's kind of one of those funny things, though, where the more research I did into it back on Wrath Classic launch, I realized that the meta that I had been used to, like when I played Wrath as a kid, I remember Amber Drakes being the thing that everybody picked. But, like, I, I looked into it, I did a multiple testing runs with multiple Ambers, and I consistently found that it just was not good. That it was just a, a misleading thing where everybody thought the Dragon Drake is what you want to pick because it does the most damage, but it actually was not the most damage. Uh, just a little bit counterintuitive there. Mostly because I don't think people understood how Ambers actually meant to do damage. Because it is a bit of a weird thing where you build them detonate charges, but I always thought that was pretty cool. I like the Oculus Dragon Riding mechanic, honestly. I think for something designed back then, it has a decent amount of depth in terms of the the controls and stuff like that, and like the way the different abilities interact. I actually think it's fairly well put together. It's just a lot of people don't want to learn and don't really care enough to figure out the Dragon Riding minigames. They're just like, ah, I fucking hate the Oculus. 
when it's actually really easy. And I guess the other thing about Oculus is a lot of people, when they're in there for like the first or second time, they have no idea where to go and they just get lost and the dungeon ends up taking a while for them. But the fun thing about the Oculus is when you know the path through the dungeon, it is really, really, really fast. It is a very quick dungeon. There's really not a lot to it. Um, also, for the purposes of testing, if anybody in chat happens to have an Alliance tank character that wants to queue for time walking dungeons, I am willing to group up for this. Uh, because at the moment, time walking queues for DPS are too ridiculous. Uh, I'll at least wait for this dungeon to pop, but assuming nobody else is able to queue, on NA at least, then uh, I will probably just go back to doing questing and like spamming regular dungeons because this is like an insane queue time. I still have to catch up in chat though, so. Uh, let's see. What if you choose one timeline and stick to it for leveling? How would you rank each expansion for speed? A uh, WAD would actually not be first, Angelo. Uh, WAD would probably be second, I think. Though even that is debatable. Um, eh, WAD would probably be second. And the only question is, uh, Wad is not nearly as good as it used to be. Now, back when it first came out, definitely, uh, Wad was ridiculously broken for leveling speed for a while. They nerfed it quite significantly in Shadowlands, and after that, it has never been the same in terms of how quick it is. The fastest expansion by far, and we're using expansion loosely here, is a Cata Revamp Zones. And I think one of the main advantages of Cata Revamp Zones is there's so many of them that if you did like a pick and choose of all the fastest cata revamp zones, those are definitely the most efficient. Like not even close. Um and yeah, I'd say Wad is probably the second fastest, just because I don't really know what I would say would be faster outside of that. But there's a reason why those two expansions are the ones that primarily feature in my leveling route outside of like TBC dungeons, but I would say the Catazones are the faster of the two. Uh, yeah, aside from Wad Intro being really broken, Cata Revamp is very good. Now, Endgame Catazones are a bit different. They're not bad, but they are definitely nowhere near as fast. Like, we're talking Vashir, Mount Hygel, etc. They are a good bit slower. Um... Something that you'd love to see, but you don't know if it would be well-received or feasible, would be if they can make single-roll dungeons like all tank healer DPS groups. Well, th they kind of did that. Uh, that was called Scenarios. They implemented that in Miss of Pandaria, and then they <laughs> kind of never touched it again. And to be quite honest, it was not very well-received. So I think the nice thing, Neko no Kenshi, is we... Um, because of that, we kind of have a historical example to look at of what it would be like to have all, like, no role-restricted dungeons. And the TLDR of scenarios is they there were regular scenarios, and then there were heroic scenarios. Regular scenarios were super-duper easy because if you need to make it so it's doable with all DPS you can't actually have any hard mechanics. One of the more interesting things about scenarios is because it needed to be doable without um, DPS or without uh, healers or tanks, a lot of them had like little gimmicks and stuff where like you could grab a potion that would heal you or something like that, or you would have extra action buttons that would give you like abilities that let you function as a mini tank or a mini healer. That was kind of neat. Um, obviously not really practical in terms of like regular dungeon design. But as like a little gimmick, it's fun. And the thing that I liked about scenarios is a lot of the incoming damage, at least in normal mode, was avoidable damage. Because they needed to make sure like it would still some remotely threatening stuff in there. Otherwise, it would be non-content if nothing could actually kill you. But if they need to design it so that you don't actually need a healer, well then there needs to be damage that you could in theory completely avoid. And that was kind of cool. But at the end of the day, what happened was, you know, normal scenarios were just brain-dead easy, and because they were so easy, Blizzard 
never really put any rewards behind them. And then heroic scenarios, which actually did have decent rewards, were hard. So heroic scenarios, you just did with a tank, a DPS, and a healer. And it was just a regular dungeon. And that, yeah, it's kind of the problem. <laughs> so when you design things like that, you kind of inherently just uh, build yourself into a corner where you don't really have too many options in terms of how you're able to play it. Just a little bit unfortunate there. It's a neat idea. And I think scenarios as a concept were cool. I remember being excited for them back in the day. But functionally, they just did not really pan out. Um, real quick, let me just see. I got a ping. Oh, it's a, a new application to the guild. Cool. Uh, check into something real quick. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, bond demand. I'll read because it's, it's, since it's a big message, I I want to make sure I have time to respond to. I didn't read the exact thing, but I'll, I'll read it and respond to it. I'm assuming there's going to be a decent amount to talk about there because I can answer this other stuff really quickly first. Um, Naomi said, after all the pain of weekly keys, you try to get score on your evoker randomly queued into mode. Almost plus two to 24 black or cold and pugs. Mode. Ah, I do not know who that is, unfortunately. I'm sure if you told me, I would know, like, recognize them, be like, ah, oh, it's that person, but it doesn't ring a bell. Uh, Rhea said, I would put Kata first, Wad second, Wrath third, Legion fourth. Definitely not Wrath third. I'm with you there. Um, Wrath would be down there with TBC. Wrath would be... You also, you missed fifth. Yeah, you went, you went from fourth to sixth. Uh, the tough call. I, I think Legion third is definitely like what you would put there. Legion is definitely third. Um, I think the only question is, I agree with everything else you put there, Rhea. The only thing I'm unsure of is whether Wrath or Mop would be faster. And honestly, I think Mop would be faster. Wrath isn't that good it wrath there are certain sections of it that can be okay when you have fast flying but it definitely had much larger zones where like it's a bit more spread out so i i don't know i think on average wrath is definitely not super fast and i guess that's it right i guess bfa Oh, I, I see what you said. BFA before Legion. Um, uh, BFA zones are kind of ass. Um, I assume you meant like BFA you would have put in fifth. I... That's a tough one. I think I would put BFA ahead of Wrath. But... I would probably put Mop ahead of BFA, I think. And I guess if this is if we're just talking about quests, Mop goes up significantly if you include dungeons, but you know that they're kind of two different beasts. Also, this queue time is, oh my god, this is a little bit brutal. Um. Hmm. I'm going to wait it out and keep reading chat for now, but I guess if this hits like 35 minutes, I think I just go back to questing because that's a little bit... I did not expect 24 minute queue time, I'll be real. Uh, hello, Oxara Luna, good to see you. Uh, Stop said, hi, I'm new to WoW, you're level 37, what should you do, grind levels in dungeons or do your campaign quests or something else? Uh, I have a leveling guide on my channel stops, and I would recommend checking that out if you're new to WoW. It will tell you everything that you need to know as far as uh, stuff goes. Uh, the short answer is questing, I would say, especially if you're new. Definitely questing. Uh, but 
it would it would take me way too long to give you the full explanation and there's not really a point for me to do that when i of course have already put together a guide with the sole purpose of you know succinctly explaining all of the relevant information so like that's what that's there for uh what are you queuing for time walking uh did you queue as a tank oxara luna because i'm queuing as a dps a dps queue is right now 25 minutes um which yeah that is rough uh let's see queuing as a tank yeah that i am not surprised definitely seems like there aren't a lot of tanks around right now the issue with pandaria is there's a lot of walls questing wise because boss npcs are so inflated that's fair i guess i at least in recent years i haven't really tested pandaria questing primarily because it's like it's in that sweet spot of like not really good enough to be worth trying out but i guess if it does have severe scaling issues like you say i could understand that i think assuming things are scaled properly pandaria would be higher but i don't know maybe there are scaling issues somehow worse than lfr queues yeah oh, this is brutal once again, if anybody happens to have a tank in NA and they want a queue, I will do time walking. But otherwise, I'm probably just going to go back to questing. Uh, just uh, heads up there. I'll do one dungeon at least and get the 5% buff. At this point, it's like pure sunk cost fallacy, but might as well. Uh, let's see. Did that queue get started without time walking active? Wonder if it's bugged like that now. Uh, I am... A bit scared to try and fix it. I have a feeling that it's not bugged. I think this is just the DPS queue time. It is possible, but if you were to go with one session, Legion's fairly slow. Uh, yeah, I get, obviously Legion has the invasions. Um, I mean, Valshara is fine. I think Stormheim is fine. High Mountain honestly has some good bits to it. Uh, you can hop on a tank NA. Awesome. Oh, yeah, there we go. All right, well, it did finally pop. So, it wasn't bugs. That was just a regular queue. 25 minutes. Hooey. But yeah, I mean, after this, if somebody does want a queue, just whisper uh, Herda and then Malganus. You have to type the server if uh, you're not on Malganus. Oh, fuck. <laughs> I accidentally used my Radnax gem. On my main character, I have my Warlock Gateway Stone bound to Control R. While leveling, I just used that for my Radnax keybind. So I saw the gateway, I went to go click on it, and I accidentally used a charge in my Radnax. Not that I really need this extra one. Uh, yeah, what was I saying? You can queue tank as well after your dungeon. Awesome, I appreciate that. And this time, I'm just going to click on the gateway. Um, That's only if you play during an invasion to do the few close quests. I don't think, like, Legion isn't that bad, Naomi. I do agree that obviously what you said is true about invasions being very good. That's true. Um, But I think even outside of invasions, it's not terrible. There are definitely sections of Legion to avoid, and I think, like, Azuna is a really bad zone. So I would definitely not do Azuna. But I think if you did only the portions of Legion that were, like, really, really good, it's honestly not too bad. I guess the, the problem with that question, then, uh, we have to, like, analyze it as, are we saying you can only level in one expansion which expansion is the fastest because i think then the issue that you would get with legion is you would do a lot of the stuff in legion that is really really good and then you would hit like the really inefficient bits because it does have some really inefficient bits and then if you were forced to level for the remainder of that time in legion then yeah i could see that being kind of bad whereas like i guess that's kind of one of the strengths of having uh of, uh what's it called i'm i 
blanking on words. One of the strengths of like cat revamp zones is you will never run out of efficient quests to do. Because there are so many like solid zones, even if they aren't amazing, they're still going to just be good. So you'll still have that in your back pocket. Also, I need to get into melee range to use my shifting power. Oh, the boss is dead. Wow, he melted. And as usual, yeah, low-level characters get absolutely fucked for time-walking scaling. I think all things considered, I didn't do terrible. I at least beat the healer, which can be a little bit difficult as a low-level character in time-walking scaling. Um... It's not horrible. You can log off, wait till invasion, log in, do invasion. Yeah. Well, but that's the thing, though. That's why I always hate opening that can of worms, because you're not wrong that that's fast. But then, I think, actually, technically speaking, if you do that strategy, I think Missa Pandaria is the fastest. Because I think there's, like, a set of daily quests. Somebody told me about this a while ago, where it, they we're really, at this point, stretching the definition of what it means to, like, actually... Um, level the character normally, but there's like a set of daily quests that for the time it takes to complete them, they give like really good experience. Um, but of course, getting to like the point where you can actually unlock them, it, it's not worth it for like an actual speed run. But if you unlock the quests and then you do them every single day for 30 days, it gets you like a ridiculously low slash play time. So, but, but that's the thing. It's like five minutes a day, like you said. Yeah, playing five minutes a day and then doing quests like that. There are so many like weird strategies you can do to optimize things like that. So it starts to get a little bit blurry on like, you know, what's actual leveling. But you are correct for sure about Legion um, invasions being very good. But I think, yeah, if you were ever to like do Legion within a route, it would be... Like, line it up with the invasion and then include just that zone. But even then, like, with the current route, I don't think it would be faster, though it would be decent. Uh, but yeah, I think if we're talking, like, entire expansion, you can't do anything else. Would be a little bit weird. Hello, Daniel Penhollerick. Good to see you. Um, That said, honestly, one of the reasons why... I, I do want to work on it at some point, my, like, challenge run format for uh like trying out different zones because well there's a lot of fun things that i could do with like you know the ideas that i presented with like turning leveling into a roguelike type of stuff um then i, I also think one of the more fun parts that i could do is the random randomly selected zones and whatnot and making it so like every single run feels different and i don't get bored of doing the same thing over and over again and I actually get, like, some choice in what I level with. So that's one of the things about it that I'm most excited for. I hate that, like, I keep teasing that type of uh, format, and I just never have time to, like, actually get around to it. It's on my bucket list, I swear, but it's... Uh, we'll see. I think, like, December I should finally have, like, free time to start working on, like, a lot of those longer projects. Because, tech, generally speaking, every single year in December, I have, like, a good amount of free time. Last year, it was a little bit weird, because last year, I was still trying to finish up, like, Vault of the Incarnate's guides, and I, I felt, like, really far... Dragonflight just kind of fucked me over on launch, so I actually... I was so busy last December. But, like, the two Decembers before then, when I was making videos, that was, like, my best time to, like, get miscellaneous projects done nothing was really going on and like around christmas there's no really big releases at like after christmas that is um because everybody's on vacation right and a lot of times like you know guilds will take off for like the week on christmas and new year's so i also don't have like rating and stuff to worry about uh, that said if it were up to me i'd still raid on christmas and new year's like i will raid every fucking day of the week if i need to um but generally speaking, I end up having just a lot more free time there for obvious reasons, so that I can get other stuff done. Um, but, yeah, we'll see. There's obviously a lot of things on my bucket list right now for, like, little projects that I want to work on. So I have no idea if that's going to make the cut for, like, my initial bout of free time. And also, 
it kind of depends on what they're going to do with Cataclysm Classic. Because I've said before, I have big plans for Cataclysm Classic. I'm going to be playing that a lot, and I'm going to make a lot of videos on it, provided it, you know, ends up being the way that I think it'll be, which is fun. Um, so, presuming Blizzard doesn't release Cataclysm Classic too fast, which I hope they don't. I think if they, um, if they, like, release it in May or something, May, June, etc., I think would be perfect. Gives us, like, half a year of ICC, and, you know, Ruby Sanctum, presumably later on down the track. In that case, I should have more than enough time to, like, get all the research and stuff done. Like, get all my Cataclysm Dungeon Guides out. I'm probably going to try to make Cataclysm Raid Guides. Because, like, I haven't really bothered too much with Wrath Raid Guides. Because a lot of the raid bosses are fairly simple. Like, you could argue the dungeons are simple too, but... It's, I, I don't know. The, the other thing is, admittedly, while ICC, technically speaking, could have been fun to make raid guides for, because we now have bosses with, like, actual somewhat complexity, it is one of those things where I, because I have not really been invested in uh, classic raiding for so long, I'm not in a position where I can, like, really test this stuff on the PTR. And obviously, I could do it on live servers, but I think for guides like that, for, like, the standard of quality that I like to hold myself to, for those guides, I would want to be doing extensive PTR testing just to make sure that, like, all of the strategies that I find actually work the way I think they do. And that is something that I can and have done for my dungeon guides, but I simply do not have the ability to do that for raids. But for Cataclysm, because I know that I would be interested in making those raid guides, I'd start looking into doing that early, and I think that could be a lot of fun. In addition to, of course, um... I want to... I'll see if these guys will requeue just in case. But usually the tank will leave. Oh, the tank actually requeued here. Oh. Yeah, nice. Well, I guess just to make things simpler, I'll keep requeuing with these guys until the tank leaves. Because for now, I get instant queues. But yeah, um... Oxara, whenever... Like, if this guy ditches, I will... I'll let you know. I Obviously, you'll be watching. Right, but I, I appreciate it. Uh, let's see. I just figure for the moment this is probably easier. But we also immediately left or lost somebody at the start of this dungeon. Huh. Uh, let's see. What else did I miss? You enjoyed Korak's Revenge leveling? Yeah. I didn't really mess around with Korak's Revenge leveling, because it wasn't like... It, it was, like, Korak's Revenge stuff, and honestly, it's similar to Alterac Valley leveling in Classic. It's good, but it's still, like, slower than speedruns. So, like, I remember looking into it, and I'm like, yeah, it's, it's not as fast as, like, my route. But I completely understand why people like to do that, because it's, like, the same reason why I was doing Wrath Dungeons earlier. If it's, like, mindless... And it's still solid XP. A lot of times you're just in the mood for that. And Korak's Revenge definitely was like pretty brain off. You know, you just get free XP. So I get that for sure. Um, Angelo Gomez said, The question originally came when deciding how to level through quests uh, with your girlfriend. Doing all the jumping between timelines would be confusing. So you wanted to stick to just one timeline? Yeah. In that case, I would definitely say how to revamp zones. Uh, there's a lot of really good ones. You could easily fill, you could fill a route, like, three times over with just Kata Revamp Zones on, like, really, really, really good ones to do. Even some of the ones that I don't have listed on my website, there are so many amazing Kata Revamp Zones. Which is another reason why I've said, like, Cataclysm, I know that people don't like the world revamp, and, uh, like, people have been saying, oh, we need a new world v revamp, and I think... Ian has Acostas kind of soft confirmed that a world revamp is in the works at some points. Uh, but he did say it wouldn't be like a cataclysm where they completely overwrite the world. So I don't know what they would do for that. I, I think there's like two ways to do it. One thing would be like aesthetically updating the old zones to account for like, you know, making it not all cataclysm themed anymore. And then doing what they did in cataclysm and revamping the entire quest line. And I think in many cases... You could do, like, an art update and make the zones look more modern without actually impacting the flow of the questing experience. And 
like, I don't really think you need to impact the flow of the questing experience because Cataclysm holds up so fucking well. It's actually impressive. Like, for the time when it came out, it's honestly unbelievable how good those quests are. And, it, like, across the board, so many good examples. And it is such a huge leap to, um, or, like, to what was there at the time. Like, let me see, when did... What year did Cataclysm come out? Wow, Cataclysm release date. December 7th, 2010. What year did Warhammer Online Age of Reckoning come out in? Warhammer Online Age of Reckoning. Uh, came out in 2008. Okay, so it was two years before. Uh, but considering, yeah, Warhammer Online came out two years before uh, Cataclysm. And Cataclysm still holds up to this day, whereas I'm using Warhammer as an example because, like, I played through it a little bit, like, a few years ago, and I keep meaning to go back to it and try it, like, the private server. And it, it was fun when I played it, but it definitely felt like an old MMO. Cataclysm is so far ahead of its time, it's not even funny. It, it's absolutely ridiculous. Uh, also, what is Warhammer Online Wrath of Heroes? Uh, huh. Apparently there was another Warhammer MMO that was in development. Wrath of Heroes was announced on 2011. It, was, it entered open beta. And then they scrapped it on 2013. Huh. I only know about this because as I was typing in Google, Warhammer Online Age of Reckoning, it one of the suggested things was this. I never knew that there was another Warhammer MMO in the works. Actually, I take it back. Apparently, it was not an MMO. It was an online battle arena. So, I... Okay, I'm guessing they probably, like, cannibalized the code and stuff from Age of Reckoning and tried to reuse it for this? Huh. Interesting. I had absolutely no idea that, um... That was a thing. Uh... Oh, fuck. I, I'm literally tunneling into this mob, and I'm forgetting that it's immune. I also just whiffed my Comet Storm. It fucking ends me. Oh my god. Oh, I hope nobody in my guild is watching this. I One of them made fun of me. I, I mean, like, jokingly made fun of me for... I forget what class it was that I was playing. I think it was my Demo Warlock run, or my Destro Warlock run. And they were like, oh, I saw your Destro Warlock gameplay. And it's like, I, look... I'm learning these specs for the very first time in these leveling runs. You can't expect perfection. What does that even mean? Yeah, like, something like, I would imagine, Overwatch, League of Legends. Yeah. Um, Because, yeah, obviously that's what MOBA is, right? As Naomi pointed out. Um, Let's see. You would probably do the random zone leveling. Yeah, one thing that I've already decided upon when I make my uh, my like add-on. So I'm probably going to do all of this together because initially I was like unsure if I want to like release them separately. What I'm probably going to do is whenever I make the leveling add-on in conjunction with it, I'm going to make like this challenge run format. And I think I'm going to have like three modes. Um, there'll be like the, the speed run mode where like it tells you the correct like optimal path and you go through all the steps in order and then i'm gonna have like the the challenge mode and there'll be like a casual challenge mode i know that's like counterintuitive with just like the fun stuff and i'll i'll probably have like a little check mark thing where people can select what options they want to play around with so if you want to do like just a casual fun modifier run and like random zones or something you can check that off and then you do your leveling thing, and my add-on would assign you random zones, or you'd get to pick between it. Um, I'd probably have some settings page where you could, like, you know, tweak the options and be like, I want four options and whatever. That stuff would probably be preset in, like, the actual challenge run format. I would balance it and, like, see what I felt was, like, offer the proper difficulty. Uh, but if you're, like, doing a run just for fun, and you're not, like, actually doing it in my standardized challenge run format, then I would probably try to give you, like, as much control as possible over, like, what exactly you wanted to do, because, I mean, at the end of the day, that's you design games, right? You 
give people what they want, right? So especially if it was a mode like that, where the entire point is just like letting players go wild and have fun with whatever it is, just give them all the modifiers, right? Um, so I would probably have something like that. If you wanted the random talent feature too, I would probably have a way that you could do that. And then, you know, individual settings of that nature, people could apply to their run without it being like the full challenge run format. And then, as I said before, the actual challenge run format would be standardized, uh, you know, with all the features enabled at once. And, you know, we would have permadeath and permadeath, quote unquote, it would be like hardcore. I wouldn't like in encourage you to delete your character, but I would be like, you know, challenge failed and that you can continue on for fun for practice or something like that. Um, but I think the true challenge would be doing it without dying. And then you'd have all these modifiers. I've talked about some of the challenges that I think could be fun. Like, I think having the Fell Reaver is like a boss that you need to solo at level 30 or something could be pretty neat. Uh, things like that. It's still, of course, in the works. Oh, what the fuck? Uh, you can blink with the cage. Interesting. But yeah, I think that could be neat. But I would definitely, I've already decided I'm going to have that feature there. That way people who think it looks neat from like the random zone stuff can play around with that without feeling like they're forced to do this really difficult challenge. But the full challenge will still be there for people who are interested in that. Uh, where are they going? We can go down here. We can skip that up. All right, hold on. Let me focus a little bit just because the stupid darkness section, especially if I'm the orb user. Oh, we pulled extra. Uh, what? Oh, I got drop kicked. Fuck. I was in the middle of shifting power. Well, that sucks. There we go. Then where? Like, jump off the cliff. It's like running around only at the end. Jump down. Uh, here, I'm gonna... I hate that Comet Storm works like that. That is so toxic. Uh, why does it work? Like... There's absolutely no reason for it to just snapshot your location, or the location of the mob, and then drop there a few seconds later. That is really annoying. Also, I'm going to move over here and put my barrier up. That way, the Spirit of Vengeance should teleport. Any second now. Oh, it teleported over there, so it's close. And there it is. Let's finish this off. Uh, let's see. Dirthilian said, I assume you level all these tunes for more big love rocket chances. Uh, you might think. Uh, I can handle the orb here. Uh, I, I'm not a big mount collector. I have 437, which, like, in the grand scheme of things, for how long I've been playing and how actively I play this game, it's not a very big collection. I have a lot of friends who have, like, a ridiculous amount of mounts, and I am not among the, the collector group of my friends. But... I know that's the reason why a lot of people do it. I have fought too long, suffered too much. Victory must be mine. I love this boss, honestly. Like, Vault of the Wardens as a whole is kind of a shit dungeon. Kinda. 
I don't really love a lot of the other fights, but... Cordana is just such a banger dungeon boss. So much fun. I think there's another one last wall at the end, right? I'm just gonna throw it over there in advance. Yo. I'll queue again just on the off chance the tank requeues. Oh, if the tank wants to requeue. Oh, he left. Okay. Well, Aksara, if you wanna if you wanna group up now, just let me know. Ah. Uh, also, let me just clean up my bags real quick, because there's... Yeah. I figured it was you. Alright, cool. Just the, my Battle.net community. Accidentally clicked on that. I appreciate the help, by the way. It's, like, ridiculous how long the queue times for this shit is. Also, I got two whole levels from that dungeon, huh? <laughs> Saying that like it's a lot, but I guess considering how long I had to wait for it, eh, decent. Just did not expect it. Honestly, if it wasn't for, like, how good your groups need to be to, like, consistently get fast time-walking dungeons, they may be okay. But overall, I don't think they're worth it for leveling. I have a bad one. Yeah, I don't really use it, though. Um, so I made this, like, back in the early, early days of my channel because, like, some people specifically asked for it. Because, like, I don't know, people who don't use Discord, right? But I'm going to be honest, like, I, I almost never... Res like, I, I will respond here if somebody directly asked me a question. Like, here's somebody said... Um, I'm glad the dollar on Hearthstone it doesn't need to be unlocked anymore. And all I said is, you still need to unlock the dollar on Hearthstone. So if somebody directly says things like, you know, that I, I can help them with, I'll say that. But I don't really actively talk in there. Like, it, my Discord is pretty much the main thing that I use for updates, communication, anything like that. Uh, do I have a video that shows my add-ons? No, because I don't really use add-ons. Um, I mean, I can literally show you my add-ons. It's pretty minimal. I'm definitely on the more minimalistic side when it comes to add-ons that I use. Let me just hop on the boat here. Um, I have DBM. I have uh, Lee Cora Sound Pack by Kasesi. Uh Fun fact, Kasesi, I actually did raid testing with him a few weeks ago. He happened to join my group on the PTR. Cool dude. Uh, abandoned Zone Quest for leveling... Uh, big wigs. Uh, I'll only use one of these. Obviously, I have both of them installed. Generally, these days, I only use big wigs, but I used to use DBM. Um, yeah, because Naomi, they're automatically enabled on new characters, right? But on my actual characters, I disable DBM currently. Uh, by the way, quests, I don't really use this. It shows you where quests are on your map, some of them that aren't unmarked. Um, cinematic canceller is nice. All it does is, I mean, literally as the name implies, it immediately cancels any cinematic that pops up. It's nice for speed leveling, pointless for other stuff. Details is the damage meter. Uh, extra quest button. Sometimes it pops up like a little extra button if it's not by default. Uh, GTFO is if you ever hear me standing in fire and there's the thing that goes, bah, 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 that's GTFO. Uh, handy notes is decently useful for like treasure hunting and stuff. Uh, I have my JoJo soundboard for Windwalker Monk. Leatrix Plus, that's a big one. Wait, my game crashed, I think. Uh-oh. Uh Uh-oh, what is happening? My entire computer is going haywire. What the fuck just happened? Uh, my entire screen went black. Okay, we're back. Um... Uh, did that affect the stream at all? That was really weird. I have no idea what just happened there. My entire screen just went black. Not even just wow. Uh, okay. Yeah, Little Wigs, this is for dungeons. 
Uh, Mogit is just transmog. Method raid tools is good for raiding. I think somebody told me to download this. I haven't even looked into it, so I honestly I have no idea what this does. Uh, Mythic Dungeon Tools is good for M+. Postal is some minor male quality of life stuff. Raider IO straightforward. Uh, I don't really use Silver Dragon anymore. You can if you want stuff that uh, shows you where rare mobs are. Simulation Craft. This just gives you the import string for your character's sims. Uh, speedy Auto Loot is nice. Just very, very minor quality of life. Weak Auras, obviously. And then I have Zareth Mortis Puzzle Helper. <laughs> Still, uh, yeah, Zareth Mortis Puzzle Helper, obviously not doing a whole lot these days, but back in the day, a really nice quality of life right there. Stream acted normal, you never cut out. Right now, YouTube is giving me an error that says, Error, YouTube is not receiving enough video to maintain smooth streaming. As such, viewers will receive buffering. So, I don't know if YouTube's gaslighting me. I hope it's not gonna have any problems on your end because i'm seeing nothing on my obs but youtube's giving me an error whatever that's just youtube being youtube <sighs> but yeah those are all my add-ons pretty much that's like everything and a lot of those are like really not important also we can just pull this boss right this doesn't matter you buffered for about two seconds well can youtube like turn this shit off Ugh. it's still there the little error message I don't really know how to disable this, but it's definitely very annoying. There we go. Castlet by Skynet, yeah. Your graphics card or graphics driver likely crashed and recovered. Huh. Interesting. I have no idea what that, like, entails, but that's interesting. I had no idea that, uh, that can happen. Uh, let's see. My slot is the thing that lets you transfer your profile. Yeah, I think, I forget exactly why I d downloaded it. Somebody recommended it in the comments for sure. That, uh, uh, how did that get onto my bars? <laughs> I think I oh, I must have leveled up, and it dropped Time Warp onto 7, and then I just, when I went to press blink, fat-fingered Time Warp. Um, oops. Yeah, I think somebody suggested it in a comment, and I downloaded it, and then, like, never got around to actually trying it out, so. Oopsie. Yeah, you don't really need to worry about the beacons on, like, regular difficulty. Yeah. I forget it because I installed it a while ago. It was before I was like doing the streams, so I've had it for a while. Um, I want to say it was during my old 10 to 70 world record, the Dark Iron Dwarf Windwalker Monk one. I think that was when somebody suggested it for the first time, and I like looked into it and installed it and then just never got around to it. But yeah, I can see why that would be helpful. One of these days, I'll have to look into it. It's not that I think people are, like, wrong for suggesting it. I It's just I only have so much time and I always forget. Uh... Oh, yeah, no, people have suggested it multiple times. So you probably correct, Naomi, that somebody suggested it during the stream. That would not surprise me at all. Let me hide from here. Um, let's see. You're on your iPhone and everything is smooth as butter. Nice. Let me scroll up a little bit. Missed a few things. Rather than trolling, not doing slow fall skip. What's the slow fall skip? Oh, and vault to the... Oh, you can do that. Yeah. Fuck, I didn't even think of that. Well, hindsight's twenty twenty. <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, fuck. Um, that's bad. I'm just gonna ice block that. That's spooky.
Bingo, it's still in the works free space. God. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, something cool for that challenge mode would be a function to disable equipping gear from bags. In every level, it gives you two pieces of gear that are in your bags that are an item level upgrade to choose from. Huh. That's an interesting idea. Um... I think... I wouldn't want that to be part of the basic rule set. I think stuff like that is... I like the idea of things like that as like a kiss curse like relic option. So if we're, we're talking like Slay the Spire-esque relics. Something that um, like as an example, I, I talked about this when I first discussed the potential for the challenge run format. An idea that I had would be things like you're not allowed to spend talent points for the next 10 levels because so an entire idea of this you, is you would have randomly selected talents. Um, kind of. You would have options. So you'd be able to pick between two random options. So like, let's say right now uh, for my spec tree. I have one, two, three, four, five different talents that I could theoretically pick. Uh, but when I go to spend my talent point, my add-on would only give me two of those options to pick from. And I would have to spend it on one of those two notes. Uh, basically, to limit your choices, you have to like be strategic about which talents you select. And there's also some like you know stuff that you could play around in terms of that where... A lot of times it's nice to get like one point here, but like, for instance, if I really wanted to make sure that well, what's like a good example, uh, let's say here, let's look at the mage tree, right? So let's say I really, really wanted to make sure that I got comet storm. Comet storm is really fucking broken. I mean, it, it's good, but I'm just like talking hypothetically. Comet Storm is so broken, I want to make sure that I have it no matter what. And I want to ensure that, like, eventually I'll be offered it by the game. There's some, like, strategy that you'd be able to do with random talent options where I could, like, not actually take Fingers of Frost or Shatter early on. And I could only go down the left side of the tree. That way, like, if I take, or at least if I take Shatter, right, this opens up these two talents as options. And it effectively dilutes the pool. So if I only go down the left side of the tree, and I, like, even if, um, let's say, uh, there we go. Let's say I don't really want to take Brain Freeze. Brain Freeze isn't bad, but, um, in fact, I'm actually going to pick it here. Uh, here I'm going to take Splitting Ice and Energize Barriers and there. Uh, but let's say I, I didn't really want to take Brain Freeze, just hypothetically, but I wanted to make sure I had Comet Storm. But if, you know, I wanted to... I'm 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 actually trolling. I thought I was running in the doorway, apparently not. But if I really wanted to make sure I got Comet Storm, I could only pick talents that are on the left side, so that eventually my options would be so limited in, um, like, what the game could potentially give me that Comet Storm's chances of being offered to me would increase dramatically. So there's like some strategy there, but something that I thought of would be like a Kiss Curse effect where you don't spend any talent points for 10 levels, but then you get to like handpick the exact 10 talents that you want after reaching 10 levels. Also, Mail, Pouch, Long Sleeves, Cape. I'm going to guess this one. Ha ha ha. I was technically missing one of the clues, but... It, it matched most of it. I think, what could it have failed? Uh, it would be the vest color, right? So... What color vest would this even be? This is kind of both a dark and a light vest. So it wouldn't really be a good clue if it did give it to me. Um... Yeah, I don't know what the fifth clue would have been. Either way. Uh, have I played Arcane uh, for Mage? Uh, yeah, I've done Arcane a bunch. This is 
This is actually the last, or the second to last of like the voted leveling speed runs. Oh. So after this, uh, we're almost done with all of the leveling speed runs in general. Uh, of course, I'll do more later on, but the format that I would do going forward, it wouldn't be like these testing every spec runs. It would be something kind of like what I'm describing with like, you know, challenge run formats for leveling runs, which is why I think that would be a way to spice it up going forward. This has been interesting because a lot of these specs I haven't played before, but obviously once we've tested every spec, there really won't be a need to do that. Um, but yeah, so I've already done both Fire and Arcane. I've done Arcane many times because Arcane is very, very good. Also, I think I only need one more Time Walking Dungeon after this. I get hit by that. <laughs> Man, where's the fucking jeweled signet of Landris the other 500 times I farmed it in season one? I can't believe I just naturally ripped a socketed jeweled signet of Landris in a fucking time walking dungeon. That would be my luck. Is Handy Notes making the clues show up in your screen right there? No, that is Little Wigs. Uh, that is, that's this. So the Legion one is what's doing that. You got four of them in vault across your tanks? Jesus. Yeah, I mean, I did manage, I got, my Demon Hunter has a socketed avoidance 421 jeweled signet of Melandris. That one was fucking juicy, <laughs> but, um... I, yeah, I also never managed to get Windscar Whetstone. At least not at 421. I got a a 415 Windscar Whetstone on all my tanks, obviously, but anything higher than that didn't manage. Oh, yeah, strategic level up. Just... Fucking one shot half those mobs. Nice. Oh yeah, I have skull vault. Look, Naomi, I respect you for going for that. I didn't even bother. I literally just never even tried to go for I have skull vault on my brewmaster. I just said fuck that, and it was good for me too. But I could not be fucking bothered. I was also just kind of I'm like I was burnt out on the game or just brewmaster at that time. Because, like, that was around the time when, you know, I, I wasn't really actively talking about that, but, uh, you know, the officers in OE at the time were just giving me no end of grief, and I was just kind of miserable playing um, playing Brewmaster because of a lot of that shit. And, like, I, I was in effectively parse jail for most of all to the Incarnates because despite the raid leader, I, I'm so, I'm fucking, I pulled that. I'm so sorry, Oxara. I just tab targeted and pulled a hunter and just I uh, I slanced a random pack in there. A blizzard here. Oh, fuck. All right. At least it ended well. I can't believe I did that. Dishonor on you, yeah. Um. But yeah, the, the raid leader in OE was just, like, he refused to run Incarnate Icon and made me do it, even though it was terrible for Brewmaster. So I basically had no chance of ever getting any good parses whatsoever. Uh, you can skip Dragon, yeah. On Time Walking, you can skip it. But because of that, I had no real incentive to go for Ice Cobalt. You had your druid friend spec as Boomy for every single run. Ended up getting from getting it from some random evoker. Oh, nice. Yeah, that was kind of one of the other problems, like the fact that I would have had to actually have people help me farm it, and uh, he also needed it. My raid leader at the time for blood decay, and anytime anybody got a halls of valor key, he claimed it, 
and told them that they had to run with him so that he could get a chance at their Eye of Scovault. So I effectively was given no opportunity to even farm for it unless I wanted to try and, like, form pugs or something. I was not having a lot of fun <laughs> at that point in time in the game. You, you, let, let's just say that. Uh, but it's better now, and that's kind of what matters, right? And I mean, you know, that guy's guild fell apart, partially because he was fucking terrible at raid leading, so rip bozo. You whispered the guy in, like, within 0.1 seconds of him looting, and he's like, huh, it seems pretty good. Oh, he trolled you too, oh man. That's nice that he did actually trade it, though. Are Time Walking Dungeons good XP per hour? Um, they're not bad, but uh, there are better ways to level. If you're, like, really trying to optimize it. Uh, the main problem with Time Walking right now is if you're not a tank or a healer, good fucking luck farming this efficiently. And one of the bigger issues with that is, like, Time Walking Dungeons, like, spamming it as a DPS wouldn't be terrible if you could queue for it and do other shit while leveling. Um, specifically in Chromie time at low levels. The problem is right now, it is apparently still bugged where uh, you can't enter it in Chromie time, according to a few people. So until that bug is fixed, it really is not a viable leveling method for Chromie time. Uh, spamming it, that is. But you, of course, still want to do it to get the buff. So you get this up to 30%. Obviously, the tooltip is broken because, you know, Blizzard has no quality current control, so... Whatever. Um, but you you get this up to four stacks, and then you go do other stuff. I have a video on my channel, if you check like within the past two weeks, that explains it. It's four minutes long. It basically just gives the TLDR of what I said with more specific examples and leveling breakpoints and blah, 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 blah. Um, but that's the gist of it. It told me you need to be level 73 to join a heroic dungeon. <laughs> I see. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I don't know. I wish they'd fix that, but, you know, Blizzard has left so many random bugs in their game. I'm just not even surprised anymore. The amount of garbage that just has gone unfixed for such a long time now is... I don't know. That's what it is. No problem? <laughs> Gotta wait for the next X-Pack, yeah. Uh, Sonic Boom said, I'm curious, are you the WoW speedrun guy, or do you have a rival going for your spot? Because from what I can tell, it looks like nobody else is even trying compared to your efficiency. Um, yes and no. So, I would say right now, yeah, kind of. Um, in terms of, like, nobody else is even trying. Um, it used to be more popular. And, or, or rather, I wouldn't say it used to be more popular, because, like, speed leveling is still popular, right? Obviously, my guides still get good views. Uh, but competition in terms of speed runs has definitely fallen off. Um, there, I mean, there are people attempting runs, right? But I don't think a lot of people have, like, seriously tried to do, like, the, the at least the same level of effort that I put into my runs, to my knowledge... Nobody is currently doing that. Um, in the past, there have been. Quite honestly, I, I don't really want to name names. People who've been around the scene for long enough probably know. Um, there's one in particular who uh, was, like, very big back in the day. And unfortunately, partially why I don't want to name names, um, not their biggest fan in terms of... Uh, when I first started getting into the scene, they... Um, they actually kind of did some pretty shitty stuff and uh, bullied me a bit, uh, which quite honestly made me fairly jaded as far as like other um, like YouTubers are concerned. Because that like that was right after I started making YouTube videos, and that basically taught me very early on that everybody is just out for themselves, and you know nobody's actually trying to be your friend, at least in the context of YouTube, right? And I have been pretty. Like, I've kept to myself, really, for, like, the three or so years since I've been making YouTube videos after those early experiences. Um, 
now obviously that guy uh who i effectively replaced as far as like speedrunning stuff goes as far as i know he doesn't really play the game anymore um so a lot of the people that used to be uh like really into it uh and as like naomi said it's mostly like solo speed leveling um yeah there's there used to be some more people into it they've kind of all fallen off um but i mean i had some decent competition for a while there in shadowlands but yeah it hasn't really been any for a while uh well that is my last dungeon for the buff uh thank you very much oxara luna i appreciate the tank cues and i will go back to doing quests now now that I have uh, this thing. But I appreciate the help. That definitely made that a lot easier. Yeah, the level 45 requirement for Legion stuff is super lame. That definitely makes them a bit weaker. I would honestly... I, I, like, it's technically worth it, but it's... Like, it wouldn't have been faster overall for... Um, leveling up to 55 as i did here uh oh that's actually quite good getting a boe trinket is hard to find uh that's also a level 41 boe i can use that for future runs it doesn't have a socket or anything but it's like not terrible i guess if you want to farm um lots of appearances i don't have if you want to farm BOEs for speedrun prep, it looks like Legion Dungeons are the place to be. It's good to know. Rip Toxic Guy, Harlton stays winning. Yeah. And, yeah. And I, I'm not going to, like, go into it because, like, I, I'm i fairly certain he had some, like, IRL stuff going on. But I definitely did not appreciate the way that he acted and... I made that very clear at the time. Trust me. I, I do not mince words when somebody pisses me off like that. Um, but, you know, even though I, I was 1000% in the right in like that, all those situations, it still left a really bad taste on my mouth. Um, but yeah. Hello. Uh, okay. Thanks for the dungeons. Glad you could be of help. Yeah. It was fun. Uh, let's see. With the Halloween event coming this week, how many times a day can one character try for the Headless Horseman mount? I believe it's just once a day, right? Could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure that's a daily thing. Now you gotta research to see who it was. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm not gonna say it on stream, but... It's, uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe if you, like, search it in my Discord. I'm pretty sure, I think I talked about it at the time, because, like, I'm generally on my Discord, I'm, like, a little bit more, like, I, I don't know how to put it. Like, I, I'm pretty open on streams as well, but it's, like, I don't like to, what the fuck? Oh. I'm not in Chromie time. <laughs> <laughs> that explains that. Uh, I was like, how the hell did I just one-shot that mob? Okay. Um, well, that means I... You have somebody in mind, so it makes you wonder. Ah, gotcha. Yeah. Um, I mean, if you search their name in my Discord, maybe it'll pop up. Um, Alright, okay, wait. I need to... I need to enable Chromie time, and then I guess I'm doing WAD for the last few levels. Um, yeah, well, no, it, it's... I manually disabled Chromie time. It, I did it on purpose. I just forgot that I manually disabled Chromie time, and I forgot to re-enable it. That's just 100% on me. I just completely didn't even think of that. So, whoops. I'll just go turn that on real quick. There's people who have to do it for boosting. Yeah, I mean, boosting is definitely a different story, though, for as far as speedrunning goes. Um, yeah. 
I guess what I was saying more with Discord is I'm I'm more okay with being open with like names and stuff because like I'm not like if somebody does something shitty, right? Uh I will definitely talk about it like once. Like I, I've said before, um what's his name? Ethan Hart is a rat. Like it, particularly when people are particularly shitty. Ethan Hart's a rat. He literally stole my fucking video. Or stole parts of my video and ripped it off without credit like fuck that guy um but in this particular case like i said while it was something that i like i said i didn't appreciate it at the very least was how do i put this i don't think he did it like it was malicious for sure so i, I was about to say i don't think he did it maliciously yeah, it was kind of maliciously, but I think it was probably one of those like lapses of judgment, like jealousy type things, because I have a feeling that he, you know, he was used to being the main person who did speedrunning stuff. And then, you know, here comes this guy out of nowhere who is suddenly, despite being brand new to speedrunning and you know, or wow speedrunning and, and technically I had done it in my own free time, but I was posting my runs now. So at the time, I was brand new to doing recorded speedruns and making videos in general, and suddenly I was completely eclipsing him in, like, the span of a month, and I think that whole all boiled into, like, this big concoction of, like, jealousy, and he, you know, did something stupid, was really mean to me, and tried to fuck me over, and I, I would hope that he regrets it now, not from, like, a, a perspective of, like, ah, ha, ha, I hope he learned his lesson not to mess with me, no, nothing like that. I hope he realized that what he did was shitty, and he realizes that, you know, you know, he, he honestly, he burned a bridge, right? Like, I, I'm generally speaking, I try to be nice and understanding and whatnot, and reasonable, and like I was, I was nice to him early on because I thought he was trying to be nice to me. Like, oh hey, you know, there are new people getting into WoW speedrunning, cool. And I thought that was like the whole idea. And then I realized it was very much not that, right? Um, and like I, I was more than willing to be nice to him until he, you know, turned around. But uh, who knows? It's it's been a few years, right? Hope he learns from it and becomes a better person. Yeah, exactly that words I was looking for. Thank you, Naomi. But yeah, I, I don't... I keep wanting to say I don't hold ill will against him. I do hold ill will against him. But, like, I, I don't have absolutely despise the guy. I was pretty mad about it at the time, and it, like I said, it definitely left me pretty jaded, and I still do hold a little bit of resentment for that. But it's one of those things where, like, let's say he were to message me today, and he were to say, hey, I'm really sorry about, you know what I did back in, like, 2020, um, you know, blah, 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 blah. Like, it, it is not beyond forgiveness. I'd probably be like, you know, yeah, it really bothered me at the time, but whatever. I haven't talked to him for the record. I'm just saying purely hypothetically. Um, whereas there are definitely people and there are definitely things that, like, I will just not forgive, where I'm just like, you know, no, you're an asshole, fuck you. Um, but that was one of those where, like, I, I could totally understand it and stuff. Um, Justin Kashan said, I can't believe I caught your live stream. Awesome. I'm glad you were able to make it here. Uh, what's my favorite Chromie Time expansion? Personally, you hate doing Legion dungeons because they're boring to slog through. BC, on the other hand, very relaxing. Well, are we talking dungeons or quests? Because obviously, if it's dungeons, then yeah. It's TBC and Wrath. Because they're, you know, pretty chill, as you pointed out. Uh, if it's quests, then definitely uh, Cata Revamp Zones. A lot of my favorite zones are Cat of Revamp zones. So I really enjoy them. Uh, there we go. Let me round up two of these mobs. Chuck the little explosive thing down. And there we go. Now we head up to Gorgrons. Uh, you know what? I'm gonna queue for mop dungeons. Why not? I almost never do mop dungeons, so it'll be a good way to see generally how efficient a lot of them are. 
It's such a weird thing to do considering, as far as I can tell, every single game speedrun community is a super collaborative pursuit full of tips and strategy sharing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, it happens in a lot of other communities, too. So, like, on one hand, you're not wrong, but also it's... Uh, it's still disheartening. I think, like, I can... So, how do I put this? I can understand somebody being very competitive and and stuff like that. And I'll be completely honest. I am also fairly competitive. I, I am a competitive person by nature. Um, I had surprised I had a water elemental following me. Uh, so obviously I like to... Um, like, I like to lower my time and stuff like that. Um, I like to have the, the fastest speed run, for sure. Like, I, I'm not going to say, like, oh, I do this entirely to make the guides. Now, making the guides is definitely my number one priority. And it's why a lot of times, like, there are lines that I'm not willing to cross to, like, save time. Because if I think something is unfair and, you know, isn't really, like usable by most people then i won't use that for leveling runs because at that point i'm like well it's not realistic so i've always said like the way i do my speed runs is you know i i try to make them realistic but that said of course i am still competitive in terms of like you know trying to get my runs and make sure that i'm faster than other people for sure um and i think like a friendly competition is more than fine there's a lot of people who uh, like, you know, try to compare their runs to mine. They're like, oh, I managed to get, like, close to Harlden's time. I think, I like, whenever somebody says, oh, I got, like, I shaved my time, I'm, like, close to your run, I'm like, cool. Yeah, that's great. Um, there's, there are some people who are a little bit weird about it, and uh, I think anybody who has been in my Discord in the, like, recent months uh, probably knows exactly what I'm talking about. There was... A particular instance a few weeks ago where somebody uh I, I'm not I'm not gonna go into hyper detail because I also don't really want to like start shit over that. It was just kind of a, a weird incident. But somebody basically was a little bit weird about like being competitive with my times or something like that. And I I basically said something to the effect of like, I'm glad that you got a good speed run, but like you know, it, it's one thing to be happy that you got, like, a good time, and another to try and, like, make some weird comparison as to, like, how you technically beat one of my times um, for, like, a specific class. And I, I'm, like, I, I'm happy for you, uh, but, you know, continually making it this weird, like, dick measuring contest, it it's just, it comes off weird, right? At that point, you're just clearly trying to, like, brag and say ah i'm better than you because xyz and that's just odd right um so rare that doesn't happen very often in fact it was a bit of a weird case in particular um but like i said i i won't really go into extreme detail it's just kind of a, an odd situation um there's also some other unrelated stuff that people messaged me uh on discord about that which like provided some extra context uh for what was happening but, uh, let's see, I can take a temporal warp. Um, but yeah, I think, uh, so all that to say, the thing that I didn't like in that situation, more than anything, obviously the general behavior was not great, is if you establish early on that like, hey, I'm very competitive, I... Um, like, I, I want to have the fastest speed run, and that is, like, my number one goal. Okay, I get that. I can understand. And then, you know, it kind of helps me understand how to, like, approach that conversation or conversations of that nature going forward. But what I don't like is when somebody tries to, like, pretend to be something they're not. Um, one of the things that I absolutely despise, that it, this is somewhat unrelated because it just applies to literally everything. One of my biggest pet peeves is uh, like false and toxic posit positivity. Um, now I kind of want to do mob dungeons, so I'm going to specifically queue for this. Like people who 
pretend to be like one of those super happy go lucky friendly people who like you know nothing bothers them right and in reality they're like really fucking toxic and they get like really mad and like i i consider myself toxic to a degree i'd like to think i'm fun toxic but i also don't make any like you know, I, I don't try to pretend that I'm something I'm not. I You don't see me here on stream being like, you know, oh, yay, I, I love Blizzard and, you know, nothing ever can make me angry. No, I, I get very tilted a lot and I'm open about that and I don't try to pretend that I'm like, you know, some beacon of positivity, right? I'd like to think there's a difference between being, you know, like generally a negative complaining, you know, uh, often and like an asshole. I like to think that I'm not, like, an asshole, but I do complain a lot. I'm not, like, the most positive person on the planet. I'm very, like, critical of things that bug me. Um, and I'm not afraid to talk about that. And I don't try to act like, you know, this is a positivity-only zone and stuff like that. Um, and, and, like, another thing is when, like, people message me, right? Um, obviously, I'm not rude to people who message me. But I also don't, like, a lot of people have this very formal way of speaking of, like, um, you know, when you, like, message them on, like, you know, social media or, like, DMs or something like that. They're very, like, formal and they, they want to sound, like, very official and stuff like that. Um, like, I, and this is one of the, the other things where I, I love, I, I absolutely adore when one of those, like, unaware, you know social media company managers messages me on discord to ask me about some fucking brand deal with their crypto bro sponsorship and they're like do you have a business email that i could speak to you to and i'm like no if you have anything to say to me say it here on discord like you know if, if you want to talk to me you're talking to me you're not sending me some official business email proposal and of course i know because they're always going to have some bullshit fucking crypto project that they want me to promote and then i can tell them that crypto's fucking garbage get the fuck away from here so i love that aside aside from people trying to you know ask me if i want to promote their fucking crypto project um generally speaking i like to be you know friendly to people in dms but i'm not like fake there's a difference between being friendly and being fake and all of that to say, the person in question, the thing that really bugged me about them, is they were fake. They were a very, very fake, like, outwardly presenting person, um, where they have this attitude of, you know, positive vibes and, you know, this is, this is a, like, their, their stream was like a very friendly stream, um, and, you know, and and blah 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 and they they tried to be nice to me and act like they were being encouraging and then of course like the moment i did something that they didn't like which for context to give you an idea of like this wasn't like the full the full like backstory but the thing that set them off and caused them to completely like do the two-face thing and like be a dick to me at the time is i made my original all speedrunning consumable guide uh that i had up for years i recently obviously remade that video um like a few weeks ago actually about a month ago at this point um but the original incarnation of that guide i talked about the cracked radnax control gem and for whatever reason they believed that they like owned the information i i i, I don't know like owns is maybe a bad word to say it but their their claim was that they were the ones who taught me about the Cracked Radnex Control Gem. And because I talked about it in my leveling consumable video without crediting them, I was plagiarizing them and stealing their content, and they were going to report me to YouTube. And, and that was, like, what started it all. And then, it like, it spiraled off that, but that was, like, the moment where they went from being, like false pos positivity friendly to me to complete 180 fuck you you stole my content blah 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 and i'm like okay what the fuck hold the phone here like first off no uh about the whole like you stole uh my the information for me like i have been using cracked randex control gems since before they were mainstream all right back in legion i literally i i had Stacks of Cracked Randex Control Gems in my bailbox, like 20 of them, because the thing is, back then, when Argus was current content, 
and nobody knew how good those things were for leveling. Hell, I didn't even know at the time that they had use cases for leveling. It wasn't even something that crossed my mind. I just, my my brain was like, haha, Legion surfboard go burr. And I bought the entire auction house supply of cracked Ranex control gems off Zul'jin. I had literally like 20 or 30 of them sitting in my mailbox and I just used them to go everywhere like 99% of the time and they worked in raids sometimes for like a bit of a point in time so in like raid during breaks i would just hop on my cracked rat next control gem and just do little loops around the area and then my guildies would be like what the fuck are you doing like what is that because nobody knew what it was it was some random rare mob drop that at this point had just been added and it was really fun getting to like you know do little cool obstacle parkour courses on my little cracked rat next control gem it was fun i always wanted it as like an actual amount so then, of course, when I started speed leveling, I immediately saw the potential of this. But I think, like, I had been, like, talking to them, because at, at the time, like, they were streaming, and I was talking to them in their stream about this. I had already been doing my speedruns, right? So it was like a back-and-forth discussion about, you know, some potential leveling consumables and, you know, places where we could use Cracked Rat next Gamut. And I thought it was just a friendly, like, strats-sharing discussion. Like people said earlier, the entire point of, you know, speedrun stuff is, you know, sharing ideas and whatnot. And, like, in my Discord, that happens a lot. And honestly, I, I love when people make uh, suggestions in my Discord, at least well-thought-out suggestions. A lot of times people have, like, have you tried spamming time-walking dungeons? Like, Yes. Um, but a lot of times people make great suggestions. Naomi is a great example of someone who made a good suggestion. Naomi is the one who suggested doing the profession stuff while the RP was going on in Waking Shores. I had never thought of that before. But honestly, now that like I think about it, it's a no-brainer. It's a really good place to do the profession stuff. It saves a ton of time. But honestly, I probably wouldn't have thought of that. So suggestions like that are great. It like it helps everybody save time because then I could be like, oh, this is great. I can integrate it into the route. I can use it in future routes. And then the guide will end up being updated for stuff like that. So all let's say that's entirely what I thought was going on at that point in time when I first was making videos and I was like talking about use cases for the Cracked Rat Next Gem and stuff. And then as I said before, they acted like I first found out about it from them and that I stole the information from them. That was like where I'm like, okay, First off, no, I did not find out about it from you, so, you know, you have no claim to that. But also, you can't claim that, like, you own information about a fucking item in World of Warcraft. That's insane. Like, the fact that I made a guide on leveling items, and it's like, imagine the amount of times, right, like, where people literally just copy-paste my guide into, like, a video or something. Uh, like, if I did the same comparison, and I'm like, I... I, like, own the rights to a leveling route that includes Silver Pine and Hillsgrad. Like, obviously that's bullshit. And sure, we can sit here and say, did I popularize this leveling route? Is that, like, the main focus of my guide? Obviously, yeah. So, will, is it safe to say that 99% of the copycat guides that came out in Shadowlands saying to do Silver Pine, Hillsgrad, Lachmodon, etc. were just ripping off my guide, which came first? Yeah. But am I going to go out there and be like, you stole from me, blah, blah, blah. No, it, it's just, it is what it is. I discovered that information. I made it well known. Other people are going to make guides and include that information in their guides. That's just life, right? Um, I, I've always said, I trust that people are going to continue to use my guides, not because I have some super secret information that I don't share with people, but because I think the research and the presentation of my guides is what elevates it beyond the other ones. So... I think that is really what matters there. Um, but all that to say, yeah, I basically, I told the dude, fuck off, right? It, it sucked because I thought he was actually trying to be nice to me at first. But the moment that happened, I'm like, fuck right off. Like, if you want to try and copyright strike my video because I used information that, like, you think I stole from you, go the fuck ahead. Good luck with that one. Um, that yeah, pissed me off. And like I said, uh, so just to circle back to what I said before, obviously, I think we can all agree it's ridiculously stupid what he did. Like, that is really not even a question. But I don't think he did it. At least I hope he didn't do it completely maliciously. I think it is one of those things where I can kind of understand if you've been uh, doing something for years 
and somebody comes along and out of nowhere gets infinitely more success with it than you were, yeah, that's going to kind of stick. I get that. And, you know, jealousy's a bitch. It's obviously, ideally, nobody's jealous, and, you know, we just keep that to ourselves and don't let that influence our decisions negatively, but it, it happens, right? Um, you know, part of me hoped that he would have apologized for it. He never did, which, oh well, what can you do? Um, but, like I said, I, I hope that he has realized years from now how stupid that whole thing was and maybe feels at least a little bit bad about it, but we'll never know. Um, but yeah, that whole situation left me a little bit jaded. Uh, in case that isn't obvious, and I, I would hope it's not really surprising, because I think a lot of people would probably have a similar reaction. Toxic speedrunner was the friends we made along the way, yeah. Uh, okay, I, I talked for a lot there, so let me just scroll up a little bit and read the stuff I missed. Uh, let's see... Uh, you prefer Legion Dungeons? You know it's not as efficient, but you prefer them overall? I mean, I really enjoy Legion Dungeons. Um, you're not wrong. I think it depends. There's, like, a difference between dungeons that I want to do when I'm, like, in the mood to just casually level for fun, and dungeons that I want to do when I'm trying to do, like, super serious, uh, like, actual dungeons. I, like, I like Legion Dungeons is what I'm trying to say. I have fun running them in, like, a Mythic Plus format. For leveling, sometimes they're just a little bit too involved when you're just trying to, like, you know, head off and, uh, like, blast through some stuff. Uh, let's see. I think the main issue is that on WoW speedruns, people try to monetize it so they get bitter when somebody new enters the picture. Well, yeah, that is... That's unfortunately, but definitely true. Um, I... Actually, I didn't run into that issue quite as much with retail stuff, because retail leveling guides were not quite as prevalent. Um, I'm curious what happens when I start doing classic speedruns, because... As I've already said, there there are already certain Voldemort add-ons that reached out to me to try and get me to collaborate with them, and I told them to fuck off. Um, actually, did I mention that? I'm pretty sure I mentioned that. That was a little while ago. It was um, before Dragonflight came out. But they wanted me to do that for retail, and I told them, fuck off, I do not respect you. Uh, but, you know, a lot of those Voldemort add-ons, their main... Um, uh, Justin, I, I'm pretty sure I already answered that question earlier. I don't know if somebody completely different asked that, but er, like literally just 30 minutes ago, somebody asked me, uh, oh yeah, actually it was a completely different person who asked almost exactly the same question. Funny. Um, if you go back to, uh, if you scroll back right as I started Court of Stars, uh, somebody asked that exact same question that you just asked, Justin. And I answered it, and I showed all my add-ons. So if you go back there, you'll be able to find the answer to your question. But since I literally just talked about it, I'm not going to, like, repeat it again. But, you know, just scroll back in the VOD. That's one of the nice things about YouTube streaming, though. It's, uh, you can very easily scroll back. Um, but yeah, anyways, I am curious to see what'll happen when I start getting into classic speedrunning. Because they... Thankfully, a lot of the Voldemort add-ons have not managed to really find a solid foothold in Retail WoW, but Classic WoW is where they thrive, and when I start taking their income there, uh, I think they're going to be very salty, because they rely on getting people to buy overpriced guides, and if a perfectly good free alternative comes along, they're going to be fucking screwed. So, that's something that I'm looking forward to doing. One of these days, when I have time. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have a lot of time to do that right now, but for Cataclysm at least, yeah, get the fuck out of there. That's going to be my turf, for sure. Um, but yeah, those those Voldemort add-ons aside, uh, it, it definitely wasn't nearly as prevalent a few years ago. You had Zygor and some of the other ones, but I don't think it was on the level that we have it now. Um... 
honestly, even back then, rested XP was or not rested XP. Fuck. Uh, Azeroth autopilot. Rested XP is garbage, but um, they weren't the ones I was thinking of. Azeroth autopilot was the main add-on that a lot of people use like years ago in retail, and um, that one was free, so I never had any issue with Azeroth autopilot. And honestly, like, for the time when Azeroth Autopilot was in its heyday, it was actually fairly well maintained. It was only the start of Shadowlands where they just kind of abandoned it. And, um, I at least, I, so I will say, I have respect for the people who, some, well, some respect, like, to a degree. The people who do Azeroth Autopilot Reloaded, I get that they have good intentions with it. They also did ask me if I wanted to, like, collaborate on shit. Um, I said no to that one as well, but I didn't tell them to fuck off. Uh, I basically said, hey, look, I'm glad your add-on's free. And I, I said something to the extent of, like, if you want to make a route in your add-on that features, like, the zones in my guide, like, I can't do anything to stop you, right? Like, do what you want to do. Um, but I'm not going to, like, have a hand in that. I'd rather do it myself. Um, but... I'm like, hey, look, as long as your add-on is free, I don't have any problem with it existing. Um, so I, I did not, like... I, I did not tell them to fuck off. But, yeah, definitely the um, the Voldemort ones. I, uh, yeah, was not super thrilled to get that message. Uh, let's see. It's in it, yeah, it's a, a bad add-on. Uxara. Um... That's honestly one of the things I hate anymore. I can't even talk about the WoW mechanic without having to say their shitty add-on's name. It's annoying. Uh, let's see. Uh, oh yeah, all that to say though, Chori, I actually ran into that problem a lot when uh, I made my Covenant spreadsheet, more than anything else that I've encountered. Uh, which, ironically, was a little bit of a weird introduction to, like, the WoW community, or the wider WoW community at large. Because, obviously, I've been playing this game for years. The first time when I've, like, really... What the fuck? I somehow didn't pick up the other quest? Okay. Uh, the first time I ever really interacted with, like, a lot of figures in the WoW community was when I was making my Covenant spreadsheet back in the Shadowlands pre-patch. And I ran into that issue a lot of people uh, basically actively not only refusing to help me, but like kind of shitting on my spreadsheet, which was literally just a free resource that I was making to help people. So it's the classic case of just counterintuitive. Um, well, you would think counterintuitive, right? Obviously, I was making it completely for free to give people a you know resource to inform their decisions on covenants. But because that was... Uh, in many cases, information that a lot of those people were relying on to, like, keep secrets so they could fund their Patreons and whatever the fuck. Um, I received a decent amount of backlash on that from some of those guide writers, and, yeah, that kind of sucked. Um, these days, I think a lot of that behavior has kind of not been as prevalent in the community, or rather, I think it's... A little bit more frowned upon now and people start calling it out so unless your name is azertharian you don't actively you know put out misinformation and try to you know get money out of your community but most other people at this point realize it's shitty um yeah chori you're correct yeah, they have some interesting advertisement strategies. I, honestly, some of it I don't even I don't even hate like a lot of the ways they choose to advertise their add-on, but some of it is definitely a little bit shady, and I'm not a huge fan of it. Pipe bomb? What's pipe bomb? Oh, you were wondering when I'd say that name? Yeah. Uh, let's see. Honestly, at this point, this queue should pop any second, so I'm just gonna wait for this and that'll level me up. Fuck it. And turn in this, uh, this quest while I'm at it, though. 
Uh, and then I can catch up on chat real quick. Um, you need to work on your times. Your times are really not amazing. I mean, hey, it comes with practice. And if you're trying to shave every possible second, then, you know, the consumables help. But you can definitely get a good time without all the fancy consumables. Uh, you can recast Ice Block to remove it. Oh, all right. That's good to know. I did not realize that. Uh, how do you queue mop dungeons when you're in wide timeline? Chromi time is a binary state. The only thing that picking an expansion off Chromi has an impact on is it gives you A, the breadcrumb quest for that particular expansion, which you can get other ways. You can get the breadcrumb quests by using the hero's call board or sometimes just walking there. And it also lets you queue for dungeons in that particular expansion. But right now, Warlords of Draenor scales to 61. It actually scales to 60 because the fucking tooltip is a lie. And that in patch 10 point, what was it? 10.1.5, Blizzard said they were making Chromie time scale up to 61. And that was in the uh, patch notes and it still doesn't work. <laughs> still has not been implemented. We're going to reach 10.2 with that change literally never having been working at any point on the PTR or live servers. And yet it's still... Man, I, I'm just going to make myself tilted about that. Whatever. Um, but... One second. Uh, but yeah, so this scales, if I go to anywhere else, uh, Eastern Kingdoms, this all scales... Northrend scales. Uh, Chromie time is a binary state. So if you are in one expansion's Chromie time, every single zone scales to Chromie time. So that is a yeah, classic thing that people get confused about. Uh, let's see. Uh, did you see that Sniper Wolf docks Jax films? Yeah. Like crazy shit right there. Um, Man. It's kind of wild, because, like, the... I mean, obviously, everybody was dunking on Sniper Wolf just for being a terrible content thief, but... <laughs> it's like... I I honestly... I think something needs to happen at this point with, like, the Sniper Wolf shit. Um, but... I, I don't know. I Like, it's... She honestly probably would have gotten away with just stealing content. Like, Jack would have continued to call her out... Uh, she would have continued to lose like an individual video here and there because people uh, talk to YouTube and claim their clips. But realistically, there was only so long that Jack could have kept that going, right? I I think as sad as it is to say, there is a good chance that Sniper Wolf could have just put her head in the sand, ignored the criticism, and eventually, probably Jack would have run out of steam and YouTube would have done nothing and she just would have continued to be able to steal people's content for free. So it is a lunacy decision right there. Like, what the fuck are you thinking? Doing something that fucking stupid, which not only is that like borderline illegal and just regardless on whether or not it is actually illegal, extremely ethically wrong, but now she's painted a massive target on her back for, like, every single person out there, whether they thought that her content was good or bad. And, I mean, this isn't something that you can just walk away from, uh, you know, unscathed, like, unlike the fucking content shit. Now, as for whether or not action gets taken on her, I hope it does. But even if it doesn't, it's still hopefully going to have a negative impact. It, but that, yeah, is really fucking unacceptable so i hope something gets done about that didn't they make it so 61 you weren't kicked off as soon as they hit 60 no they joshua they literally changed nothing i can tell you right now that is what people speculate they were trying to change i can tell you having tested it absolutely nothing at all was changed they literally put in their patch notes, Chromie Time now scales to 61. They updated the tooltip over here, so now it shows 61. And it that is all they changed. They updated the little number on the map. They added it to their patch notes. They changed nothing in the actual game to make Chromie Time scale to 61. It still works exactly like it did before. The literal only thing it doesn't do now is it doesn't automatically teleport you out 
after 60 seconds when you hit 60, but you can't actually level up to 61. Yeah, true. Yeah, Naomi actually just said that as I'm saying it. Um, so I guess that is one change, but presumably the reason they did that is because you were supposed to be able to level up to 61, but they fucked the scaling, so everything stopped scaling at 60. So, like, I, I, technically, yes, I guess they did do that, but uh, I think that's more of an accident than anything. Uh, and it's extremely dangerous? Yeah, for sure. That behavior is ridiculously dangerous, and just what it promotes is terrible. Um, it definitely, she needs to be taken down. Uh, she won't face consequences because most people don't care. Uh, honestly, I think most people do care at this point. Like, most people didn't care about the content stealing. I, and I'd say most is loose. A lot of people didn't care about the content stealing, even though it, for me, I, obviously, I also really cared about it. It meant a lot to me. Um, but I, I, I think you're underestimating the amount of people that care about that. Doxing? Like actually threatening people yeah that is absolutely something that a lot of people will care about regardless of what they think of her content the only question is does youtube give enough of a shit to actually do something about it i got temple of the jade serpent again huh all right the wildest part is that people ever watched her videos to begin with and how they defend her simps really embarrassing the rest of mankind. Yeah, I I mean, you kind of said it yourself. It's very easy to understand why people defend Sniper Wolf, unfortunately. But, I mean, like, yeah, I, I'm not going to sit here and act like she's not hot. Like, sure, she has that one thing in life going for her, um, but the rest of her is disgusting. And I... I think it deserves to be called out. But yeah, obviously, if she didn't have that one thing going for her, yeah, it, it's pretty indefensible behavior. Uh, let's see. You can kind of... Yeah, I know you mentioned the rares, Goose Comics, but obviously that's not like... Like, even I wouldn't level that way. It You need a lot of rares to do that. She needs legal action taken? Yep, yeah, for sure. YouTube is too busy fighting its own war with ad blockers. Yeah. I don't know. YouTube definitely is not known for making smart business decisions, so... Who knows? But... At a certain point, like... Even if uh, they aren't going to do it for ethical reasons, right? I think... Hopefully they realize that promoting a known, like, doxer and, you know, just overall shitty person like that is not good for their look. So I do think there's a good chance that even if she doesn't actually get, like, deplatformed, like, a lot of people are calling for her to have her YouTube channel completely removed. And while I honestly think that's fair, given the circumstances... That, unfortunately, does seem like a bit of a reach for what YouTube would even be willing to do. But one thing that I do think is at least likely, maybe I'm just coping, is that YouTube at least stops giving her special treatment and stops actually, like, promoting her channel as much as they do because, yeah, that, that, that shit's fucked. And hopefully they realize that when they encourage, a, you know, on quote-unquote, content creator like that it just really does not look good for their branding as a whole. Can we stop copying? Oh, yeah, you also said she's hot, can't deny that, but her content is shit. Yeah. Uh, Jesus. You even said disgusting fucking hell. Yeah, we, we are literally mirroring each other's messages there. Well, I mean, yeah, it's it's subjective. I'm not going to say that Sniper Wolf is, like, the picture of beauty or any stretch. Uh, okay, they're going this way. I figured it was still faster to go the other way, but hey. I'm not going to sit here and try to defend Sniper Wolf, though. Like, if you say you don't find her attractive, more power to you, quite honestly. 
Carl didn't take each other people's content. Yeah. Yeah, like I I'm not saying she's like supermodel gorgeous, right? Definitely not, but you know. I hate that like I I I'm not I'm not about to try and defend Sniper Wolf here. So I'm not gonna get into that. Um It's great and classic. One of the quests from Thousand Needles is to just get dust from a dragon for a goblin to snort. Oh yeah, I remember that one. Harold did a hot tub speed run? Oh god. That's cursed. That is a cursed suggestion right there. Anyways. Uh, this one definitely spiraled. Uh, let, let me go back to reading the other messages I missed. I saw a few interesting ones in there that I just didn't get around to reading yet. Um, positivity only zone sounds like a scam? Yeah. I mean, honestly, I know some people who genuinely are fairly positive and have, like, a pr pretty good outlook on a lot of stuff, but I think a lot of those people I also know personally, and they aren't, like, content creators, you know? A, a lot of the people who have this, like, forward-facing, you know, very positive vibe stuff, a lot of them are fake. I think a good example of, like, a general, like positive type streamer that i tend to enjoy watching is jorbs uh slay the spire streamer i think generally speaking jorbs is like a pretty positive person and has like a very laid back attitude and that's like partially why i like watching him but at the same time one of the things that i like about jorbs is while he generally is positive it's not like one of those only good vibes type streams like there have been times where people say something really stupid and frankly like offensive in his chat and he tells them to fuck off like if somebody says something like you know omega conservative he's willing to say like no fuck that shit i don't tolerate that here and that i respect you know they're like it's one thing to be like a generally positive person but still have like morals and values and like you have that line where if somebody crosses that line you're like no fuck you and generally speaking while i am a more like, I tend to be a bit more negative-leading, or heavily more negative-leading than, like, Jorbs, for instance. I think that is generally how I try to view life, right? Like, I'm, I'm not trying to be mean to people, but if somebody does something that I'm like, that's fucked up, I'm not afraid to call them out for it. Um, but that is one of the reasons why I, like, like Jorbs, for instance, as a content creator, because while I do think he is a positive and friendly person, he is not fake. And I respect that. Uh, but there are a lot of people who do have that very fake atmosphere, as I described, and that always really irks me. And you can usually tell, right? This It's not like it's very hard. Uh, like, man, it that that's kind of the most annoying part about it, in my opinion. It When people are like that, it is so blatantly obvious. It's, like, just gross watching, and you're just like, oh my god, this person is so fucking shallow and fake, and you just know because it's, like, written all over their fucking face. And uh, that's, I think, the worst part about it. Um, Blizzard trying to sell you, get you to sell the biggest crypto, the WoW token. Oh, man. <laughs> Look. Oh, hey, I hit level 60. Yeah, I guess it makes sense that, that that dungeon's what got me there. And I can quickly show, going back to Chromie time, that uh, it um doesn't even scale. In fact, did it turn off? No, it's still... Still 61, but if we look here, yeah, the experience has stopped scaling. So it, it still has not been fixed. So I guess overall thoughts on Frost Mage. Uh, it's definitely the weakest of the three mage specs. It, honestly, Frost is like exactly where I thought it would be. It's um, It's weaker than Arcane. Obviously, Arcane is nuts. It's weaker, for, and this is leveling we're talking about purely, weaker than fire because fire pops the fuck off at uh, later levels. So all three specs are good at low levels with arcane being the best. And while arcane is still dominant at high levels, fire really gets up there. I don't think frost hits quite the same highs, but it comes close. Like this has not been a bad leveling experience. Honestly, I've just kind of mostly shut off my brain and pressed big buttons and things have died. And... 
admittedly, I've done more dungeons this run than I tend to do, so I have not done, like, a lot of the same leveling stuff. I didn't do, like, Yetimus. I didn't do um, a lot of, like, gigantic AoE pulls. But I, we all know I've, I've done enough that, yeah, you have Frost Nova. You have multiple kiting tools. It's a mage, right? So it's a mage with similar AoE damage, maybe slightly weaker single target. Overall, I think it's fine. I don't know exactly where I would place it. Um, I think probably low A tier. It's definitely below some other ones, but it's still good. It still falls into the category of like no clear weaknesses. It can do everything pretty well. Hot sub speedrun at 100k subs. No, 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 no. No fucking shot. Goose Comics is on board too? God damn it. Why do so many people want to see a hot tub speedrun of all things? Your hardline personally is when people say Trade Prince Gallywix is a good character. There are people who think that Trade Prince Gallywix is a good character. Huh. What's the slash played? Uh, actually, yeah, I'm curious to see that. What's, what is my slash played? Uh, nine hours. Though keep in mind, at least two of those hours uh, were speedrun prep. So... Because I didn't do the, like, typical speedrun thing where I mail everything over, I sent over gold to this character when I created it at level 1. And then after, like, going to Stormwind, I did that. I got the, like, if you look at the thumbnail, right, I did that on this character. I went and got, like, the screenshot and stuff for the thumbnail. Uh, I was AFK in Stormwind for, like, 30 minutes or something. So, I would say, realistically, my total time for... Uh, 1 to 70 was probably closer to 7 hours, which, uh, you know, definitely not my fastest. Not even close. But also, when I was leveling my character up to 32 before starting the stream, I was mindlessly doing B or TBC dungeons while um, watching House MD on my second monitor. And then, obviously, this stream, I've been, you know, kind of just playing it chill, doing random crap that I normally wouldn't do for speedruns and stuff. You miss permanent water rally? Yeah. I can see that. You think Frost is the best of the mage specs for a new player? Um, well, I can say for sure, Fire is the worst spec for a new player. Like, while Fire was really cool, I had to really pay attention when I was doing that leveling run as Fire. Um, it requ required a lot of focus to successfully do those pulls without getting fucked over. I honestly don't think Arcane is as bad as people make it out to be. For leveling, it's pretty basic. Like, you don't really need to understand a lot to press Arcane Explosion and Arcane Barrage on AoE. Single target, it's maybe a little bit more involved for, like, the leveling burst window, but it's pretty simple. Now, I'm not going to say Frost is not also simple. Like, there are definitely ways to, like, optimize your damage a little bit. But honestly, I wasn't even really doing that. And as we all saw, it was still pretty good. So, I definitely think the kiting potential for new players is nice. But you also have to remember, like, Arcane has... We can uh, switch over to Arcane real quick. Um, Arcane has whatever it is that makes it so Arcane Barrage slows mobs. The chrono Shift, right? Where is that? Uh, yeah, Chrono Shift. Arcane Barrage slows enemies by 50% and increases your movement speed by 50%. I mean, you get this maybe not super early, but by the time when actually kiting is an issue, this just completely trivializes kiting on Arcane. Literally, all you do is you just press Arcane Explosion a few times, you hit like an 8-target Arcane Barrage, it slows everyone hit by 50% and gives you a speed boost. And then you can pretty much get like 100% uptime on this. Um, so maybe you could argue that like without Chrono Shift, Arcane Kiting is a little bit harder to do. But Chrono Shift is just so fucking good. Like, this actually just makes Arcane Kiting so broken. There's so many broken things about Arcane in general, but, you know, you get the point, right? It's... there's a lot going for it. Um, and I should note, uh, so something that a lot of other people like to ask. Isn't Arcane, like, ten times worse than Fire? No, 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 no. I mean, Arcane isn't even that bad 
Right. Let's double check numbers. Arcane is definitely not ten times worse than fire. That is a, a big reach. You have to understand also that if we're talking Mythic Plus, Arcane is not even bad in Mythic Plus. But obviously, people are going to run the God Comp, which I'm pretty sure still includes fire. Because if fire is the best, then it's going to have a disproportionately higher pick rate. But, uh, like, oh, difficult? Oh, difficulty-wise. Yes, 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 yes. Um, oh, oh, I see what you mean. Isn't Arcane harder than fire? Yeah, not while leveling. Um... I think, so the thing about Arcane is a lot of its difficulty comes from its burst window. And you're never going to need to actually optimize its burst window for leveling content. Mobs are dead long before then. And even then, you could still get good damage out of Arcane, even if you don't min-max like the Touch of the Magi burst window. But yes, it definitely is very involved at high levels. Um... The thing about Fire is you do actually need to understand its core burst window mechanics. Now, it's Mechanics are comparatively easier than min-maxing an Arcane Mage at max level, but whereas Arcane at low levels can just kind of mash buttons and get all of its damage, really, Fire has to play around with, like, its critical strike, you know, chaining into Pyroblast thing, and that is not the most intuitive thing for leveling, and it requires you to actually think about which abilities you're using. You cannot just button mash. Um, yeah. So, Oxara, you're definitely correct there, but yeah, that is pretty much only for like your burst window at higher levels um honestly even 60 to 70 that wouldn't really matter but it, it's a good point you don't mind the crummy enjoyers cute gnomes over goblins every day yeah really wish we'd get a wow spinoff where we play as one of the five dragon races and start off as a whelpling that could be interesting definitely better than the other spinoffs wow is making Oh yeah, in case you're not in my Discord, I posted, I am almost certainly going to be doing a video on uh, Warcraft Rumble, specifically on how dog shit it is, because I have been so tilted watching people talk about like the game and how it might actually be good, and I mean, to give you an idea of my working title, right now I'm thinking of titling that video... Warcraft Rumble is worse, with worse being in all caps, than Diablo Immortal. Um, that, that is what I'm thinking of for the title, to give you an idea. Uh, it, it's bad. So, I talked about that extensively in my Discord, so if you want to read it, you can find the channel. It's in the I posted it in the miscellaneous channel, a big long rant about Warcraft Rumble. I've also talked about it, like my problems with the game on stream, but I think before I said that I wasn't going to touch it at all... Uh, at least outside of what I already played in beta. But at this point, the problem that I have with it is if Blizzard was content to let it be a cash grab and just, hey, we're going to put out this shitty mobile game that's, you know, going for people's money. Um, okay, fine, in a vacuum, sure. Uh, but the fact that they're now really trying to push it and really trying to sell people on the idea of it... <laughs> I like it. Should call it Warcraft Rumble more like Warcraft Fumble. <laughs> That's good. That's good. I see. I don't know if I'll use that as a title, but the using Warcraft Fumble somewhere. Oh, that's good. That that is fucking funny. Uh I like the idea of that. Um anyways, as I was saying. Uh, the fact that Blizzard is trying to, like, heavily sell people on this game pisses me off. Because it, it is a blatant cash grab. So, you know, if people want to try it, by all means, I guess. But I am going to make it very, very, very clear in my video that this game is not worth your time or your money. And I, the, the most common thing that I keep seeing from people is, well, I guess I'll just play it until I hit a wall and stop having fun. And what I think people don't realize is that wall happens, like, two hours into the game. Maybe even faster if you're, like, really good and pass through all the missions super early. So, when I do, I'm going to do another free-to-play playthrough of at least part of it until I, you know, literally can't fucking do anything anymore because I've just lost all sanity. Um, so, I'm going to do another free-to-play playthrough. Um... 
Honestly, that might be like Twitch stream content. I've said before, I might stream stuff on Twitch that is like unrelated to what I do on YouTube. And that like, I don't really think would work well as like a YouTube video, but that's like the type of thing that I don't, I don't want to do that shit on YouTube, right? I don't want to stream myself playing that game on this platform, but that's like the kind of thing that like on a, on a different website where it like won't appear on my YouTube channel for people who want to watch it and want to watch me lose my fucking sanity. Maybe I'll do that. I'll think about it. Um, I guess I'll, I'll keep you guys posted on whether I decide to go through with that. You still like the idea of Twitch raid testing? Well, I said that more as like a future thing. At this point, there's only one more day of raid testing period. So I'm not going to try to get that set up just for uh, raid testing next week. Um, I, I more so meant that like if I had thought of it a month ago, that might have been something I could have done. And obviously I tried to do it on YouTube. It didn't work out. Um, but like in the future, maybe for next raid tier, if I end up going through with that, that is something that could work well for it. Um, but yeah, we'll see. Stuff like that. Uh, so before I stream isn't over, by the way, I'm going to swap over to wow classic and I'm going to do a little bit of leveling and some hard mode dungeons until I'm like dead tired. I'm already kind of tired, but like, you know, streams only been going for five hours. So we'll go for at least like two or three more hours. Um, I at least want to showcase the new, uh, like leveling tech that they have for like the ICC update along with some hard mode dungeons just for fun. Um, but the last thing I'll say in terms of Frost Mages, because this is something I always get asked, as far as what talents you would pick for 60 to 70, so right now I'd probably go with like Temporal Velocity and put another point into that. Then I think I would go Frigid Winds down to uh, Ice Ward and... I don't know, after that you have options. Mostly this, because Frost Nova, especially for Frost, has, like, actually some synergy and stuff. Um, dead Tired, or the character literally dies. Yeah, I'm not going to be playing Classic Hardcore, uh, so definitely don't want to have a chance of that. Um, oh, I, but I see what you mean, Chori. Until I'm dead in-game, no, no, no. I just, I'm more just a Dead Tired IRL. Um, you're so happy Random Dungeon Finder is in the game. Yeah, Random Dungeon Finder is a game changer for sure. It's so nice. Really, 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 really nice. Um, and I think definitely not having to deal with pre-made groups and stuff is uh, a massive blessing. Because it was really hard to encourage people to, like, you know, gear up in dungeons before. Because you are right, there was definitely a very clicky mentality when it comes to that stuff. Uh, but anyways, as for... Uh, Frost Mage Tree, you would definitely take Glacial Spike. This would be the very next point you'd spend. Glacial Spike for pure single target is a game changer. It's obviously like a mainstay of Frost's rotation at max level. After that, you have some options. Thermal Void is okay. Um, honestly, Ray of Frost is okay, but then you would have to go like Chain Reaction, Ray of Frost... I think your very first point would probably be Glacial Assault. Uh, this is what I would say. Well, after Glacial Spike. So Glacial Spike, Glacial Assault, and then it's uh, you have options after that. I think personally, personally, I'd probably go Chain Reaction, Ray of Frost. And after that, um, you have options. I honestly, any of the final talent points or whatever, because like it, it's the last point you spend. But I think that is probably what I would go with for Frost. But uh, there's no clear cut thing outside of Glacial Spike. If Glacial Spike was easier to access, I probably would have taken it now. But I did the math, and the earliest I could have gotten this was level 57. And by the time I'm level 57, I'm not going to make use of Glacial Spike. Uh, and Honestly, Freezing Rain is really, really, really good. Having the Instant Cast Blizzard is super duper nice, especially because there's a lot of other stuff that synergizes with Blizzard. And when it's a cast time, it's not really efficient to cast, but like when you can just get this instant, that suddenly makes it infinitely better. So that is really good. So I think getting these two and then taking Hailstones and Freezing Winds is probably the play instead of going for Glacial Spike. You're gearing up pretty quick with the badges and stuff. Oh, yeah. 
I'm probably going to make a catch-up guide for Wrath Classic discussing that and like some other tricks that you can do to get gear really quickly. Because a lot of people will complain about like getting caught up and stuff. But if you do random dungeon finder and you spend your currency wisely, uh, you can get gear really, really, really quickly. There's some other cool tricks like uh, something I would recommend. When you start doing gamma dungeons, convert your Defiler Scourge Stones down into Sidereal Essence. Because there's a lot of gear that you can buy for Sidereal Essence that with the one-to-one -one conversion ratio, actually costs less despite being the same item level. And in many cases, you will get better items, uh, not always, but in, in some cases, you could get a better item with Sidereal Essence than you could get from uh, Defiler Scourge Stones. And it'll be much, much, much cheaper. So that is something to consider that I think not a lot of people have thought of. It's like my... <laughs> My mom just messaged me. Apparently my mom just jumped into the stream. So hi, mom. And yes, five hours later and I'm still going. And I, I still have a few more things to do. Uh, let me quickly catch up on a few messages and then we'll hop over to Classic and I can continue reading it. I just want to make sure I don't fall too far behind. Uh, Justin Kassan said, I'm returning to WoW for the first time after almost nine years. You grinded for heirlooms and wrath, but now it's going to cost a fortune to upgrade them to 60. Any advice on realistic ways to upgrade a set? Uh, yeah, definitely prioritize the ones that you can use on all characters. There are a lot of ways to upgrade heirlooms that don't cost gold. Like, honestly, time walking is a really good way, using the time walking badges. If you have a lot of characters leveled, what you can do is just do... Uh, especially during turbulent timeways, every single week you get that quest item. Uh, I think I have it on my character. This thing. Whispering Fell Flame Crystal. So, let me find it. Uh, wherever the quest is for that. Uh, special? No. Where would it be, actually? I don't know what it would be classified under. Uh, Dalaran? Yeah, okay, here it is. Uh, so, this quest item, you get it off your very first time walking dungeon every single uh, time it's up, and it gives you 500 time warp badges. So, a single dungeon, you get 500 badges, this is once per character. But, if you have a lot of different characters, what you can do is run one time walking dungeon every single week on all of those characters, get the instant 500 badges on each of them, and by the end of the Turbulent Timeways event, even if you started right now, like you, if you start right now, you get 500 this week, 500 this week, 500 this, this week. That's 1,500 badges each character just for doing a single dungeon on all of them. That gives you a ton of time warp badges, and you can use that to buy a lot of the heirloom upgrade things. So that should probably help. Uh, let's see. Uh, reminds me of people who make WoW guides and act like they own the content in game and then get pissed when someone shares the information. Yeah, exactly. 100%. Uh, Naomi was the toxic speedrunner all along. Yeah, and to be clear, uh, I one thing I will say is the person that I was talking about before was not Bellular. That, that was not Bellular. I have no beef with Bellular. Um, I, I've talked before, you know, that some of the stuff he did mildly bothered me, but, like, Bellular has not done anything that makes me, like, angry at him or anything. Um, in fact, I'm, I'm glad that he credited me the last time he referred to my leveling guide. I appreciated that. Um, so, I'm not gonna say I'm Bellular's greatest fan or anything like that, but I, I don't hate the guy at all. In fact... Like, on, if we're on the curve of, like, YouTubers or WoW YouTubers that I respect, Bellular is, like, on the more respected side. He does some shit that I'm not the biggest fan of, and I've talked about it, right? But, um, there, there are a lot of people who do a lot of stuff that really bothers me. Um, if it doesn't directly involve me, I'm not going to name them, but there are some YouTubers that bug the hell on me. Uh, but Bellular was not the person I was referring to. Just to be absolutely clear, because I, I can understand how some person might misunderstand that, um, considering I brought up Bellular in the past, but no, it was definitely not him, just to be 100% clear. Um, if there was a way to combine two different X-Packs for Chromie Time, one for questing and the other for dungeons, it would definitely be uh, Cata Revamp and TBC Dungeons. 
Uh, 100%, not even close. Uh, let's see. Pipe bomb is a wrestling term when someone drops a hot bit of drama. Oh, I've never heard that before. Um, yeah, that, that is uh, new terminology to me. Naomi said, I don't use all the consumables myself, and you've got some times very close to some of Harlan's actual record runs. Not trying to... No, I mean, yeah, for sure. Um, definitely a lot of people have gotten really good times. 90% of the time save comes from 10% of the consumables. Yeah, exactly. Ignoring consumables, you just haven't done a, a lot of serious leveling in a while, aka taking the time to not get distracted. Yeah, I completely feel that. Six hours is not bad at all, though. I've seen a lot of people get, like, you know, seven or eight hours, you know... There was actually something that kind of bugged me is uh, I don't remember the YouTuber's name, but somebody did a really clickbait series of videos of I tested all of these different leveling guides. Did they work? And uh, one of them was on mine. Obviously, it was, I tested this YouTuber's leveling guide. Did it work? And a, a few people sent me that uh, like, oh, did you see that? You know, this person made a video and it, like they leveled as a rogue. For starters, which like, yeah, Rogue is slow, um, but it took them like nine hours. And I think they, I, I skimmed the video because I mean, it was blatantly clickbait bullshit. I, I didn't really want to encourage it. I was at least curious to hear what they had to say. Um, and I think they said something to the effect of like, it seems if you're more familiar with the game, blah, 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 blah. And it's like, brother, nine hours is not a very good time. You know, like I could fucking get seven hours with my route. I, I literally did here seven hours just dicking around, you know, not taking anything seriously. I mean, it technically took me nine hours, but like I said, you know, uh, some of that was uh, like fucking around buying consumables and stormwind, but like at my absolute worst times, it's nine hours. Um, that That's not like a, a good time, right? If you just follow the route and try to be relatively efficient, I technically didn't even follow my route this time. It's not hard. Uh, so that one kind of annoyed me a little bit because I'm like, brother, that's a skill issue right there. Like, You can't say that like, oh, I, I played a rogue and it took me nine hours and this guide seems more oriented towards experienced players. Like, get the fuck out of here, but whatever. Um. Anyways... Uh, you enjoyed a tier list, uh, or when Max was making a video about a tier list, and in the intro he gets Azertharian in for Hunter Opinion, you close the video knowing there's at least part of the video that's probably lies. Yeah. Is what it is. It's fucking Azertharian, man. Uh, that's cool that Bellular credited you. Yeah, for sure. Um, definitely, I'm, I'm glad he did that. Uh, where was I? Let me scroll up a little bit. The reason why time walking queues were so long was because you're playing on Alliance. Oh. Yeah, I guess it isn't cross faction, huh? So that makes sense. Um let's see. Oh yeah, here was all the sniper wolf discussion, so I've caught up to that part. Uh favorite caster so far. That's a good question. Um hmm. I'm tempted to just say Arcane Mage, because, like, I, I really like Arcane. Uh, hmm. Well, I can tell you, it, it was not Frost. I didn't hate this playstyle, but I, I didn't love this either. It was also not Warlock. Um, I, I also did not hate playing a Warlock, but it was, it was not, like, the most fun thing I've ever done. Uh, it was not Elemental. I think Elemental had some cool ideas. And I liked when I got the combo to work. But ultimately, definitely is like a little bit too turdy for me. Even though I can understand why it is. I thought Shadow Priest was interesting. I wouldn't say that Shadow Priest is my favorite. But I liked Shadow Priest more than I expected. I thought it was pretty fun. Uh... I guess hunt. I, I include Hunter and Caster because, like, you know, if you don't call Hunter, like, a caster, then at that point, it's, like, it really, it's just a ranged. So, like, because if we specify caster, then it's just ranged without Hunters, so I include it. Um, I'm not a fan of Marksmanship or BM uh, in terms of how they play while leveling. Just not, not really the biggest fan of either one. Uh, I think Devastation Evoker is kind of fun, but... 
it's a little bit hard to compare it one to one just because it's uh 60 to 70 at the moment so really not direct um it wasn't boomkin definitely wasn't boomkin so i think it's either devastation evoker which i will not include just because like i said hard to compare it one to one and i really think it's between uh arcane or fire I'm almost tempted to say fire because I think that fire 40 to 60 run that I did like a month ago, I think that was actually some of the most fun that I've had doing these testing runs because while I like leveling as arcane, I've done it a lot. And like arcane is just, it's consistent. You know what to expect. It's good. Fire. I went in expecting to like not have fun because I'm like, oh, this is going to be a pain in the ass. Like, I don't think it's going to be anywhere near as good as arcane. And then when I started figuring out fire, I'm like, okay wait a second, like, this actually kind of owns. This is really good. And I also liked how engaged I felt the entire time playing Fire. It was, like, you know, Frost here, I've just been pressing buttons. In Fire, I was able to pull off some ridiculous stuff. I started challenging myself and doing harder and harder pulls because I was able to pull off crazy shit in that Fire leveling run. But I wasn't just mashing buttons. Like, I had to kite around. I had to blink back and forth and use, like, alter time and shit to, like, round up all the mobs and, like, get my instant cast flame strikes. It felt really good. It was powerful, and it felt good to play. And I, I once I got into, like, the, the swing of things with, like, understanding how to, like, chain the critical strikes back to back, fire was fun. You know what? Yeah, I've sold myself on it. I think it's fire fire out of all of the runs that i've done it arcane is a close second for sure i've always enjoyed leveling as arcane but i enjoyed fire way more than i thought i would it was a really 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 fun spec to level for sure um fire feels really good when it pops off yeah currently maining fire it feels great to me yeah i can't speak to how it feels in endgame but I mean, I think any spec that manages to feel that engaging at low-level content almost certainly would feel fun to play in max level. And I'm glad it does, because I tried playing Fire in Nihilotha, and I just couldn't really get into it. Like, the Blaster Master playstyle just didn't really speak to me a lot. I didn't have a lot of fun with it. But this current playstyle of Fire, at least the one that I was using for leveling, I thought was really fun. I really enjoyed that. What's wrong with Azertharian? I've talked about it a few times. Azertharian paywalls his content. He's one of, one of if not the only theory crafters that still locks a lot of his simulations and like theory crafting quote unquote behind a paywall. And like, if that was all he did, it would be kind of scummy, but at least not terrible. The thing that pushes Azertharian over the edge to the point where I'm willing to openly say the guy's garbage is he has, on multiple occasions intentionally put out misinformation in his free public guides or held back key information like a classic example is the dire beast glyph in vault of the incarnates there was a glyph that you could apply to your dire beast that increased its damage because it like gave it energy regen or something like that so it was a pretty sizable damage gain it, and it was a bug mind you this was not intentional behavior and he knew about the bug and he kept it to himself for months until somebody else discovered it and then they checked his logs and found out that he was actually using the bug in actual logs in actual content but he didn't mention it anywhere and he like didn't report it because he wanted to keep it all to himself so he could get that damage bonus and nobody else could the guy's just a fucking rat like in that in combination with the paywall stuff it's just absolute fucking rat behavior um, people like that should not be uh, theory crafting leaders. And um, to, honestly, I'm not the only one who thinks this. There are a lot of other high level theory crafters, like people who run the other class discords, who openly shit talk Azertharian. Uh, in fact, I've I've seen screenshots of like some of the Wowhead guide writer discussions, and a lot of them just absolutely torch the shit out of Azertharian, like, in their little Discord chat all the fucking time, because they all know that he's trash. It's... Yeah. Nobody likes him. At least nobody in the know likes him. It, it's... It's so annoying. Uh, and obviously, I mean, you guys know my thoughts on paywalling shit in general, so... Yeah, you can understand, hopefully, why I am especially pissed off about shit like that.
you know, it, it's, and honestly, it's one thing to do that for, like, a leveling add-on. Already bad, but at least you can maybe make a very, 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 very loose argument of, well, they developed the add-on, and that's the thing you're paying for. Still not a good argument, but that is at least a devil's advocate that I can work with. But paywalling research and blatantly misinforming the public and strat hoarding to benefit your own logs fuck that that is terrible um you recently s god comparing azertharian to kalamazi oh it's like fucking comparing filet mignon to hamburger helper man oh god no god no um uh, I would say if you want a uh, a good hunter theory crafter, I've been told Tarlo is very good. Tarlo is another one of the hunter theory crafters. He does more stuff for BM, I think, but uh, everything I've heard about him is good. So uh, that that is the only one I can actually recommend. See, okay, yeah, honestly, comparing Azur Theory and the Hamburger Helper is a disservice to Hamburger Helper, man. Um, true, yeah. It's literal fucking trash. Um, and definitely, like, anything above actual garbage is not a fitting comparison. Um, Kalamazi, definitely. Kalamazi is one of the better theory crafters out there. I have a lot of respect for him. So, yeah, comparing yeah, the Kalamazi of Hunters, Jesus Christ. Uh, honestly, a lot of specs don't even have, have a Kalamazi. Like, he puts in a lot of work. I respect what he does. Um, but... Like, there are definitely a lot of specs that have that. Like, Word Up is the Kalamazi of enhancement and stuff like that. Um, the Monk community is, you know, overwhelmed with options. Uh, there's a lot of great people in the Monk community. Well, while I may personally have my disagreements with Babylonius as, you know, a former guildmaster, I don't necessarily love how he ran his guild. I, I still respect what Babylonius does for the Monk community. And Windwalker stuff. I respected him before I joined his guild, and even though I left his guild on not so great terms, I I didn't. He was honestly one of the only people in the leadership that I I don't hate. I think he could have ran things better, and I, I'm a little bit disappointed with some how he handled certain things. But I still respect him as a guide writer and theory crafter and stuff. And, I mean, I, I respect him as a person too. Um, maybe not so much as a guild leader, but uh. You know, definitely a very, very, very good person for the Monk community to have. Um, and Brewmasters have uh, Emelson. And Emelson is like... You know, Emelson is just like, you know, the Giga Chad gif. Fucking love that, man. Emelson's amazing. There's a lot of really good theory crafters out there. Zoolandia is another really good mage theory crafter. Um, I've done like... Uh, he was in OE and I did like a lot of testing with him. Talked to him on multiple occasions. Uh, Sumer is another person I met from OE. Really great guy. He also helped me with a lot of testing stuff. Um, it, in fact, Sumer is, if you watch my uh, Trial of the Crusader Wrath video, he helped me do PTR testing for that. And I actually used him in a clip where he forgot to unequip his Argent Lance. So I zoom in on him and he's waddling around before the boss fight with his Argent Lance still stuck to his back. So, yeah, I, I li like a lot of those guys. There's a lot of really good people in, like, the theory crafting scene. And then there's, you know, n not that. So, yeah. Uh, Justin said, all right, dudes and dudettes, just got home for work. Thank you for the advice from everybody. No problem. I'm glad everybody was able to help, myself included. Still find it funny that your abusive ex went to Azertharian when she didn't believe you. <laughs> oh, yeah, that is, oof, not good. Uh, anyways, where was I? Uh, okay, I, I see. I got, uh, I got up to, what was your favorite caster to play? And stuff. Uh, well, as for Frostmage, what talents would I take? Well, for my first talent point, I go to the specialization tab and under arcane click activate. <laughs> oh, yeah. I love saying that shit. I think I said that once for Feral. But, like, honestly... I feel Dragonflight has definitely improved a lot of specs. Like, Outlaw, I still think, is kind of lacking a little bit. And, like, Boomkin... Boomkin isn't bad for leveling, but I actually think when I make my final tier list, I have a feeling that um, 
Boomkin's probably going to be one of the lower rated ones, just because compared to a lot of the other specs I've tested, it's just like, I can't put everything in A tier. So some stuff is probably going to have to come down to high B tier. And then even compared to that, I'm pretty sure Boomkin still is not good. And like, you have to, with tier lists, grade on a curve a little bit. So even if Boomkin can serviceably clear the content, like it definitely doesn't deserve, oh, can't talk. It doesn't deserve anything below a B. Because it does have some slight weaknesses, but it can do everything, you know, relatively fine. But, yeah, it, it still struggles a little bit. Uh, Chori said, I'd recommend saving the badges to buy the upgrades that cost 5k gold. Yeah, true. Definitely uh, weigh, weigh your options, like what's worth spending gold on, what's worth using badges. Oh, excuse me. What's worth using badges on, for sure. I think that is important. Uh, the most egregious Bellyoler thing is his ads and his videos. You don't care about your pins or badges or whatever he's peddling. I don't know. I mean, like, I, I don't fault people too much for, like, advertisement stuff. I've personally been very stingy about, like, accepting that stuff. And in, in the that I literally have not. Um, I kind of joked earlier that I've received a lot of, like, crypto uh, sponsorship offers and... Well, I have received a bunch of those. I have received a few offers for like more regular sponsorships. Like and that was more recently over the last few months. I, I did get one for Raid Shadow Legends, uh, which that one I was like, wow, does this make me like an actual YouTuber now? But I turned that all down because like, I don't know. I I am currently, I'm, I'm thankfully... Not in a place yet where I am, like, in dire need of money to the point where I'm willing to do anything to, like, monetize my stuff. I would rather not have to do ads and stuff like that, if possible. Um, and, Jesus, Naomi, you were, like, predicting everything I say today. <laughs> That's actually uncanny. Um, I guess it, uh, it's, uh... It's not a far reach from saying more normal sponsorships, but I got some other ones for like, like I forget there was one where, and, and that's the kind of the thing. There was one where somebody was like, had a company that had, um, some sort of like remote desktop service that let you like play games like, uh, on your computer from your phone or something like that. And it was like, like, it's moderately interesting, but it was, like, more of a mobile game thing. And while it didn't seem, like, egregious or anything, I was like, this seems fairly normal. But the, I, I forget exactly what it was, but some of it, some of the terminology, because it was, like, a subscription model. And I'm like, I, I don't love this. It seems like a neat concept, but I don't really understand it. And it's definitely not something I would actually use. So, eh. Um, that was honestly the, the one that I was at least the most, like, this seems fairly tame. Uh, but like it would, for me to do an ad like that, it would have to be something that I was actually like able to support where I'm like, yeah, no, I think this product is good. Cause at that point, you know, if, if I actually feel comfortable advertising it, sure. Right. Uh, I would have no problem with that, but if it's something that I either don't understand, and I think that's one of the other things, like I, I can look at that. And I can say, well, this seems tame, but I don't fully understand it. I think a lot of people will just say, yeah, I don't notice any glaring red flags. I guess I'll do this ad thing. But there have also been many cases where somebody kind of just skims over something and says, yeah, it seems good enough. And it actually is like super predatory because they don't like they miss the fine print. Right. And I don't want that to happen. So unless I completely fully understand the thing that I am advertising and I'm like, yeah, this is a good product. I understand, you know, everything about it and I can actually support it and recommend it to people, you know, and sleep at night, right? Um, that is, like, the only case in which I would do something like that. Um, you have completely mentally blocked those ads. It's basically free money for a YouTuber now. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, so Mateus said, I like people I watch earning money. Yeah, to be clear, and this is a distinction that I want to make, because I think the entire... Um, like, I don't remember if this was what I'm responding to right now. Um, yeah, oh, because what Sonic Boom was saying, right? So, uh, what Sonic Boom was saying about, like, you know, tuning, like, not liking the ads and stuff like that. Well, I, on one hand, do agree that I don't want to personally put ads and stuff in my videos. 
remember that I, I prefaced all of that by saying I am fortunate enough to be in a position right now where I am not in such dire need for money that I need to take, you know, ads and, and whatnot. And obviously everybody's situation is different. But quite honestly, what I, if I was like really struggling to, you know, be able to afford food or whatever, um, would I have any qualms with accepting a generic non-crypto bullshit ad like that? Yeah, probably. Right. And I understand a lot of other people probably do really need the money for whatever reason. And I am not judging them whatsoever. I think there is definitely a line, right? Obviously promoting something that is a blatant scam, especially the crypto shit. That is just not okay regardless. But if it's a harmless ad for some garbage product that isn't predatory and it's just not very useful, whatever. Like Raid Shadow Legends, right? You know, it's it's like how many of the people who advertise Raid Shadow Legends actually play Raid Shadow Legends or find it interesting? I guarantee you it's like 1% of the people that they pay to advertise it. And I don't know if, like, saying that I have no interest in Raid Shadow Legends disqualifies me from ever advertising in the future. I don't really care. But, uh, honestly, it's just, it's not a game I have any interest in whatsoever. And I'm pretty sure, like, people know that, right? Like, when you see some YouTuber who has absolutely nothing to do with mobile gaming saying, you know a game that you should try? Raid Shadow Legends. It's like, you obviously know that it's just completely scripted. Um, so... It's like, you know, whatever. But it's like, you know, for instance, a game like Honkai Star Rail, like, hell, I doubt I'm ever going to get actually offered a sponsorship for that. But that I'd be like, you yeah, know, fuck, why not? Like, if it's a game I already play and can actively recommend to people. Speaking of which, um, I actually, I finally in that game beat, for people who actually know what the fuck I'm talking about, I finally managed to beat uh, Memory of Chaos 10, um, which is like the, the highest level. I didn't do it well. It was messy as shit. I got zero stars, and I beat it on the final possible cycle before it hit the heart and rage. But I at least got the... I, I beat it with two of my team members dead on the final cycle, and I got, like, at least the rewards for completing it once. Because, you know, basically for people who have no fucking idea what I'm talking about, it's like an end game challenge thing where you have to fight really difficult bosses... And there's, like, a scoring system, and you get, like, better rewards if you, like, reach the, the top score. Um, but then you still get, like, an instant reward for just managing to clear it whatsoever. So I at least, I cleared, effectively, the hardest content in the game. And uh, it wasn't pretty. I didn't get the full score rewards for it, but at least I did it. So I'm, like, I've been trying to get caught up because I started the game really fucking late. I started playing in August, and it's been out for like three months before then. So I'm sure a lot of people got there much earlier, but I was at least happy with that because some of the later ones are fucking brutal. Um, and there's, I'm still missing like, I, I at this point, I'm missing like a, a second really good damage dealer. I've been relying on Chingcha to fill in uh, one of my teams, and she's not bad, but she is nowhere near good enough to clear that at the highest score, unless I have like the absolute perfect build to support her, and I do not have that. So, yeah, it, it was rough, but I got there. Yeah, thanks, Oxara. I know you play, because I've seen you posting about it, so. Still working on... um on Swarm Disaster Difficulty 5. I've been farming Difficulty 4 for the missions a bit now, but Difficulty 5 just has fucking kicked my teeth in every time I've tried it. So I'm just gonna... I'm gonna wait to do that a little bit and get some of the, like, unlocks first before I actually try that. What spec do I main, and do I link my... Or can I link my armory? I can just log onto the character. Now that the run's over, yeah, I can just log onto it. Um... Naomi said, I'm going to DM you a meme. It's a little not safe for work, but it's way too funny and on topic. Um, oh, it definitely, I see what you mean by not safe for work. Um, <laughs> oh, man. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, so main character. So I... I mean a tank, right? Which means that you have to have multiple specs prepared. So at the moment, these are my, my six tanks, right? Obviously six tank specs, right? These are my most geared version of every single tank. Right now, I'm primarily playing uh, Brewmaster Monk and Vengeance Demon Hunter. And 
I they only if you want you can link it in like the shit post channel in Discord, uh, for people who are curious. But is that not safe for work? I'm just getting you know. Hold on, let me. Uh, have is that how you make a channel not safe for work? Yeah. Okay. All right. I I've age restricted the memes and shit post channel. <laughs> if you want to post it there, um. Forgetting Evoker tank. Man, I wish Evokers could be a tank. That would be sick. Um, But yeah, so I played this character a bit in Vault of the Incarnates. This is my Druid, which I've been gearing up my Druid, but the last time I actually mained Guardian was in uh, Nighthold, I think. It's been a hot minute. And uh, this is... I have multiple different Blood DKs, but this is the one that I've been gearing at the moment because it's my Dwarf Blood DK. So this actually isn't the one that I used to play years and years ago, but I figure if I'm going to gear up one of my Death Knights, I might as well gear up the one that already has the most broken racial in the game. That way I don't need to race change my existing ones. And I haven't really been playing my Paladin, and I have like a million fucking Paladins. Even on this server, I already have another 70 Paladin just on here. Um, but yeah, it's mostly these two characters, so I can quickly hop on and show my logs. Am I still ranked 2 for Vengeance? Let me double check. Uh, yeah. Still rank 2. I think. How, honestly, I'm surprised. Is that correct? How have I not been knocked down yet? Let me double check. Is that... That's all... Yeah. Um... I feel like that should be lower now, because I haven't played it in a few weeks. Uh, let's see... How do I do fucking rankings? Uh, okay, yeah. I, I think for whatever reason it's inaccurate. Where am I still for vengeance? Uh, definitely, yeah. Okay, it's fallen now. That makes more sense. I don't know why it hasn't been updated on my actual log page. It still shows rank 2, but... Um... I figure at this point, I haven't played it in so long. There's no fucking way. Okay, I'm still... I'm ranked 248 overall for tanks, and I don't know what number that is for Vengeance. I'm not going to count. But top 250 for tanks on a tank that I haven't played at this point in, like, almost a month. I'll take it. Um, but you can see my, my gear here. I'll hover over it in a second. Just bear with me. Um... All-star rankings and stuff. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, I have, like, uh, whatchamacallit, Echo of Notharian shoulders. This neck is kind of dog shit. I just haven't managed to get a better one. And in theory, like, if I were going to play this character more, I would just craft a 447 neck with more ideal stuff. But I just never got around to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I've given up on getting 447 Krog Tusks. I don't even care anymore. Like, if I was still playing this character, I'd be trying to fill my vaults. But... I, I'm not playing my Demon Hunter anymore. Fuck that. I had to bring it for a Sark on one week because our Havoc was out. Um, I also don't have a super optimized cape. This has mastery on it. Yuck. Uh, this is my one of my crafted chess pieces. Another crafted bracer. I have sockets on everything, so that's nice. You're just doing one vault a week on the characters you're not playing a ton? Yeah. I feel that. Uh, 450 gloves. That's off Sarkrath. Right? I'm pretty sure. Uh, and then obviously I catalyzed it. Uh, Sarkarath. Yeah, the, these things. So this is what it is, and I got that and catalyzed it. Um, I don't have this on my Demon Hunter, though I do have it on my Monk, I think. I'll have to... Well, I'll swap over to my Monk and show that afterwards, because I've gotten a decent amount of gear on it. And then, obviously, for crafting stuff, I'm still running Slimy Expulsion. Technically speaking, I think Double Shadow Fling Patch is a little bit ahead at the moment for Vengeance. It's a very minor increase, but considering I'm not playing this character, I'm not going to recraft my stuff. You do have it? Yeah, I, I could have sworn I did, but I forgot. This ring's pretty nuts, uh, so I got that one. Uh, and then I still have a, a Heroic Beacon, and... You were a little bitch at linked to you for four items on Sark when you reclared on Monk in the first week. Yeah. I did do that. Um, and then I also have Mythic Anvil. 
Uh, speaking of which, let's look at Monk. Yeah, my Monk has gotten absolutely stacked. So, like, if you think this gear is good, just fucking wait. The only thing my Monk does not have now to be, like, basically full bis is I, I do not have Digirun. I have lost the role on, like, three heroic Digirunes, and I have not gotten a Mythic Digirune yet. It just hasn't dropped. I'm pretty sure if it drops, it goes to me, because I don't think anybody actually needs it at this point. Um, technically, my Kotank has a Guardian Druid that he's gearing up, but I don't think he's really leaning to playing that. And he already said that if he it drops, he would rather my Monk have it, so. Um... A little not safe for work. Yeah, I guess it is kind of a lot not safe for work, but yeah. Uh, your monk needs beacon, digirune, 450 gloves, 450 belt, then it's completely full bis and nothing else you can get. Yeah, I did. I finally got beacon. So I got this last week. Uh, but yeah, so my monk has pretty much all the same shit, all socketed stuff. Um, so helm, I have a crafted neck. Uh, Neltharian shoulders, crafted cloak, crafted chest. Uh, this is the only thing that isn't technically perfect. Uh, the only reason I still have this is I got these bracers with avoidance, and I I didn't really feel like... Uh, at the time, I don't have enough aspect crests to get it. So right now... Uh, actually, technically, at the moment, I do. Uh, but at the time when I got this item... Uh, where is it? I do have, uh, yeah, needlessly complicated wrist guards. So I have double crit wrists with the engineering shit. And I was using this up until I got um, these off Kazara. But I figured since these already have avoidance in a socket, might as well just continue using this for now. Um, but I suppose getting the engineering res is probably nice. And now that I actually have the crests for it, I probably should do that, honestly. Um... I'm not going to do that right now, but at some point, I, I will replace these. Um, then I have gloves. So actually, I take it back. I'm missing Sark gloves on this character, which I, it's a three item level upgrade. Obviously, that would be nice, but it's beggars can't be choosers. I have the um, sock, uh, socketed Sark belt, pants, uh, slimy expulsion boots, and then I do have a socketed Diurna ring. I'm pretty sure that I'm meant to replace this with Ringbound Hourglass for any multi-target fight, but I um I started a simulation before I entered raid this past Tuesday, and the simulation only finished after raid ended because the simulation lasted like two and a half hours because I like had a million different like gem and enchant combinations, so I. Low key saw the simulation was done, told myself, oh, I got to check the results. And then I fell asleep and I forgot to actually compare it. So I'm just going to have to rerun that sim before raid next week and see. But I crafted this thing and I'm like, I'm probably supposed to replace Seal of Deirna's Chosen. And I just haven't yet, but I have it in my bags for when I need to. Um, and then for trinkets, as I showed, I have Mythic uh, Beacon. I got this this past week and Mythic Bomb Dispenser. These trinkets are busted. And I have a Leech Mythic Forge Storm. Uh, that was the first ever vault that my monk got. And I have Krog Tusks, which so many people are going to hate me. I also got this off my very first Underrock key at my monk, which was stupid. That That is like unreal RNG. I had to at least farm to get the ones I have on my Demon Hunter. My monk's luck has been kind of ridiculous. I started gearing this character like less than a month ago from... Uh, whatever I had left over in Vault of the Incarnates, and this is where I'm at, like, less than a month later. Honestly, raid drops have been fucking good to me, and it's really not like a lot of other people needed this, but considering this is the character I'm most likely going to be playing for uh, Amir Drassel, makes sense. Seal of Dierne is chosen. Um, probably want to drop some verse for Mast at this point. Yeah. No, you're absolutely correct. I, I think... Um, like, I have a decent amount of crit in verse. I definitely could drop for... Eh, I have a solid amount of mastery. Eh. I don't know. I'll have to sim it, but it's, um... It's close. I think, honestly, if anything, I would want to maybe get a little bit more crit. Like, drop a tiny bit of verse for a tiny bit more crit. 
um, just to beef that up. But, uh, yeah, I think dropping Seal of Deernish Chosen could help with that. Then there's still you with no Molten Heart. Oh, that's rough. At least take solace in the fact that it's getting gutted for a Mirror Drasil. So, the nice thing about, um, uh, like, healers is your Bish Trinket. You don't need to farm for Prog next tier. So far, we haven't heard anything about nerfs to Bomb Dispenser and Beacon. And these trinkets are currently so far ahead, Beacon especially, so far ahead for almost every single tank, that even if they nerf Beacon, what they might do is they might slap Beacon with a very light nerf to make it not good for DPS players. So, well, at least not good compared to next tier's trinkets. Right now, there is like a non-zero chance that I end up running these two trinkets on my Brewmaster all the way up to Farak Prog on Mythic. Honestly, I think there is a chance I kill Farak, cut, get Cutting Edge with these two trinkets still equipped. That is how, both how good they are and how weak a lot of the new options are. I've been testing a lot of them on the PTR, and basically, um, something I, you know what, why not? Uh, might as well at this point of the stream. Um, I'm going to hop onto the PTR real quick. Uh, what is. Uh, my battle net crashed. Okay, hold on. Let me just restart that. Uh, so yes, the stream is black. Whoa, spooky. Uh, I'm just switching to the PTR real quick. And then it'll be back to normal. Uh, but I just want to kind of quickly walk through the trinket since we're talking about it. And then I'll hop over to Wrath Classic because, you know, I was saying I was going to do that anyway. Um, Halloween themed overlay. Yeah. Uh, okay, is it showing now? Yeah, there we go. So I can hop onto my monk. Here's the Amir Drasil loading screen. I just, I straight up logged out in the middle of the raid after last raid testing. So I'm still sitting there. Um. Speaking of tanks, holy moly, you forgot how many buttons Brew has to press? Oh yeah. Playing Brewmaster right now is like playing the piano. It's a lot, for sure. Uh, not me crying right now because your server is dead for guilds that aren't roleplay and you can't even find a heroic one this late into the patch. Uh, you only resub because of your channel. Well, on the plus side, uh, you don't need to be in a guild on your server. Uh, rating is cross-server now. And in fact, uh, most guilds will gladly accept cross-server trials, so... I would actually recommend looking into that. Uh, you definitely don't need to be on the same server for that. Uh, Amir just saw loading screen is pretty as fuck. Oh yeah, definitely. Still find it funny how ridiculously complex Brewmaster Opener is compared to other tanks. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Hello, Dashi. Good to see you. Uh, less than a month. What the heck? And then, yeah, like Naomi said, I've been re-clearing full Mythic with a group of mostly geared BIS players. Um, yeah, pretty much nobody else needed all the items I was getting. Maybe a few people as, like, very minor upgrades. But also, it's one of those things where when it, it's pretty clear that I'm going to be playing Brewmaster for next year, like, that's almost completely set in stone unless we get some curveball where, like, Blood DK is ridiculously overpowered and a must-have. Uh, obviously, gearing my Brewmaster is a no-brainer. Compared to, like, if people haven't decided what they're playing, better to gear up a Brewmaster Monk than um, something that may not even be played for next tier. And, I, I mean, it's minor. It doesn't really matter that much anyway. Um, yeah, if you're doing Mythic Rating pre-Hall of Fame, but obviously I doubt that's the case here. Um, yeah, if you just came back and you're looking for your very first guild, or at least a, a new rating guild to join, pretty sure you're not in the running for Hall of Fame. Uh, so I, I didn't think that was worth mentioning, but you are technically correct. I guess if you are doing active mythic progression beforehand, but um, I mean, what you could do is honestly right now, just look for a guild. And if you end up really liking them and they're a guild that you want to run with, just transfer over uh, for Amir Jusil whenever you get to mythic. I think that's what a lot of people will do. Uh, let's see. It's likely both of us will be running those trinkets until Farrakh and Raid purely due to it, meaning others can take. Yeah, exactly. Like, unless one of the trinkets gives, like, a disproportionately large advantage to tanks. Like, for instance, um, 
a lot of the tanks who really wanted Anvil, I think, got priority on that over DPS because, generally speaking, while there were a lot of DPS specs that got value out of Anvil, um, the tanks that want it get a disproportionately larger bonus from that. So there are some exceptions, of course. Uh, and honestly, I think Beacon, generally, people pry out of tanks. I got the first Beacon back in Occasional Excellence, and God knows they weren't trying to help me out, but I think they knew that it was the better play. And I even in this guild's uh, Void, right, um, they pry out me the Mythic Sark Beacon over DPS players who still have a heroic one just because, you know, for a tank, it is a significantly larger increase. Uh, but right now, and I, this is kind of what I went on the PTR to show, right, a lot of the trinkets are... There's some good trinkets on here, but the benefit to a tank is, like, either very low or um, significantly worse than a DPS. Like, Ashes of the Ember Soul, there are some tanks that I think will maybe want to use this. Definitely not Brewmasters. Absolutely not. Uh, this is terrible for them. But... Tanks that have like a heavy emphasis on burst windows that also get a lot of scaling from their stats and don't necessarily mind the whole haste thing, this is a pretty good trinket for them. However, by that I'm talking like, I guess Prop Paladin would probably really want this trinket. Uh, Prop Paladin, Guardian Druid probably wants this. Um, does, uh, thing is, at the moment, Blood Decay just scales so poorly. This is a trinket that like, Sepulchre, the first one's Blood DK would have liked, but I think at the moment, like, they get too much power from external sources that they are kind of in a Brewmaster situation where I don't think they'd get enough out of this to make it worth it. Um, but like, definitely Prop Paladin, Bear Druid, and maybe Prop Warrior. Uh, Vengeance DH, eh. So, Vengeance DH, um, in the current tier, I would say so, but... With Vengeance losing its burst window, really, next patch, definitely they won't. Because you have to remember their playstyle is changing. And their playstyle is moving away from the fiery brand burst window. If this was, like, existing right now, this would definitely be good for Vengeance for their, like, fiery brand burst. But considering that is really not how it's going to play, I would say Vengeance is going to go back to... Vengeance used to be, in its old iterations, a little bit less bursty. Um... Like, Legion was all absolutely that, like, on use, you stack it with Fiery Brand. And then, um, in terms of, like, Trinket usage, Brewmasters and uh, Vengeance DHs basically had the exact same Trinket priority for, like, almost all of BFA and Shadowlands, because they were both similar in that they didn't gain as much from stats, and they also both wanted crit first. Nowadays, Vengeance gets more from Haste. It used to not really get a lot from Haste, um... It wanted some haste more than Brewmaster did. It wasn't a useless stat. Uh, but nowadays, um, Verse is lower on the priority. You forgot Vengeance DH is being removed from the game. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Um, as for some of the other ones, uh, this trinket is not that good. Um, so this trinket is effectively meant to be like the new... A lot of people are calling it the new Oathstone. So this thing uh, of Ominous Chromatic Essence... I've seen people comparing this trinket to Ominous Chromatic Essence. I don't really think you can make a one-to-one -one comparison, because this is like the group buff trinket. This, on first read, looks like that, which I think is why people compare it. But effectively, this is just a single, like, non-interactive, so it doesn't have the whole group buff aspect. It's just a rotating um, mastery crit verse buff. And you don't have any control over this. So, you'll need a 6 tank now to replace it. Hey, Evoker tank, Shaman tank, Rexar hunter tank. I'd be down with any of those. Some sort of male user tank, really. Um, Brewmaster looks to be using Cheat Death Trinket plus Gift of Ursine Vengeance and Keys. Maybe Mythic Frock Trinket over the Gift of Ursine Vengeance, maybe not. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Gift of Ursine Vengeance, the damage of this got nerfed. Um... It's definitely better on, like, a lot of targets where you can actively benefit from, like, ba basically you have constant ICD on this thing. So Mythic Plus, this is significantly better than Raid. Uh, I tried using this for part of Raid tank raid uh, testing, and it's not a bad trinket, but it's just, you don't really get that much value out of it. It's like, it's fine. Honestly, as far as tank trinkets go, this is, like, my favorite type of tank trinket design. 
where it does damage and it's like it's good it has survivability benefits too it doesn't have any like garbage stats it's just flat agility right this is how you design a good tank trinket aside from cheat death trinkets which obviously cheat death trinkets are you know, they are what they are right they have a specific use case and if you need one you need one um but for generic tank trinkets there's so many bad ones this is how you design it i love this type of trinket uh honestly ferox tainted rage heart is another good example of a tank trinket i think this one is a little bit weird just because it doesn't really actually save you that much health i think the emergency shield when needed is okay but like it burns itself out so fast that really this is like a dps trinket masquerading as a tank trinket it's a very minor survivability boost. It, you mostly run it for damage. Um, is the head enchant usable on heirlooms? Chori. Oh, Chori, that is a disgusting thought. I can't believe I've never considered that. <laughs> oh my god. Wait, let's try that shit. Uh... Hold up. Uh, which bag is it? There we go. Oh, no way. Oh, that's gonna get fucking nerfed. <laughs> oh my god. Um. Oh, well, I'm, it's a plate item. Hold up. Uh. Let me double check. Because the question is, when you equip it, do you gain the effect? Oh my god, you do. <laughs> oh, that's so disgusting. <laughs> okay, yeah, there is absolutely no way that stays. But that's funny. Uh, delete the video after. Oh my god. Um, honestly, this is the kind of thing I do not mind getting fixed. While it would be hilarious to have, like, raid enchants like that, this is... Uh, so, you can see here, this is... um. We had a lot of wipes on Tindril's Sage Swift. So let, let's take a look at uh, Agira. So this was our best Agira testing poll from this past Friday. And you can take a look at my damage overall. Beacon's still absolutely crushing. Uh, you know, the usual suspects in terms of monk abilities. Uh, I actually, I tried running the Farrakh weapon. I think the Farrakh weapon, it hasn't like significantly improved at all, but they did nerf... Uh, they nerfed Thorncaller Claw by quite a lot. So it's still a good weapon, but it's nowhere near as overpowered as it was before. And you lose stats by taking this now, unfortunately. Uh, it used to have the full budget. Now it doesn't, unfortunately. Uh, so overall, I actually think the Farrakh weapon is now better. So I was running that. It does solid damage, right? 3.5. Uh, it's about as much as like a Glacial Fury. And um, Beacon aside, you know, yeah. Uh, and then if you go down to Trinkets, Earthsign Reprisal. <laughs> so, Earthsign Reprisal for Raid, it's just not quite good. But like Naomi said, I can definitely see it being very, very, very good in M+. I mean, I used it in M+, before, and it was very good. So, I'm not even saying I, I can see it. I tried it, and it's very strong. Um, trink cheat Death Trinkets introduced one in the expansion, and it's the meta tank trinket for the rest of the expansion and keys. Yeah, definitely. Make a level 10 and mail it over. Yeah. Uh, it's probably disabled in lower levels. Um, that's a good point. Yeah, I should try that. Um, that is a, a good thing to test. Uh, okay, so I have... I have my level 60 rogue. This was from the other day. So I can test it on level 60s. I can also create a new... Let's go, go with like a High Mountain Torrent Monk. Helm test. Uh, okay, so... I'll create two of them. I'll mail one to the level 60, one to the level 10, and see if it works on them. If it's disabled on level 10s, it might actually be intentional. Uh, in which case, if it works on level 60s, that could be huge. And in fact, I wouldn't even really care if they did that. That would actually be a bit more reasonable. And pretty fun. Needs to be fixed, but it's kind of hilarious and you'll abuse the fuck out of it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, it's it's really good. Um, 
Oh, if you're doing higher keys with big pulls, I assume you're talking about Ursine. Yeah, but on the topic of the, the Helm Enchant, which was what I was mostly talking about, um, where is it here? Uh, Blazing Rage. It actually, it didn't do very well, that pull. Uh, let me find, what was our best Volcaros pull? Uh, let's go 326. I was playing around with a, diff a few different uh, trinkets and stuff over the course of raid testing, so... Volcaros, 326, obviously Beacon's still popping off. By this point, I had switched to the Frock trinket, so I would say the trinket that has the highest potential is this thing, Ferox, um Augury of Primal Flame. Problem about Augury of Primal Flame. Well, this is definitely absolutely bonkers for Brewmaster and likely many other tanks as well. It is also very good for a lot of DPS. And I would say a lot of DPS, unlike Beacon, would actually get probably disproportionately more value out of this thing. This is definitely a Brewmaster's wet dream, for sure. But I don't know if it gets prior to tanks, which is why I think tanks will still end up using uh, Beacon and something else. For Monks, definitely Beacon Bomb Dispenser all the way up through Farrakh, just because you want to prio your very rare overpowered trinkets to DPS. Uh, just like Barter Bricks, it'll be hot fixed four hours after the patch goes live. Exactly. Couldn't find all effects of the enchant. There's a page with that in any place. Um, so the enchants... Uh, you can read it here. This is the tank one. Taking damage is a chance to f uh, fill you with Blazing Rage, blah, 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 and it shields you for the damage dealt. Damage increase per enemy struck up to five. Um, so yeah, it's, it's pretty good. I also, I started using the Serpent Trinket at, like, I think early pulls of Volcaros. What was I using on this pull? Was I already using, um, yeah, I was already using it there. Uh, what was I using on this pull of Agira? Uh, I was still using Ursine Reprisal. Did we have any Tendril pulls go over a minute? Tendril's fucking brutal, man. Jesus. Uh... Yeah, I started using the Serpent Trinket towards the end, and it didn't really do a whole lot. Uh, anyways. What was I saying? Oh yeah, I need to apply the enchant to another helmet. So take this, drop it here. And... It's... Mailing it to go helm test. All right, let's take a look. Uh, but yeah, as for the other trinkets, I'll go through them one by one after we test this just to show. There's some decent options there. There's also a really broken healer trinket. So, um, what's it called? Uh, the seedling trinket, there's one where you, like, you plant a seedling and you heal it up and it, like, explodes. And one of the healers in my group for Council of Dreams was running that, and they were doing a ridiculous amount of healing with it. I don't know if it works with every single uh, healing spec, but that one, uh, the healers in my group were talking about how it's apparently, like, the standout healing trinket so far. Which I think maybe a lot of people won't love, but... The seedling trinket was broken in a bad way, now it's broken in a good way, yeah. It, it'll get nerfed, though. It's, um... I, yeah, I did hear that it used to bug out and die. It'll probably get nerfed. Uh, oh. Oh my god, it works. <laughs> okay. Well, that's definitely getting fixed. Uh, there is absolutely no chance... What is, what is 48 shadow damage relative to... Yeah, basically every single time this procs, it deals um, the equivalent of a free blackout kick or bonus damage uh, split between multiple... Enemies. Yeah, that's broken for like just an enchant. That's like going to be more cracked than elemental force. Oh boy. And obviously it's a helm enchant, which is just free real estate because normally you can't put anything on a helm. 
Yeah, no, the damage is scaled for sure, but like that is just everything is going to be applied, like have a scaling thing applied to it, uh, just because that's just how that thing works. I just don't know if it's intentional that you get like the special helm enchant to work on alts. Honestly, if they do that, I wouldn't be against it. Um, it would definitely create a little bit of a barrier to entry for speedrunning and stuff because that helm enchant would be massive. And it would be a little bit problematic for speedruns because you need to actually progress through the raid to unlock it. This is not a complete free thing. Um, in order to get that helm enchant, you need to complete like a raid quest line within the raid, like kill raid bosses, etc. So that would make it a little bit weird for people to acquire. I don't hate it, but I have a feeling it's not intentional. Let me just go with all. Uh, test on dummy. I, I like it. I will test it on a dummy closer to release if it actually seems like it's unfixed by like the final week. But at this point, there's a good chance that it, it just happens. Um, test if you can enchant a BOE helm without making it bind to you. Uh, I don't even know where I would get a BOE helm on the PTR. Uh, I guess probably off of, like, Vendor or something? Uh... I Yeah, I suppose I could craft one. I just don't have any on... Here, this'll do. Serviceable. Alright, well, you can enchant it to anything. Uh... Well... That's interesting. Yeah, that feels... that th There's no way that this is finalized. Um, yeah, it, it definitely works. This is definitely still bind on equip. Uh, yeah, that that's really, really, really dumb. There's no way they let that slide. So that is definitely going to get changed. Literally, no doubt. The... The BOA one, eh, I, I could see it go either way. So we know the moment you get the helm enchant, you got to enchant all possible helms. True. Yeah. In case they change it. They could also just break it on helms. Definitely. Oh, yeah. There's absolutely no way that makes it to life. That would be so broken. Uh, it's... No. So... There are some enchants that bind the item when you use it, but a lot of enchants won't actually bind the item. You can actually buy enchanted items off the auction house. This one is different, though, because this is an enchant that you specifically have to get by clearing the raid. And it's a permanent use enchant. So that would mean the moment that somebody unlocks this, they could just apply it to like a million helms and throw them in the auction house. Yeah, there's no way. Absolutely no way that works. Uh-oh. Yeah, sub-bind items don't bind items. It should, though. This most likely will. But yeah, okay, so trinkets. Uh, this one I don't think is going to be very good. Based on all of the testing I've done across all iterations, this trinket has been just laughably bad. Every raid has one trinket that's just, like, not very good at all. I actually think, surprisingly, almost every single... Avarice Trinket saw some use? Well, not this one. Enduring Dreadplate is... I mean, Tank Trinkets, it is not uncommon for there to be bad Tank Trinkets. Um, and, like, obviously that didn't get picked. These two got picked. Uh, this Trinket is broken. Chaos Grapnel, I don't know. Is this anyone's Biss? I know it's at least good for a lot of people. So I wouldn't call that useless. Obviously, Rashlock's Molten Heart. You see Enduring tread, tread Plate on every Pug Tank when you join raids? Oh yeah. That is always painful. You just It's like a clear sign of like, this guy has no idea what he's doing if he runs Enduring Dread Plate. And that's generally how it goes with Tank Trinkets, though. Tank Trinkets are just like a, a badge that says, I have no idea what I'm doing, and have been for many, many years, in most cases. Uh... 
You tell them, remember to equip a second trinket because there's 376 trinkets for 300 gold in the AH that are better. Yeah, stamina gems. Oh, God. Yeah, don't remind me. I can't believe they still make stamina gems. Stamina gems literally exist in this game so that people who don't understand stat priorities put them in their gear and fuck themselves over. There is no other reason for them to exist. They have absolutely no purpose. It is just... I don't know why Blizzard keeps making them. It's not like they have literally any use case in this game whatsoever. It's just to bait noob tanks into making bad gearing choices. Um, the Serpent Idol looks bis with the stat trinket for Enhancement Shamans. Really? What is it about Enhancement Shamans that makes the Serpent... Um, that makes the Serpent uh, trinket really good for them? Is it just it happens to proc a lot for them? Or... I don't know. I'm curious. Uh, you may have run Enduring Dreadplate to replace your 270 open world trinket. Fair. But honestly, there are a lot of open world trinkets that I would run over Enduring Dreadplate. It's... It is not useless. There have been worse tank trinkets. Enduring Dreadplate is just really, really not great. Especially compared to a lot of other options. Um, How many people actually use Igneous Flowstone? Because, like, I remember literally days before the patch came out, this was BIS for a lot of people. And they gutted it. And I'm curious if it actually ended up being run by anybody after it got completely gutted. Uh, you used stamina gems to run the mega dungeon at 400 item level. You were the tankiest hunter. Um... Yeah, I mean, the only reason I could see to run Stamina Gems is to trick people into not looking at your your health. Like, if you, somebody sees your health and they see that it's really low, maybe you can dupe them with Stamina Gems and be like, ah, they think I'm geared. Really, I just have, like, a full Stamina Gem in every single socket. That is the only advantage I could see. I don't really think it would meaningfully help your survivability at all. Like I said, it's just bait. Um... I am curious if, uh, are there any, like, casters that run this Igneous Flowstone? Um, I'm scanning through stuff. It doesn't seem like a lot of people run it. It's also just weird, because, like, we're in a tier where, like, things like Vessel of Searing Shadow and Ominous Chromatic Essence and Rock Crusted Voodoo Doll and other shit exist. So, uh, oh, speaking of earlier, I mentioned, um, my, uh, disc or, uh, my battle net community and somebody actually just typed in my battle net community for the first time in over a month. So there you go. This is why I have it. Uh, I was going to try to use party sync for some shadowlands. Uh, hope crusher is still crushing my hopes. Activated Party Sync, dropped down to level 61, but didn't change to a different phase. Everyone else camping, Hope Crusher was still standing next to me. Turned off Party Sync, went back up to level 70, and I didn't phase. Am I missing something? Yes. Party Sync has no effect on your phase. All it does is scale down your level, and... Oh, wait, is he Party Syncing in Chromie time? If it's chromy time, then party sync shouldn't actually have any effect. Level and put you on the same quests. I.e. the start of the zone as whoever you're in the group with. If you're trying to phase with other players, if you're trying to phase into chromy time, make sure your alt is the group leader, and sends the invite. It helps if they're in the same zone. Shadowlands might also just be buggy. Haven't tested it there. All right, typed out a response to the person. Uh, let's see. 
Triple socketed neck with Stam Verse gems. Oh boy. Stam gem increases touch of death damage. Clearly bis for monk. <laughs> it's actually funny. That is probably the only use case in which it's not completely worthless. True. Um... Troy said, you can party sync a max level character to Chromie Time if somebody in the party has it enabled. Uh, the problem is, Shadowlands doesn't have a Chromie Time phase. Does it not? How does Shadowlands not have a Chromie Time phase? You're saying open world Shadowlands is the exact same as Chromie Time? Honestly, I've never tried it because... Literally, why would you ever level in Shadowlands? It's actually terrible, but not tested. Okay, yeah. Um, it's an interesting thought. Um, honestly, I haven't tried that trick in a while. The last time I tried it was when I was farming um, Falling Flame. So I have my video on the subject. I believe it's unlisted at this point, but... Like, I could go back and refer to that to see exactly what steps you take, because I documented it. Um, but I'm fuzzy on the exact details, but I'm 99% sure your character needs to be in Chromie Time and then Party Synced if you're in a different zone. But theoretically, if you're in the same zone in Chromie Time and you invite somebody, um, I guess, yeah, because Party Sync wouldn't immediately phase, but it's a tough call. I'm not sure. Uh, I would say there's a good chance they also forgot to turn Chromie Time on. Because, um, actually, you know what? Let me just say that. Uh, double check that the alt you're inviting with actually has Chromey Time enabled, just to be sure. Because, yeah, at the end of the day, I've received so many people uh, who are like, I, I can't level in this zone, blah, 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 blah. I'm running into all these issues. And I'm like, did you turn on crummy time? And then I get a response like five hours later. It's like, oh, fuck, you solved it. And yeah, it's, it's that easy. Most of the time <laughs> I've found that seems to be the biggest issue. It's like the World of Warcraft equivalent of have you tried turning it off and on back again? So, yeah. But yeah, they nuked Shadowlands leveling. Uh, let's see, they responded. You were trying for Chromie Time, not sure the alt is the group leader, so you have to give it another shot. Was hoping it'd be easy as parking the Chromie Time alt in Storm and Org and then running all your errands. Um. Uh, you can check by looking at the level of the zones. In theory, if it Scaled you down to 61. It should be working. But just double check that the ranges on all zones, including non-Shadowlands ones, are also scaling to 61. Also, to be fair, since I have not personally tested the trick in Shadowlands content. It could be broken for that. It could be broken for that. Yeah, I'll just think of that. Um, there's no need to be in the same zone. Yeah, I didn't think so. But it, my memory on it is fuzzy, like I said. Uh, anyways, yeah, other trinkets. Obviously, I guess Word of Faceless Liar sees some use. Not really by tanks, but healers use this a little bit. Um, I'm pretty sure all of these receive some use in some shape or form. And then, duh. So, most trinkets in Avarice had some use case. Amir Drasil... Uh, let's see. Actually, I'm curious. Did Naomi, did you explain the serpent thing? Because I remember I asked, but yeah, I don't know if you explained why it was good. Uh, yeah, the Power Causal Fragments are also pretty good. Doomhammer Shalomane are both very strong, yeah. Uh, so, so far in this tier, we have Branch of the Tormented Ancient. I haven't tried this one because it's strength only, can't really speak to it. The Agira Trinket, this thing is okay, but it has not really impressed me a ton. 
And Volkaros, obviously, aside from what Naomi said, uh, generally, this does not impress me. Uh, this necklace I'm excited for. They haven't changed it yet, so it's still crit verse with a juicy proc. That is like a brewmaster's wet dream right there. Very, very, very nice. Uh, obviously, these two trinkets are looking pretty solid. Honestly, I don't think a lot of people are going to be running Friendship Badge, but there'll be some, for sure. Uh, this is the seed, the really broken healer trinket. Plant the seed, and then, you know, healing the seedling also heals up to five injured allies, etc. Um... The legendary trinkets are the clear go-to. You need two weeks for that? What do you mean you need two weeks? Aksara Luna. Uh, I'm not sure what you're referring to. Because if you're talking about like Doomhammer Shalamane, you, you don't need two weeks for that. You just farm time rips for like three hours. Yeah. Um... Oh, yeah, all good, all good. Yeah, honestly, between Drogbar Rocks and those, it's pretty easy. Like, I mentioned both of them in my catch-up guide. It's completely free for anybody who wants to get that. It's a little bit harder for... Um, for casters, you don't have as many great free options because you don't have Drogbar Rocks and stuff. Uh... Well, let me just finish responding to the, the guy in the uh, battle net thing. Thanks. Glad you found the videos helpful. All right, there you go. Uh, what else? This one seems good, I guess. There's also this staff, which is a little bit weird. Weird effect on a caster staff. Um... Yeah, so this trinket is going to be ridiculously broken. Uh, oh, your brain thought they were connected to the weekly time-rich vendor item. Gotcha. And yeah, uh, this trinket is so weird. Um, so this is kind of like Anvil, in that as the fight goes on, you get more stacks of it, which, like, it gives ramping damage. Except, in addition to doing ramping damage, it also gets, like, bonus effects at certain breakpoints, including, like, slight AoE. But this takes so long to actually stack up over the course of a fight that the fight needs to be, like, close to 10 minutes for this to be reaching its maximum potential. So maybe on, like, a final boss, like, for Rock, if we get another Sylvanas-esque final boss, I don't want to preach that into an existence. I don't want to speak that into existence, but... If we look at Farak, he has stage one, first intermission, stage two, um, stage three. He technically only has four phases. Razageth had, what, five? But I don't know. Uh, we'll see. I could see Farak being a 10 minute fight. Tindral, I think, is like an eight minute boss. Tindral is uh, on a pretty set timer. The mythic mechanics extend the fight a little bit longer than usual. It's around the 7 or 8 minute timer, though. But I don't really think there's any other fights where you would really be able to get the maximum value out of the small Duran Trinket. It has interesting uses in M+, though, because assuming you're chain pulling, because um, I'm pretty sure, yeah, it takes... Um, Fire starter decays every 5 seconds while out of combat and fades entirely after 15 seconds. So that presumably means that every 5 seconds you lose, you lose 5 stacks. So that's a little bit punishing because that means that even if it takes you like 10 seconds to get into combat, you still lose 10 of your stacks. So this would be really broken if you could like routinely chain pull across an entire M plus dungeon after get, reaching full stacks. But they've kind of like prevented you from doing that. Uh, for the Serpent Idol thing, it's just been doing the most damage for Enhancement Shamans and testing as well as Sims. Um, they may have already changed that. Gotcha, yeah. <sighs> Hard to say for sure. I don't, I don't know. Could just be a weird Sim thing. Um, But you said in testing as well, so yeah. Maybe they just proc it a lot for whatever reason. Uh, this is basically Beacon, but for casters. It has Intellect on it. And then we've already looked at the Farak Trinkets. There's a pretty solid healing one. There is the crit one. This trinket is very, very strong. 
And this one is interesting, for sure. Uh, yeah, but that, that's pretty much it for the trinkets. One thing I'm curious about, I don't think they've updated it, but... Let's look at... Um, Black Rick Hold Mythic Plus. So... They've added a a weapon to Black Rick Hold. Just one. Ravencrest's Wrath. Sick model. It's a, uh, a two-handed strength sword that has haste verse. Alright, neat. And Darkheart Thicket. We've got in another one-handed uh, strength weapon. No other weapons that I can see. And uh, something I was curious to look at for Warlords of Draenor. Okay, so this is the final Mythic Plus uh, pool of stuff from Wad. So we have an Intellect Staff, uh, another Intellect Weapon, intellect three Intellect Weapons in one dungeon. Yuck. Uh, so there's some decent stuff here. I'm not going to look at each and every one of these items. Um, intellect Trinket with a Crit Proc. Uh, mastery with a... Huh. Interesting. I think that's new. I don't think one of those was Agi. I'm not sure. It could be unintentional. Um, I feel like this Trinket design is new. I don't remember it doing this. But this is basically an on-use shield on a player. Uh, no, you're correct, Naomi. I just, I don't remember if they changed that. It is weird. I just don't know if that was always like that or new. Uh, this trinket looks neat, obviously, for, like, healers. Uh, Spores of Alacrity is... Oh, fuck. Did not mean to click on that. Whatever. Um, Spores of Uh, okay, there we go. Okay, that was weird. Um, yeah, sorry about that. I'm reopening PTR. I closed the PTR to check to see if it was a memory leak. It wasn't. Um, you guys can hear me now, right? I, it shows in OBS that it's working. I just want to be sure. Yeah. Um, NVIDIA broadcast crashed, apparently. I tested a few things because I had to, I turned my microphone off and on. I unplugged my microphone, plugged it back in. Uh, I unplugged it from my computer and then plugged it back in instead of, like, from the connector cable. None of that fixed it. And then I'm like, is it, like, my audio software? And somehow, NVIDIA broadcast crashed. And because my microphone's going through there, that's what caused it. Uh, that sucks. Um, that Triton could affect is new. It used to just have a verse proc and attacks. Yeah. 
I thought that's what it was. I hear you beeping and shit. Yeah, I, I guess those were system sounds, so it makes sense that that's what, um, that it picked up. Uh, interesting. Yeah, that, that is odd. I, I don't know why it, it crashed and it didn't, like, give me a pop-up or anything saying it crashed. It just turned off in the background without any notice. I also didn't touch it at all, so weird. Very, very weird. Anyways, let's continue looking at those trinkets. So, Everbloom, uh, Ancient Protectors, yeah, this is the, the trinket, and then, oh man, they kept a stamina trinket in here? Oh. Well, yeah, this one's going to be garbage. Like, they could have at least, it's a neat effect. There's a chance to call Zeratax Brood to your aid. I also think it's interesting that they added the Zeratax trinket to Yalnu. But this is like a, an Absorb proc trinket. Why can't they just give this fucking Agi strength? That's annoying. Eh, oh well. Uh, I'm also curious to see what do they do for Throne of the Tides. Yeah, I remember they changed that one for sure. Um, Balanced Shell Buckler. I assume that was always there crit haste we still need a crit verse agi one-hander i don't know if we'll actually end up getting one we'll see um is genosaur blood yeah that's just a crit proc that hasn't changed at all uh okay yeah so this is all the same this is all the same and okay here we go Huh. This was the one that gave dodge, I think. So, Agi, your melee attacks have a chance to shed a limb, granting you mastery and avoidance. Interesting that they now have it give avoidance in addition to dodge. Or instead of dodge. Uh, well, that's definitely not going to be good for Brewmasters, but that's neat, I suppose. It's better than nothing. And what do we get here? Might of the Ocean. Yeah, I think this one they basically just copy-pasted. It. It's just flat crit, gain a strength buff. And what does Sea Star do? Flat verse, your spells have a chance to increase your intellect. That's actually good for Brewmaster, you think? Mastery proc? I guess. Yeah, I, I suppose. In, in keys, I could see that. Fair. Um... It also, I mean, it depend, depends on the proc rate. You know, it could be an absolutely terrible proc rate, and then we don't want anything to do with it. Have they changed Nullification Ember in Legion? I doubt they're actually updating the Legion loot, but I can dream. Um, <laughs> this is, like, still one of the worst trinkets ever made. It's, I mean, I take it back. It's not that bad, because, like... At least it gives Agi and Verse, but this is such a weird trinket. Proc and Isolation is a good proc. Um, yeah. For sure, for sure. Mago's Seventh Spine. I'm guessing they've, they're have they keeping that as is, but... One thing that bugs me is they haven't added the other weapons. I want to see what they're adding to... Uh, Darkheart Thicket and uh, Black or Cold, because there's no way it's just one weapon per. It's got to be at least two or three. Especially for a four boss dungeon in both cases, we're definitely getting uh, at least two more weapons for each one. Oh, right, your last message, but the silence. Uh, I mean. Oh, sorry. I'm like yawning like crazy. I remember people saying that back in Legion, but. They... I mean, it's the trinket's been in the game for a while now, and I've just never seen a use case for it. It it's just not good enough to justify. Seems like a PvP trinket or something. A little bit, yeah. It, it the it's definitely always been that way. I know because it used to give reduced stats. You used to have to pay stats for this effect, um, and like. I mean, in a sense, no, I guess you don't need to anymore. I was going to say it looked like it was low, but yeah, I I did think at some point they made it, so it, it is just a verse stat stick. So 
I guess being a verse stat stick is not the worst thing ever. A verse stat stick with a free niche proc on it, but it's just such a weird trinket. It used to be absolutely god awful. Now it's just a verse stick. Um, there's no use case where it's worth it over other trinkets, but that's also because other trinkets are ridiculously powerful. Yeah, definitely trinkets have. I don't know if I'd say recently they've gone up in power a lot, but they've definitely printed a lot of very powerful trinkets as of late. That is for sure. Uh, anyway, I think that takes a look at all of that stuff. So, let me hop over to Wrath Classic, and I'll play that for a bit. I think instead of leveling today on Wrath Classic, yeah, Beacon is definitely a good example. I'm going to do the hard mode dungeons like I said I would. At least two of them. I'm going to do just... Well, I'll do Oculus just for my daily. And... There we go. And, okay. So now, yes. Cool. Uh, at the end, I'll showcase just some of the leveling stuff they've added. That makes leveling quality of life so much better. But... Uh, I think I'll do most of my leveling probably in a separate video i do want to make a leveling about uh wrath classic or i don't know what i just words that just came i want to make a leveling video about wrath classic because i think right now the changes are awesome and i just kind of want to level some characters and try to like start getting practice for potentially doing speed runs in the future and i also want to like show people some of the cool like things that you can do to optimize your leveling even if it is like a little bit min maxi uh, but okay, so, have I gotten, I'm just gonna use my Hearthstone, get back to Dalaran. Um, but, yeah, Gamma Dungeons are so fucking good for, uh, for farming. Honestly, in terms of gold making right now, Gamma Dungeons are ridiculous, because I assume that's what I'm gonna find when I open my mailbox. I'm guessing that's sold. Uh, yep, there we go. So... Obviously, I've been getting a lot of Abyss Crystals and stuff. I got a BOE that sold, not for a lot. Um, but then you have this, right? So, Primordial Serenite. I've been just buying it nonstop with um, all of my Defiler Scourge Stones. Because, well, there are a few upgrades I can get. I'm uh, 558 or 5, 5586 gear score. And I have a few minor upgrades that I could get from the currency. Also, uh, I'll throw myself in queue. Specifically, every single day, I do the Oculus once. The Oculus gives bonus of the currency because Blizzard wants to encourage people to run it. So, considering how easy it is... Oh, wow, that was a fast queue. Uh, shit. I need to grab my daily quests first before I actually do this. Um, there we go. I also need to remember to do this quest, the uh, Obsidian Sanctum one, before I forget. Alright, yeah, so you get bonus currency for doing this, and I specific queue for it every single day, because, like, why not? Alright, buff up, throw wisdom on you. Oh, somebody gave him... I guess he doesn't need might? I'll give you might, and there we go. And then I always drop a fish feast. Why not? Uh, yes. Best combo for dragons is two ruby, two emerald, one amber. I'll get one ruby. In that way. I, like, if they don't want to go with that, and a lot of people will just say fuck it and pick, um multiple ambers anyway, but I figure this way, uh, at the very least, if they want to listen to my strategy, they can, and look go smoothly. These guys actually, so far, this is like the most cooperative I've ever seen. I This morning, uh, before I started doing prep for the stream when I woke up, uh, because it was just before reset, I did my Oculus for yesterday, and... When I entered the dungeon, I posted exactly that. Like, best combo is, you know, two ruby, two emeralds, uh, one amber. And there was a mage in my group who said, 
who cares? The dungeon's easy anyway. And I'm like, I mean, you don't need to follow my strategy. I All I did was say what the best combo is and that, you know, it'll be easier. And he's like, just pull. And by this point, mind you, I had already started pulling the next group of mobs. So, you know, it was a stupid thing for him to say anyway. But the entire dungeon, he was just acting like indignant. And there was one point where he went the wrong way. And he was, like, sitting at the wrong pack of trash. And I said, you know, the, the trash is back here. Like, we went the wrong way. And then he typed, uh, ZZZ in chat as if it was, like, my fault that he went to the wrong direction. Like, I don't know. Some people are just fucking weird in groups. I'm also gonna fucking divine plea here. Because these whelps just do a fucking beating on the group. One nice thing, though. So for anybody who did the hard mode dungeons last patch... You might notice the whelps are no longer spawning mirror images. So that is one really, really nice quality of life change, because previously, if you pulled all the whelps and they spawned mirror images at the exact same time, and every single mirror image cast arcane missiles at the same player, like in one moment, there was basically nothing you could do. That person was just completely fucked. So the fact that they just removed the ability for those to spawn images at all is really nice. This was the only case in which this affix was actually remotely difficult. And it was kind of an outlier considering the whelps are meant to be just generic weak trash mobs. But when you have a lot of them in a single pull, it obviously causes like a little bit of a snowball effect. It's like a trash mobs applying bursting or something when they shouldn't be. Uh, yo... Then we have the first boss. Also. Uh, I mean like the experiments trash. Yeah, kinda. Pretty much just like that. Uh, everybody's here. Perfect. Let me find... Um, there was a message earlier that I noticed and I didn't read just yet because I have a lot to say on it. And I wanted to wait until we've caught up on everything else uh, to read that message. I forget who sent it. Gonna move away from the active explosion. Um, can't find it. Uh, I remember what the message was, so technically speaking, I could just, like, talk about my thoughts on it. But I want to at least give credit to the person who, should, like, mentioned it and was like, Hey, what are your thoughts on this? Because I think it was a good question. So I'm going to be grabbing this. Um... There we go. Um, shit, it's gotta be in here somewhere. Oh yeah, Mateus Nunes said, Do you think Farrakh will be the final boss of the expansion? Um, I found it. Okay. So, this is a bit of a weird one. I've been saying for a while now that there is absolutely no chance that patch 10.2 is the final patch of Dragonflight. And I've been saying that because I think I'm pretty justified in my argument that 10.2 would make no sense as the final patch of Dragonflight. So I will amend what I said before. I think there is, unfortunately, an actually non-zero chance that 10.2 is the final patch of Dragonflight. Like, a, a good chance based on everything we've seen. However, it makes absolutely no sense. There is no way that this is the end of Dragonflight. In fact, I would actually argue that if Farrakh is the final boss of Dragonflight, it'll be the most unfinished expansion we've ever had. More so than WAD, more so than BFA, uh, Shadowlands, etc. Because, well, uh, follow me. This is something that always trips people up. Everybody always just keeps running down the ring and they forget that there's groups of trash you need to kill over here. This way. Turn around. Yep. I always try to say... 
And they're just sitting there at the next trash pack. There we go. Now they realized. People always forget about this. Um. Oh, we got a bunch of dragons over here. Um. Yeah, so like, Shadowlands obviously was extremely rushed. But Shadowlands at least got an ending. And they actually wrapped it up fairly okayly, all things considered. I know okayly is not a word, but fuck it, whatever. Um, fairly decently words. Um, so, it was fine. Warlords of Draenor, they definitely cut a lot of content, but they cut a lot of content and then skipped to the final patch. And they've done that before, but also, those are the only two times. It's been WAD and Shadowlands. This is why I hate when people say, there is a precedent for there only being three raid tiers. There is a precedent in the two worst expansions in terms of, like, player retention. So whenever people try to say that it's the norm to have four raid tiers, I'm like, are you insane? The only expansions in which it was a norm to only have three raid tiers and not four is in the worst expansions. Like, comparing it to that is baffling. But also, those expansions were at least smart enough to wrap up what they were doing. So, I really... I, I don't know. I think the odds of there being no 10.3 are very low. But I cannot deny it's a possibility, considering all the stuff we're seeing, where the augment rune is kind of what piqued my interest, and the same with a lot of other people. Because, like, mounts... We have had raids with multiple mounts before. Now, you could argue that the exact implementation of, like, the AOTC-only mount is a little bit different, but as I argued before, considering it's just a recolor, a different dragon riding skin, there's really nothing that suspicious or special about there being a second mount of Farak. There's also, like, a few very minor hints that people think it'll, it'll be the next one. Also, people think because it's BlizzCon, right? Admittedly, the Augment Rune is the one that has thrown me for a loop and a lot of other people for a loop. Because that is one where not only have they never, ever even remotely done anything like that before in terms of adding the Augment Rune. Where are, the, where are you guys going? Oh, somebody pulled a dragon back here? What the hell? Alright, well. I'm guessing that's where they were going. Um, yeah, they've never even done something remotely like that where they add an infinite augment rune into the second to last patch. It's, um, that one is weird. So, the reason why I'm like, it's not guaranteed that we don't get 10.3 is because the reality is, it there's nothing inherently about the augment rune that says there is no patch 10.3. It is entirely possible that going against all precedent, Blizzard has decided... We're going to add the infinite augment rune a patch early. And you know what? I honestly would not be opposed to that. I would think that's a good change. But it is very weird in the context of a lot of other stuff. I think all of the other hints that it's the final patch can easily be written off as, you know, just one-off coincidences. This one is definitely a little bit odd. And it also kind of recontextualizes a lot of the other stuff we're seeing. So... I do think that this does heavily point towards there maybe not being a patch 10.3, but one thing that I think is very clear is if we don't get a patch 10.3, we are going to need a very good fucking answer for why there is no patch 10.3. And, like, I've talked to some of my friends about this who think I'm maybe being a little bit overdramatic, and perhaps I am, but if Blizzard just decided we're only doing a few, like, we're only doing three, uh, like, major raids now in every expansion... Like, that's kind of bad. Because that means every expansion will just be more rushed. Like, Dragonflight... I, I said this on the other stream, that, like, last weekend's, and I get that it's not the most popular opinion, but personally, I don't think Dragonflight is a really good expansion. Uh, I would actually argue that I had more fun in WAD, definitely. Dare I say I had more fun in BFA than I have had in Dragonflight so far. Now, I definitely, a lot of my fun in BFA was in both Battle of Desire Lore and Nihilotha. 
And there is, of course, still room for there to be a Nihilotha level patch that, you know, has a lot of really fun stuff and, you know, is really fun to play, right? There is still time for that, but not if we don't get a final patch. If we get no final patch and Amir Jassil and Emerald Dream is the end, then it just ends up being some mid-fucking expansion that honestly wasn't very fun. Because quite frankly, Dragonflight has not really been super fun for me. Like, I, I haven't loved the Mythic Plus seasons. I think they're making some decent changes in terms of, like, removing the seasonal affix. I think that was an improvement. I think the raids were all extraordinarily mid. Uh, none of them really impressed me at all. There were no Sanctums of Domination, but I actually think overall I enjoyed Sepulchre of the First Ones more than I have any of the current raids. Uh, definitely more than Vault of the Incarnates. I, I know a lot of people like Vault of the Incarnates. Vault of the Incarnates, I did not really enjoy at all as a raid, if I'm being real. Um, I, I There is not like a single fight in Vault that I genuinely found fun. I've heard people cite Karag, and Karag's not a bad fight, but on Mythic it was just kind of tainted by cheese, and... The cheese made it ridiculously unfun to actually go through, even if it was a neat fight in theory. So I just think Vault of the Incarnates was a mid-raid tier. Avarice was fine. It had a few individual good boss fights. I think Sarkareth was a fine boss, but a lot of the fights are also just really not that great. And credit where it's due, and Beardrasil looks like a significant step up compared to both Avarice and Vault, so I am actually somewhat excited for that. There's multiple raid bosses in Amir Jassil that I think will be very, very cool. I'm very excited for that. But it's not like... Uh, I mean, it could end up being, but at the moment, I don't think it's going to be, like, the greatest raid of all time. Like, so amazing that it's going to just completely knock my expectations out of the park. And it's definitely not enough to justify not having another major content patch. And... I don't know... It, the, the other thing you need to consider is, while we kind of understand why Shadowlands and WAD got cut short, like, due to development issues, and it sucks, but it's understandable, if the norm going forward is going to be half-baked expansions that are just missing content at the end with, like, nothing to make up for it, and it's just like, whoops, sorry, we fucked up, now pay $60 for a new expansion, that's just kind of shit. And, and once again, I am talking hypothetically, I'm not saying Blizzard has done this, because... You know, in, in this case, because it is something that they have never done something that egregious in terms of, like, expansion stuff, I'm willing to give them the benefit of the doubt on that. But, a uh, fun little fact, uh, LOS cancels Aram's Frostbomb, so if you just tank him against the wall here, whenever he does Frostbomb, you just run around the corner, like this, and then he never creates the Ice Bomb, and you never need to move him. You just need to reposition him really quickly, but if you do that every time, never cast Frostbomb. It's like, Omega oh, Cheese? Honestly, the timing is a little bit tricky and hard to get down, but I love doing that. It also really doesn't matter. You could do it here, too. Oh, fuck. Oh, no! <laughs> he actually just machine gunned those casts back to back. I was not ready for that. Normally, there's, like, a little bit of a delay, but I still managed to negate almost every single one of those Frostbomb casts. So, pretty fucking good. Um, Nation, you can just press 1 on the boss to kill adds. I'll handle the taunt stuff. Yeah, so, uh, actually, the nice thing here is I was talking earlier about, like, the optimal strategy for this boss. Loose spread, or loose stack in the air so I can reach you with the tops. And then I have party lead so I can do a ready check. Oh, this guy used his ability. Yeah, it's whatever. You don't really need the amber ability. It helps, but... So I'm going to redirect all the stuff. Now, early on, while I build charges here, I'm going to take a bit of damage. That's fine. And then I'm going to wait. I'm going to taunt again. And then I'm going to 
cast a buffed up dodge. And here, I shouldn't really be taking much damage. You can see my dragon's health bar. Just refresh the taunts, why not? Okay, my dodge stacks fell off. Because I hit a bunch of the whelps. Refresh my dodge, up the taunts. And then we move. So, like, we can look at damage, right? Obviously, I'm up there a little bit, because Searing Wrath. This guy's doing 26k just pressing one button. Ruby Drake's kind of own. And this is the Amber Drake, right? And the thing about the Amber Drakes is, as we said before, Amber Drakes get diminishing returns. So, the second Amber Drake brings significantly less damage than the first one. And the third brings even less damage than the second one. Second is actually significantly higher. Third and onwards Amber Drakes, you get significant diminishing returns. Uh, but the first one brings most of the value. And even then, one, like, the second Ruby Drake is already bringing um, only 10k less damage. Now, admittedly, the boss damage is where most of the Amber Drake will shine. Because it has, like, the charges that it builds up in the boss. And it does that. And that's pretty nice. Also, the boss is not supposed to be auto-attacking the Amber Drake. I actually, I rarely ever see him do that. That is weird. Um, for whatever reason, he just stopped casting there. Uh, but then, even then, I don't really think these guys are, like, min-maxing their damage quite as much. You can see Utter Fluffer. I think this is more comparable in terms of his uh, damage with the um, Touch of Nightmare. Like, because you need to be really aggressive with your Touch of Nightmare, and I doubt they are, which is fine. You don't expect the Emerald Drakes to do a lot of damage. But they're actually still contributing a good bit, even on the Healer Dragons. And I can tell you for sure, the damage contribution from, like, this, the Resto Druid, is infinitely higher than, like, a third Amber Drake would ever be. But more importantly, this is just ultra safe. It is as effective as stacking Amber Drakes, if not more, the only change you can make would be bringing the second amber over the um the second emerald but it is so 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 much safer like we were never in any danger throughout that entire pull also always roll need on the frozen orb it's just you know the way that this stuff works and then i can loot this to get my daily dungeon stuff and there we go do you only stream on youtube currently yes uh, at the moment, I'm debating doing some, like, bonus streams on Twitch at some point for stuff that, like, I don't want to have on YouTube. Like, basically videos that I, I don't think would do super well. Because the advantage of streaming on YouTube is all this stuff turns into a video recording automatically on my channel the moment it's done. But if it's something that, like, doesn't really match with the type of videos I like to make, um, then I might start doing that on YouTube. Or if I don't think it's going to perform well. Because if a video performs poorly then it actually hurts me in the algorithm, right? Uh, so I can't just, like, say, oh, well, this one didn't do too great. That's a shame. It, it actively will harm me if um, a video doesn't do super great. But if I were to stream it on Twitch, then, well, that wouldn't actually have an impact because it has nothing to do. It's disconnected with the YouTube algorithm. So I've considered doing that. But for right now, yes, I only stream on YouTube. Good day for you. And I can just get rid of this vendor, all this garbage... And I'll just, I'll throw myself in a random queue again for Titan Rune Gamma, see what pops. Tank queues are usually very, very fast for Titan Rune Dungeons. And I'm still missing a bunch of the achievements, because uh, I've mostly just been doing the Oculus and the um, ICC dungeons every single day. Partially because when I was still making the ICC dungeon guides, I needed footage for those. On Cahet. This is an interesting one. Uh, definitely haven't done this yet on Gamma, but, uh, obviously I've done it on all the other versions. I mean, I wrote the guide on this stuff. Uh, can give you kings, give you kings, and another paladin. Nice. Well, uh, because we have mage food, I don't need to drop a fish feast. There were dice icons to click, and you didn't click them. Fake WoW player. Ah. 
Look, I, I at least won some of them with the greed option. So, I got some value out of disenchanting. Anyways, let me let me scroll up. What class am I playing? I am playing a Protection Paladin. And this is Wrath Classic, in case it wasn't obvious. Um... Okay, so, oh, also, for people who have not played Wrath Classic and are just watching on for fun, so, I mentioned this before, but there's, like, a new hard mode. Or, I say new, it's been out for a few patches now. But they added a new hard mode difficulty to Wrath Classic, like, a few patches ago. And they've been iterating on it, so it's basically, like, little Mythic Plus affixes, but classic. And... Oh. Just grab this mob... And every single set of dungeons has its own special affix. So the one that I just did, Oculus, has a special affix where it summons mirror images whenever you get into combat with the target, of that target, and they have, like, special effects. The one for this dungeon, on Gehet, and it's also active in Astral and the Rub, is players will randomly get web-wrapped. Right, this is a an annoyingly timed patrol. And... Need to get the Shadow Blast interrupt, or I would absolutely get destroyed by that. Okay, hit this mob with a grenade. This is really unfortunate positioning. Okay, I sacked him. I don't know if that actually went off. Oh, look at my health. Oh my god. Shadow Blast fucks. Yeah, we need definitely better interrupts on that. And ideally, they would be stacked up. The nice thing is, if I bring the mob over here, then if it casts Shadow Blast on me, I can just LOS around the corner, and it won't matter. But yeah, that Shadow Blast almost one-shot me, and I'm really geared. Unfortunately, we had no remaining interrupts for it. Alright. We're alive, though. Just unfortunate with how that patrol was lined up. Didn't really have a better place to pull it. Um. Oh, Clayton became a member. Welcome. I appreciate that. I almost didn't notice. I was so focused on the dungeon. Uh, but uh, thank you for that, Clayton. It's a lot. Uh, and you said you just started playing retail again. Really like your speedruns. I'm glad to hear it. I'm glad you've been enjoying the speedruns. There's definitely more where that came from, though we're almost done with all of the, uh, the speedrun tests, like the one I did earlier today. But I'll replace it with some other different form of speedruns, like challenge runs or something like that, because I enjoy doing them, people enjoy watching them, so definitely not going anywhere. You can little do a little thread the needle strap there and skip both of those packs. I love Wrath Dungeons. There's just so many fun little strategies you can do. But yeah, so this web wrap ability, generally speaking, uh, Ankahet and Asriel the Rub are now considered to be the hardest of the Wrath Dungeons, especially for hard modes and stuff, because of the web wrap mechanic. Because while it does give you a damage bonus after you get web wrapped and broken out, if you get web wrapped away from the party and you aren't broken out within 10 seconds, you just die. Like, it literally one-shots you. And also... What can sometimes happen, which is really problematic, is if multiple players get web-wrapped at the same time, and you aren't able to break each other out, like right here, I'm web-wrapped as the tank, which fucking should never happen. It still annoys me that that is even something that can occur in this game. Um, I can show my damage breakdown after this to show where the damage buff is. Did they not fix this yet? They toned it down a little bit. I mean, this used to be so much worse um, after the changes. It doesn't prioritize the tank as much, but it it's still some, as you see there, just 
fucking web rats the tank sometimes. Which is really annoying. And if, like, three people get web wrapped immediately, then suddenly you have to quickly break those three players out. Because, you know, it, it is entirely possible to end up in a disaster situation where all five players get web wrapped at the same time. It's not super common, but if people aren't, like, paying attention and they don't break wraps immediately, it can cause a snowball effect. But you can see, um, in my breakdown, Shadow Bolt. It's not even that much damage, so, like, that is the payoff for the stupid, um, mechanic that, uh, web wraps you. You get, like, a minor Shadow Bolt that causes, like, your next abilities to deal slightly bonus damage as Shadow. It's so pitiful for how annoying this mechanic is. Like, the, um... The Halls of Stone and Halls of Lightning thing is way stronger, and the downside for that is really not that bad. Use a little sapper charge there. Hopefully I moved far enough. Uh... Uh, are you kidding me? The Warlock pet pulled? Oh, that's just unlucky. Oh, no! Disaster situation. This game sucks. I fucking hate this game, dude. How has this not been fixed? Yeah. So that happens. Um, to be clear, I don't know if you guys saw that. I got web wrapped in midair, and my web wrap was not on the ground, so people didn't see it, so I didn't get broken up. Yeah, you can still get web wrapped across the instance. It's still an absolutely garbage affix. Um, to the point where, like, I'm not gonna just leave the group because, especially, I want to get each dungeon completed once. <laughs> Honestly, for Ankahet. On a, and maybe even Astral in the Rub. I unironically just recommend leaving these dungeons if you get them in a random queue. It is just so miserable trying to get these done. It's just, it is the worst thing ever fucking created. And it was like maybe a little bit understandable the first iteration, but at this point we're on version 3 of this affix and they still haven't tweaked it to make it like remotely bearable. Which is just really frustrating. Oh, it's that, yeah, you know, the mage buff. Let me scroll up a bit because I missed a few messages. Ten point two being the end of Dragonflight will feel like shit. Shadowlands ending was like edgy emo kid didn't get his way. If Farak is the ending of Dragonflight, Angry Dragon was an angry dragon. Yeah, exactly. It will make absolutely no sense whatsoever. There's no way that they're gonna go with this. Also, do the paladin just like rocket boots ahead? Alright. Also just going to quickly get mana before I forget. So I don't start the next pull with no mana and then forget what the hell I was doing. Uh, what else? I have, yep, tank aura up, blessing up, okay. Yeah, I have everything. It's one of the only slightly sucky parts about Wrath. After a wipe, it's, it's such a pain. You have to remember to refresh everything, especially as a paladin, getting all your blessings reapplied. Luckily, you don't really wipe very often, at least if you're doing things correctly, but uh, that's not the case in Anka Head and Astral Nerov. I do think that what you said is probably the case, Naomi, if we just don't get an augment rune in the final patch and they're just adding it early, but it definitely is a little bit suspicious. And it makes me worried on what they're going to do. I also think it's ridiculous that poll. We got so fucking unlucky with the fear sending the warlock pet literally all the way from over here down exactly into that pole. In like the last second of the fear, it reached those mobs. I literally dragged the mob as far away as I reasonably could have, and the fear still fucked us. That's just annoying. Not much you can do. Uh, I already used it. 
But yeah, effectively, the only way to do this dungeon is to have, like, a lot of AoE abilities and have people stack in it. And... Honestly, I... I don't really know how doable this place is. This or Astral and the Rub without at least one Paladin. We have two Paladins in this group, and it's still really annoying to deal with. But... Yeah, one of the other things to keep in mind, and this is probably something I'll mention in my, uh... my, like, new version of the guide, because what I'll probably do is, obviously, mechanically, this is exactly the same as it was before, but I think I'm going to add some, like, little bonus tips that I've learned over the past few months, uh, after doing the hard mode some more, that didn't make it into the original guide for whatever reason, either I didn't know or I didn't think they were as important as they turned out to be. And one of the main things is always watch your tooltips, or, uh, like, nameplates and stuff. I know that a lot of people play with raid frames, but I actually think that playing with, like, picture frames here is really nice, because in that particular instance that you saw me get into, where... I was web wrapped in the air, but nobody could see my web wrap. Well, if somebody had like party frames like this and they could see that my icon was a web wrap, uh, even though it, like there is something that says free so and so when you get webs, um, that way you could see whenever somebody in your group is a web wrap and then you could look to see where that is. Then if people had noticed, they would have uh, gone ahead and broken me out, which unfortunately they did. Uh, let's see. You feel like Dragonflight was wholeheartedly meant to be a filler episode kind of deal, so Team 2 can ride out the absolutely crazy turbulent period that has been these past few years? I don't. I don't really think so. Um, filler episode maybe, but... I mean, I, I don't think any expansion should be a filler episode, and... I don't really think that's the intent. They might try to market it that way, but, like, that is definitely not the case. And I doubt that was ever like, actually their intent with Dragonflight. So, if they try to spin shit like that, don't buy it. Honestly, call them out on that, if that is what they try to pull on us to justify it. Which, you know, maybe it could just be speculation. It could just be that um, we are actually getting a, a third patch, and it's just unfortunate coincidence after unfortunate coincidence but blizzard is definitely not doing anything to help the speculation at this point oh it's on me dude my cooldowns i just popped avenging wrath okay raid frames would also show if you had the debuff true i mean you're you could still see it but there's a difference between looking for the debuff on again there's a difference between looking for the debuff on, uh, like, the uh, raid frames. Oh my god. I'm getting bullied this fight. Watch, it's gonna pick me a third time. Please don't. Okay, thank god. We better get a... Th yeah. No, I, I don't count, um... Point O is like a patch. It technically is a patch, but we're, I know what you mean, Naomi. I also view it as like, that's the launch. There's the launch and then there's patches and stuff. They're two separate things to me. Let's see. Go here and... Uh, yeah. See, the other thing is the absolute worst part of... This dungeon by far. And I should note, funny thing about Titan Rune beta dungeons, if I go down here, uh, where is it? Lich King Heroic. I think I'm standing in something. I still do not have Titan Rune beta for this dungeon. Uh, Utgard Keep. Obviously, I did them all on the PTR, but yeah, I still do not have Jadoga or Amanitar done on um, live servers for the beta dungeons because I tested it on the PTR. It was fucking awful. I got the footage I needed, 
And the reality with the way sidereal essence works in the old uh, currency system is you only got it off the final boss. So you basically had no incentive to kill the other two bosses other than like a small pitiful amount of badges, which like who cares. Um, but now that it drops off every boss, you kind of need to run all of them. And Jadoga especially sucks. A Manitar I only didn't do because it's like, why bother? But Jadoga is... Oh boy. That and the trash leading up to her, really not great. One of the nice things about uh, Prop Pally is I can just taunt the, um, the web wraps and one-shot them. So that makes things a little bit easier. Uh... Need mana. This guy is getting wrecked. Oh boy. <sighs> Alright, this boss is, uh... This boss is something. So... Getting this buff, it actually drops your threat, so, um, I probably shouldn't have done that, but, you know, whatever. We're, we're fine. I'll take the damage bonus. You know, it, it's paying off, right? I'm doing top damage. Nobody died, so therefore it was worth it. Uh, but yeah, this boss is always super jank, especially because... You're, as Prop Pally, all of your abilities will, like, ricochet to the mushrooms and clear them out. So it's just really annoying to deal with. And... There we go. Uh, like a no stakes, uh, go in, come out, no different deal. Whatever things look like for Microsoft buyout, they'll be ready for it. Yeah. Also, just run up here. They're going that way. Here. That actually would have been quite bad if I had gotten web wrapped there. I didn't even consider that. Yeah, this also has some weird pathing for what's optimal. Brain broke for a sec where you said you don't have them on live for the beta dungeon. To oh, I see what you mean. Um. Uh, honestly, it's actually kind of a neat skip. I didn't even consider that. Yeah. We can do that, and then we would want to go this way, because we have to clear out some of the trash. Huh. Well, that's a cool skin. I never even thought of that. Alright. You learn something new every day. See, I always knew that was possible, but I never considered that you would actually skip things with it. Oh my god, that guy got fucking blasted. Hold on, I'm gonna fucking... I'm gonna do my... What, what is this thing called? Divine Sacrifice? Yeah, I'm pressing that button. And I'm gonna press my defensive. Oh yeah, it's the Water Elemental Charge that's doing all that damage. Damn. Yeah, because I always thought, like, you need to clear this pack anyways... And then, like, clear along the wall. But technically speaking, you don't actually need to clear that pack. So, it's not a huge st skip, because it, like... It only lets you skip one group of mobs, but... Hey, every bit counts. What about the Pally Taunt that taunts three things that aren't targeting you? Forgot the name of it. I think you're thinking of Righteous Defense. Commanding up to three enemies attacking the target to attack the Paladin. So, kind of... Oh no, this pull is... Oh my god, this pull is a disaster. We need to be breaking web wraps insta, or it could spiral. Okay, we're good. Whew. Yeah, it's basically, uh, you taunt off a target. Yeah. 
So if there's like multiple t uh, targets attacking an enemy or attacking a player, it could be good. But. I don't always use it. Who among you is devoted? Aw, she didn't say it. Just wondering if web wraps would die to that. Uh, oh, no, no, it doesn't do any damage. Yeah, it's specifically the, um, I, I see what you mean now. It's specifically Hand of Reckoning actually does damage. If the target is not currently targeting you, they take damage. And if the target can't, uh, if the enemy can't target anything, like a web wrap, which has no target, then it just does damage. There's actually, um, because a lot of Rep Paladins were using taunt as part of their damage rotation because it did damage uh and almost dying for it blizzard actually made a glyph uh that is unique to classic that makes it so your hand of reckoning no longer actually taunts and can still just be used as a damage ability but yeah that's only for hand of reckoning it doesn't work for righteous defense but i see what you mean though you think it was maybe a taunting kills it instantly mechanic no the nice thing about that is whenever people keep ripping thread off me, and I'm, like, supposed to be holding the boss, I'm like, yes, keep taunting off me. I'm just gonna keep taunting back and getting free damage. Skip here? Come? What do you mean, skip here? Oh. I see. Eh, I don't... I... That one... I mean, you can also just, I guess, run through the middle... Uh, I see, buddy. Thank you. I, I saw. I'll follow his skip. We'll see. Eh, I guess. You run over here, you wait for the patrol. Alright, fair enough. The only thing I'm not sure of is... I'm guessing, yeah, he's probably thinking, pull the boss back here. That way there's no risk of pulling these, or accidentally pulling the adds in the middle of the fight. Huh. Yeah, I kind of forgot that these side cubbies existed in this boss room. Because initially I'm like, oh, the room's fairly small, you wouldn't really have enough space to do this. But, you know, there's actually more than enough room to the side. Alright. You know what? I, I dig it. This is a neat little skip. Also, for whatever reason, this mechanic is, um, broken on retail. It was really annoying when I was trying to get footage for this before the release of Wrath Classic, because I basically just could not get any footage of this mechanic actually working, and that was always really annoying. When she went, you there, step forward, it made you think, boogie down, sachet left. Yeah, it actually, you know, it kind of sounds like the voice actor. It's been so spread out, I doubt it's the same. But, I wonder. Um, yeah, I doubt I'll need anything out of this place, but I don't actually need any of the loot from the dungeon itself these days, but I think all the loot was already well done, right? Yeah, there we go. Yeah, honestly, I might include that skip in the final version of the Titan Gamma Guide. I kind of haven't really shown a lot of on Gehet skips. I know there's a few others, but maybe. Could be neat. That's uh, probably something to include. And... This. Throw this over here. 
Yeah, the nice thing about doing the random queue is you get, like, little explorer supply shit, which is always fun, because that can sometimes contain amounts. I actually have yet to get one, but one of these days I'll finally get it. Um, let's see. I'll show leveling stuff a little bit, but last thing I want to do is I just want to do Forge of Souls. I'm going to do that at some point, because Forge of Souls is really good for this. I would say the two dungeons that I would recommend specific queuing every single day if you're trying to like farm this stuff is Oculus and Forge of Souls. Because Oculus gives bonus rewards and is pretty easy. So in terms of the amount of currency you get for the amount of time it takes, I anger my defined protection. Uh, in terms of the currency you get for the amount of time you spend, uh, Oculus is just so good. It's like hyper efficient. A few. I'll give you kings, and you get knights. Uh, I don't think this dungeon will take 13 minutes, so I probably don't need to refresh my flask. Um, With the attention of the Lich King turn towards the as I was saying, yeah, so obviously Oculus is very good. However, Forge of Souls is also ridiculously fast. This dungeon's like five to seven minutes, depending on how like quick your group is. So it only gives two of the Defiler Scourge Stones, but for starters, it's an ICC dungeon, which means that you have a chance to get stuff like Battered Hilt off the trash, which is really nice. second i can't fucking focus with sylvanas talking um so the trash potential drops here are obviously good so that's another reason to do it i think getting the icc dungeons in general because of the fact that they have no actual modifiers these ones are the easiest without a doubt like calls of reflection pit of sauron they are slightly challenging dungeons in a vacuum, but because all of the other modifiers are, like, kind of annoying, and there's absolutely none for Forge of Souls, uh, Pit of Sauron Halls, they're just completely free. Super easy to farm for currency. And, uh, on top of that, Bronjam, the second boss, or the first boss in here, has a chance at dropping a 22-slot bag, so... Honestly, there's just so much good shit in here. ICC dungeon, check. Quick two-boss dungeon for easy currency, check. And chance at a 22-slot uh, bag. Hell, you can even get a 20-slot bag, which I'm pretty sure it's a 20-slotter. Um, pop his new bag, which is still pretty good for a lot of people who don't have, like, full frost weave. So overall, it's... Um, just a good dungeon. There's a lot of really good shit from here. So every single day, I specific queue Oculus and Forge of Souls, and then if I have time, I just random queue after that. Because, honestly, from that point on, you just want to increase the chances that you're getting Oculus. Strawberry Jam is a chance at a 22-slot bag, yes. Yeah, I know th there's like two of them, because there's Papa's new bag and Papa's brand new bag. Uh, never forget the time your guildy quit the game when you got the Swift White Hawk Strider. Oh, wait, let me loot this. You got the Swift White Hawk Strider, which he had been farming for months, and if they called the arms bag from Wrath in a random group finder, oh man. Now that's pretty fucking lucky. Also, I have, like, actually just no mana right now. Alright, that's unfortunate. Um... Fuck. I've never been in a situation where my healer is just literally not healing me at all, and I just have no mana. I also didn't have Divine Plea up for like two more seconds. Unlucky. Probably should have just used a mana potion, but I didn't realize I would literally get nothing. Fun fact for healers, at least try to keep light healing up on Paladin tanks, even if they're at full health, because... Otherwise, they just, they're out of mana 100% of the time, especially in dungeons. Give him might again. There we go. Alright. Ah. <sighs> 
Honestly, um... I quite like spamming these dungeons overall compared to the older ones. Just because, like, even with the new Apex, the Thorns buff makes it just so much easier to clear things and do tons of damage to the Pally Tank. If the healer was healing you, you could have plus three'd it, yeah. Honestly, it would have been cool if they added, like, Apexes and, like, scaling key levels in Wrath, but I feel like that's too much for just a regular, um... Like, a regular server. That's the kind of thing that we might get in a full-on Wrath Classic Plus. Though all the Classic Andes would probably start to complain, because it goes against the spirit of Classic or whatever. People still complain about Titan Rune Dungeons all the time. But personally, I think they're honestly the best thing to happen to Wrath Classic. They're the best thing to happen to Classic in general. They've made running dungeons actually fun and engaging again. Which, I don't know. I guess... If you just wanted loot pinatas to get free catch-up gear, maybe, like, you don't like it, I can see. Because nowadays it means that regular heroic dungeons are basically dead, and dungeons have kind of turned away from being, um, like, just a thing for catch-up and dailies to now an actual way to farm for gear. So this warrior is kind of blasting, Loki. Uh, goes against the spirit of the game. Bring back everyone being able or being sh as shit as they were in 2010, and unable to kill Lich King 25 heroic before buffs. Oh yeah, the whole it getting killed on the first reset. I'm so glad that happened. Like we all knew it was gonna happen, but there were some absolutely cooked takes from people who genuinely thought that it was going to live for the entirety of week one because Lich King wasn't mathematically possible without the damage buff and gear. And that's just... I don't know. I am actually curious to see what the first raid tier will be that actually lasts for more than just a handful of hours and doesn't basically get one shot. I honestly think it might be Cataclysm. Because I think Cataclysm... Well, obviously Lich King had some mechanics, it's still pretty easy. And, sure, everybody knows all of the fights by now. But I think, like, if you look at retail Mythic Raids, like, you throw Echo and Liquid in there, I'm sure they wipe on Sarkareth re-kills. Like, I, I don't think they one-shot Sarkareth every single week. A lot of guilds wipe to Sarkareth. Uh, and imagine now that you hadn't done Sarkareth for, like, however many years. Like, sure, maybe they get a bit of practice, uh... Uh, with it on the PTR or something like that, but they don't have super good gear and damage tech checks are still like relatively tight and I think it was like probably around Cataclysm Mop when damage finally started to actually be heavily optimized, not still to the degree that we have today, but I think it is much closer to like modern optimization standards that we had in like, you know, Wrath or, BB or TBC. So I think honestly... There is a, a non-zero chance that maybe not that Cataclysm done or Cataclysm raids live an entire weekly reset. That was like a cook take that I've seen people saying. But I could genuinely see a world in which Cataclysm raids don't fall over immediately and take like a good solid few hours or like a day or maybe not an entire day, but like a good few hours, a good few attempts to actually get down. Especially when you consider that People don't have nearly as much private server practice for Cataclysm stuff compared to the other ones. Because, you know, Wrath of the Lich King private servers have been immensely popular. Cataclysm, not so much. So I don't think there's going to be, like, tons of guilds out there who have been clearing the raid over and over for years now. Hard to say. But I also, I don't remember it super well enough. The math wasn't based on Sims, though. It was based on, oh, our DPS do this much damage, it wouldn't die. Keep in mind, the majority of the raids was pretty much just TOC or whatever. Just throw a sack in that dude. 
Um, yeah, I mean, I, I get that people were doing it based on, like, their actual DPS's damage, but the thing that a lot of people didn't seem to realize is that the top guilds that were actually going to be getting, like, chances at getting a world first kill, world first, quote unquote, but you get what I mean. Those guilds were not showing their logs and showing their damage. So, they were all testing in private, away from other people. So, like, I saw a bunch of people saying, like, oh, there wasn't a single guild that managed to kill 25 Heroic Lich King on PTR. There's no way it's going to die early. But the people who would have theoretically killed it just stopped before they finished, duh. Or they just didn't log it at all or didn't share their prog and like stream or anything because they wanted to keep their strat secret. Which like, no, like s keeping strat secret for old bosses is whatever, but apparently there's some cheese strats. I don't know a ton of detail, but I heard about it. Anyways. You guarantee a lot of the guilds going for world firsts are on private servers for each soon upcoming expansion reprogging well ahead of release. Um, or you mean like old mathematically impossible numbers? Yeah, okay, fair, fair. That's definitely true. And yeah, I, I'm sure that the guilds who really want to try hard classic and get world first for old content, you're probably correct that they will go on to like a Cataclysm private server and try and get practice ahead of time, but... I still think it's going to be a little bit harder. That could just be pure copium. And if you told me that it was and Kata also died in like two hours, I would believe you. I think there's at least some small chance that it actually doesn't end up being a complete pushover. There's no way that guilds have to seriously prog it the way that you do in like retail race the world first. It's just a different game. But I could still see there being like a few wipes and adjustments and like figuring out like how to handle it with like low gear and whatnot because a lot of those fights are somewhat mechanically difficult and tight gear checks when you get to cataclysm and it's not like all super duper face real easy we'll have to see them things like saving an army of the dead for spirits then dispersion soaking yeah uh okay so thing i want to show is i'm gonna hop onto my death lane First off, Random Dungeon Finder is a blessing. That alone makes leveling so much better, as a lot of people pointed out. So just AFK chilling in some random in. We have mail from May Francis. Uh, huh. It sends the albino drake to your character, but it's already in the collection. I have a bunch of random garbage. So... Two key things to keep in mind here that I want to show that make Wrath leveling so much better. Why do I have Marid on gear? Apparently I ran Marid on at some point on this character. I don't remember why I did that, but I guess I did. Alright. Uh... Actually, shit, I don't want to vendor an entire stack of Mage Weave. Don't need that. And, yeah, whatever. I'm not going to sell that on the auction house for whatever it's worth. Uh, two big things here. And honestly, like I said, I am a little bit tired here, so I'm not really going to be doing a ton, or really any at all, right now. I could uh, specific queue for dungeons. Only thing is, right now, the only dungeon I have unlocked at 68 is Utgard Keep. And I, apparently I can queue for Black Morass? I don't know why it even shows up under specific dungeons if I don't meet the requirements. I think you still need to complete the unlock chain for that. No. Uh, I also don't have a tank spe spec uh, set up at all. I'm still in a... DPS frost leveling spec because I had no plans on doing dungeons when I was initially leveling this character up through TBC stuff. But so when is Call to Arms Alterac Valley ends? Oh shit, Call to Arms Alterac Valley is going on right now. I vaguely remembered seeing that that was happening, but I kind of forgot about it. I should probably do that at some point. I'm not gonna do that right now, but two game changers. Real quick, I'll, I'll do this before, you know, I end the stream, because I said I was going to do leveling stuff. As I said, I'm going to do 
a full leveling video for my Death Knight, because I still want to showcase that, but I'll do it another time. I It's almost midnight where I am, and I'm kind of tired. Uh, but, Collections tab. This actually is pretty significant. So, beforehand, the way mounts worked in Wrath Classic is it was based on your character. So now... Things such as the Kalawak Whalebone Glider, having the Collector's Edition for this was actually really important because this was a free flying mount that you got at, uh, I forget what level it was, I think you get it immediately, and then you learn it as soon as you can. And the thing about the Whalebone Glider is, unlike a lot of the other flying mounts that you'll get, this automatically switches between flying and ground stuff, because it's like a regular modern mount that like na naturally adapts. In Classic before, a lot of the older mounts, the flying ones, cannot actually be used in non-flying areas. So that means that this mount, you only need one space in your bars. That's more quality of life stuff. Now that's not the case, because now that you have all the mounts in your account, if you have something like, say, Mimron's head, which, you know, yeah, weird flex, but okay. Um, I mean, everybody and their mother on Wrath Classic has Memorod's head by this point, so it's barely even a flex. But now I can use that on my alt, on my low-level alt, just like retail mounts. So, for people who are familiar with retail leveling, of course, this doesn't seem like a big deal. You could just use a macro? Yeah, for sure. I mean, you could. Um, I'm just saying this is generally, like, nice quality of life. The bigger thing, though, and, like, so, you're correct, Naomi, but the main reason why this is important and why this is a pretty big game changer for low-level stuff in Wrath Classic is I don't actually have the mount, but to find it, uh, I, I was trying to remember the name. This thing right here. So, obviously, Traveler's Tundra Mammoth. This was the very first vendor mount that was added to the game. It was added in Wrath. And nowadays, like, you'll see me in speedruns use Grand Expedition Yak, and Grand Expedition Yak is still really useful as, you know, a empty-your-bag-on-the-fly type mount. Less important in retail now that we have, like, 34 slot bags, but in Classic, when realistically you only have 20 slot bags and bag spaces at a premium, and not to mention you're not constantly at a vendor... Right, So a lot of times if you're doing quests, you may end up filling up your bags out in the open. And especially at lower levels, where you know that kind of quest design is more common. Now, once you have Traveler's Tundra Mammoth on your account, you can use it on your low-level characters the moment they gain the ability to mount up. Before, you would have needed to somehow get your low-level character to Dalaran and spend an extra 20,000 gold on that other character just to get them access to this mount. Now, it's still really expensive, and it's something that I'm currently saving for on my Paladin. I've been selling a shit ton of Primordial Serenite to hopefully be able to afford that. But now, I would say for 20,000 gold, for the ability to use this while leveling alts, like, I don't really care in my main. But I get to use this every single time to level a low-level low character, that is massive. For speedruns, that is so huge. That completely changes the dynamic of low-level content in Classic. It's, I mean, it takes out the entire idea of having to, like, go back to the vendor to get stuff. Before, I would have had to... One of the things I was planning on doing in my original plan for Wrath Speedruns is I was going to send over the scrap bot things that you make with engineering. Um, I, do they require engineering to use? I think there are some that don't, that still serve as a vendor and a repair. Um, and I was going to have to do that, and use those as like portable vendors for whenever I needed it, because I'm sure there would have been places in the run where that would have been important. But now it's not even a concern. You just have a mount with a vendor attached to it. Absolutely crazy. Um, not to mention in terms of just gold saved, now you don't need to buy mounts for every single one of your characters, which not a big deal, but it, it adds up, right? It's account bound, so you still need to buy the trading, but you don't need that. But the bigger thing, uh, there's also little toys, so actually, stuff like Molly could be nice, portable mailbox. Obviously, Molly has some niche use cases in retail speedrunning for, like, getting cracked Randax gems out of your bank. Obviously, that's not going to be the case here. You're not going to be doing anything special with that. There aren't really a lot of toys in Classic that are useful for this stuff. 
compared to uh, in retail, some of the toys we use, most of them at this point in the game were just like purely cosmetic stuff. There is wormhole generator. The problem with this is it would require you to actually have gotten uh, like engineering leveled up in your character. And I'm still debating whether or not it's worth it to level engineering for like a speed run type thing. Because in theory, if you were to send over all of the mats required to get engineering set up, you could argue that it wouldn't really be that much of a time loss. And I don't know, like I could definitely see a case being made for like there being enough of an advantage because wrath speed runs are long, right? Where did you get Molly from? Uh, well, you craft it. So I mean, I, I forget exactly how I craft it. I think it's just a regular recipe. Ball E. Uh, yeah, it's a regular engineering recipe. Um, yeah, not much else to it. I don't think. Yeah, it's just taught by the trainers. So you learn it at 425 engineering, just off the trainers. There's no special recipe, and it costs eight eternal air and eight serenite bars, which honestly is pretty cheap. Considering how useful this thing is, not just right now in classic, but like this, I still use this toy in retail World of Warcraft in Dragonflight. It is still extremely useful. Uh, there are not that many portable mailboxes. This is absolutely worth crafting. <laughs> eight bars, eight eternal layer. You're such a fucking nerd. I am impressed that you have that memorized. Yeah. I remembered it was fairly cheap considering how useful it is. Like, Jeeves is... Does Jeeves count as a toy? I don't think he does. Yeah, unfortunately, Jeeves is not on here. I can't even just search. just to be... Yeah, Jeeves is not on here. Uh, Jeeves is definitely a bit more expensive. And, well, by comparison, also much stronger. Um, you should get it. You had no idea we could get a portable mailbox. Yeah, it's super nice. Uh, very, very, very useful to have. I think, yeah, out of the toys, I'm trying to think. Definitely the, the wormhole generator is good if you manage to, um, get your engineering high enough, which, of course, it doesn't matter until, like, 70 to 80, but it's something. And... Nothing else is really too impactful. I'm curious to see what toys from Cataclysm exist. Because the other thing that you need to consider, and part of the reason why I'm so excited about this, is this collections tab has such a massive impact on not just, like, Wrath Classic, but also all of the classics going forward. Like, Cataclysm Classic? This is going to be so nice to have for that. We didn't get this function out. Like, when did they add this? Um, This wasn't added until... Wad, I think? Late Mop or Wad? We didn't get this collections tab. So, this is huge quality of life. Way earlier than we're used to seeing it. I, for one, am very, very, very excited for it. Um, Right now, like I said, Toy Box isn't super impactful, but this absolutely could be very, 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 very good. Uh, the biggest thing, though, and this is the main thing I want to talk about, the Heirloom Collection tab. This is a game changer for just fundamentally how heirlooms work in Wrath Classic. Uh, because, I mean, here's the thing. You need to have multiple uh, heirlooms. I mean, if you look at my character, I have two Swift Hands of Justice. I bought each one of these, right? So... I had to spend, I forget how many badges it was. Obviously, the vendor shows it's 75. Those are the Argent Tournament ones. Um, but I bought these with badges of heroism, and I had to buy two of them. Because, obviously, in the original version, you needed two trinkets. Because it was you, you buy the item. You don't buy like the addition to your collection tab. But now, if I want Swift Hand of Justice, just boom. Click on the thing, and it just adds a million of them to my bags. So, obviously, we're used to this functionality from uh, Retail Wow, but I had been saving up hundreds of badges of heroism on my Paladin. Uh, Toy Box came out four years after where Wrath Classic is. Um, was WAD pre-patch? Yeah, that makes sense. I figured it was WAD. I wasn't sure when in WAD it came out, but 
Uh, that sounds about right. But yeah, definitely much longer after. Um, but yeah, so I was I had been sitting on I think it was like 360 badges on my paladin, and I was waiting to see what I needed for the speed run because in the old plan that I had. There are multiple different shoulder enchants that you can get. So there is a shoulder enchant called... I think it's the one I have here. Um, Wowhead, Wrath Classic. Let me go database of... Database... Uh, where do I find this thing? Items. And then it's... Yeah, consumables, item enhancements, permanents. And then for shoulders, trying to find the name of the thing that I'm thinking of. Uh, Zandalar Inscriptions. So something that's really interesting that I never realized is prior to uh, Missa Pandaria, th there's this weird gap in between... Well, I, I almost said in between Wrath and Mists, a.k.a. there's this weird gap during Kata where there is no viable low-level shoulder enchant. They added the scaling uh, enchants in Mop, I believe, and Mop was when they re-added, like, Mark of the Crane and stuff like that for as a shoulder enchant, but Cataclysm, I don't think, actually has ones that work at low levels. But there is a shoulder enchant that works at level 30, or not, not level 30, words, works at level 55, and it gives 30 attack power, and that is what I'm, what I have in this enchant, it's Zandalar Inscription of Might, and it's from the Zul'Grub enchants from original vanilla, and it starts working at 55, which is the earliest working shoulder enchant in the game that you can apply to heirlooms. And, obviously, that's really good. I have it on this heirloom. I have it on, um, multiple different heirlooms, uh, that I've been getting. I have a bunch of them stockpiled in case I need them. I went and farmed Exalted with Zandalar rep. And initially, what I was planning on doing for my, uh, like, Wrath Classic speedruns is I was going to have three sets of shoulders. Actually, only two, I think, for low-level stuff. Uh, I forget exactly. Because one of them, you definitely want the Shatrith one. Uh, whatever it's called. Greater Inscription of the Blade. Actually, even then, would that be worth it? No, I, I'm, I'm confused. I'm looking at um, Greater Inscription of Vengeance is what I'm thinking of. Because this gives 30 attack power. Greater Inscription of Vengeance, which requires level 70 to use, and it doesn't scale, at least in Wrath Classic. Uh, at this point, I, I might want to retest that just to see if they implemented enchant scaling functionality. But Greater Inscription of Vengeance gives you 30 attack power, so the exact same thing, but then 10 critical strike rating. Not a ton... But still, if you're going for every little increase, which is what I always do for uh, my speedruns, I would definitely want to have that on some item. Which means I would need two different pairs of shoulders, with one with each of those enchants, and I would have to swap them out. But now, if I want to add the uh, Aldor enchant to my item, all I need to do is just click this, add it to my bags, boom. That is now, like, however many, 75 badges of heroism that I've now been able to save. And this applies to every single enchant. And obviously, another quality of life thing is just being able to get it from your collection if you aren't really super nitpicky about enchants is just really, really nice. And not having to constantly mail over your heirlooms every single time you want to level a different character. Like, I've been leveling a, a different rep paladin, a second paladin, in tandem with this Death Knight, like, chipping away at it slowly over time. And every time I wanted to level the Rep Paladin, I had to mail all of these heirlooms over to it and continue there. Same with my... I've been leveling my Prot Warrior, too, slowly. Um, weirdly enough, there are no heirloom shields or one-handed tank weapons. The closest we have is Venerable Dalron's Sacred Charge, which I guess kind of works as a tank weapon. You can even use Battleworn Thrash Blade, but at higher levels, I don't really think this scales quite as well. Uh, but I think stuff like this is probably going to be decent, at least. Uh, more so, I think, um, Venerable Mass McGowan as, like, a tanking one-hander. But there's no tanking shield in uh, Wrath. I forget if they added one in Cataclysm. I think I remember looking and seeing that 
Cataclysm surprisingly didn't flesh out the heirloom pool as much as I remembered it. A lot of the heirloom updates came in like patch 5.2, like early mop or something. Because I was looking at the history of this to get an idea of like what speedruns would look like in a lot of those older expansions. Because at this point, all of the quality of life upgrades blur together in my head in like terms of when exactly they happened. Uh, hello, makeup with glitter. Good to see you. Sorry, I've been like distracted, just rambling about stuff. I looked away from chat for a little bit. Uh, hello, Pixelina. Good to see you as well. Wowhead should hire me. I don't know. We'll see. Um, uh, oh, I missed another... Oh, you're also talking about Naomi, too. Yeah, Naomi's memory of this shit is ridiculous. Um, and Pixelina said Naomi is the WoW encyclopedia. Yeah, definitely. It is crazy how you remember to manage those tiny details, Naomi. I could not remember that stuff. Uh, you have way too much info about a lot of things that ends up being useful at some points, but it's a ton of useless info 99% of the time. I feel that, for sure. Uh, maybe you could fix the dumb as fuck articles they put out sometimes. Yeah. I mean, a lot of it is intentional clickbait, let's be real. Uh, you feel like you need a break from the game, but you're obsessed with mounts and dungeons. Um, no, you, Harald, and Blizzard should hire you. Oh, well. I don't, I definitely don't want to work for Blizzard. At this point, which is sad because I remember as a kid, my dream job was to work for Blizzard. But at this point, I think the company's too far gone. I'll reconsider it maybe in like five years or so when we're well into the Microsoft acquisition. Maybe things have significantly changed by then. But currently, it's still too heavily tainted by Bobby Kotick and all the other garbage people from the old version. Can Blizzard hire me and Harlden together so we can fix the weirdest fuck raid and dungeon decisions? Yeah. I mean, I can also be an advocate for players outside of the company. I think you're honestly, generally speaking, a better advocate for players on the sidelines than you are when you're like, you know, in there. Definitely, you can make more individual improvements to the game, but you don't get to be as big of a voice. Just look at a lot of the other people who've joined Blizzard. Don't even fault them. It's just kind of how it goes. Um, Makeup with the Glare said, I feel I need a break from the game, but you're obsessed with Mountain Dungeons. I think I just read that either way. Yeah, I feel that, though. There's a lot of times where I, like, randomly just get into collecting and stuff like that. Little things. Not mounts. I still have yet to reach my mount collection phase. But a lot of times I randomly go on, like, a toy collecting binge or, like, a transmod collecting binge. Like, right now I have... A massive urge to fill out my toy box on Wrath Classic because I have a massive toy collection on retail. Uh, it's the only one of like the things I actually collect like in the collection tab. I don't really collect pets, kind of. I collect more pets than I would say the average person, but a lot of the pets that I collect are actually for pet battles, and I do enjoy pet battles. So I collect like individual like pets here and there that I think will actually have use for pet battles, but I don't do like the whole I collect every single pet in the game type thing. I don't really much care for that. Um, mounts, same deal. Unless a mount has some utility attached to it or I think it looks cool, I'm not collecting it. I just, I don't really care enough. And then appearances, I like collecting appearances just because I like creating transmogs for fun. So I like having a bunch of random, you know, appearances here and there within reason. Um, just to collect it all. And I'm kind of mad at myself now because I didn't think they were going to add the fucking toy collection to Wrath Classic. If I knew they were going to, I would have been doing all the holiday things. Obviously, Hollow's End starts very soon, but I just missed um, Harvest Festival. And is, is there anything from Harvest Festival? I don't think there is, thankfully. It's not right now. Uh, but there were definitely some older ones that I didn't get. Yeah, nothing from Harvest Festival. I guess I can still get Wintervale Disguise Kit coming up. Um, what is it? Uh, I did miss uh, Brewfest, though. That one kind of sucked. Um, I meant to do more Brewfest stuff, but, like, I was just so busy right around here doing so many different videos. And I had absolutely, like, somewhere in the middle of here was the, the world record run and the secret questline discovery, and I just didn't have time to do Brewfest stuff. 
I hadn't realized they were adding the toy box, so I probably wouldn't have done it either way. But in hindsight, I wish I had, because I sucks that now I need to wait an entire year to fill out this spot in my collection. But, oh well. I'll just have to come back and get it in Cataclysm Classic. Um... Makeup with Galera said, you're now getting really getting into PvP gear. Yeah. Uh, personally, I'm not a huge fan of PvP, but collecting PvP gear and stuff can definitely be pretty fun. I feel that. And anyway, said, weird fact, I found a hidden character on your account. It was like a full TBC geared ret pally that you'd send heirlooms over back in Wrath that you'd upgraded. But you didn't have those heirlooms upgraded in your collection yet. Oh, interesting. Yeah, at this point... I, I miss the days when I could discover, like, hidden characters like that that I hadn't touched in a while. I have thoroughly scoured every little section of my account, every single character, cleaned out all of them. Especially since I started doing the 40 to 60 speedruns for testing, like, over the last few months. I did find a few old characters and, like, some neat things, but a lot of my old characters that I hadn't touched in a while, I would get up to level 40 to do those testing runs. Because, obviously... If I don't have a character at all, which was the case for today's run earlier in the stream, like, I had to level the Frost Mage from scratch from 1 to 32, and I was going to get it to 40, but I ran out of time. It's like, whatever, you know, people will still want to watch the other eight levels. But uh, that took, like, a few hours. It wasn't that bad. But a lot of times, if I already have a character at 35 that I can just get caught up to 40, I'll do that. And I've been using a lot of my old characters for those runs, so at this point, there's really nothing hidden on my account anymore. Uh, you feel like you need a break from the game, but that's because of other people that aren't taking a break from the game yet. Yeah, that's fair. Um, yeah, at, at this point, I mean, I can never really take a break from this game. I take like mini breaks, but I, I like at this point, WoW is kind of my bread and butter. So I, I'm, I'm still enjoying it, though. I feel like a little bit mildly burnt out just because I've been doing so much lately, but that's kind of the nice thing about also, I think I can, um, I can destroy these things now because I have the toy stuff, so I don't need to worry about that, and just before I forget, I wanted to do that, um, but yeah, I've just been burnt out because, like, I've been obviously pushing myself to do all these testing runs, and, you know, it's, it's a shit ton of effort. But I've been really itching to, like, play Classic, uh, like, Wrath Classic specifically. And, well, honestly, right now I don't have quite as much time as I wish I did to invest in this. I think I can play this a little bit, I can make a few more videos on it like I planned, and then it's 10.2 stuff. But honestly, once the dust settles on 10.2, once I'm done with like the initial farming and I've gotten all my guides out, I think I'm just gonna play this a lot because I've been I've been just really enjoying Wrath Classic and I'm just really excited to like keep playing it. So that has been fun at least. And retail, I always enjoy the first few weeks of the patch. But the only thing I'm really burnt out on in retail is like Avarice, the raid itself, and like the Mythic Plus season. But new Mythic Plus dungeons and a new raid, and especially when I'm playing like a new tank spec, which I mean I Brewmaster isn't really new to me, but I'm kind of like low-key excited to at least try Blood DK again. I don't think I'll end up maining it, but I've been gearing it up and I still kind of hate it. But at the same time, the fact that I haven't played it in like a good year or two makes me kind of enjoy it again just because it's different. But I have a feeling if I were to actually play Blood DK, I'd go back to hating it, hating it again because like... Bone Shield is such a stupid mechanic. I hate Bone Shield so much. It's just such a drag. Um, Makeup with the Glitter said, You still only have 114 mounts, but you're doing the Mountain of Mounts achievement. I mean, hey, that's solid progress so far. Are you talking for, um, for Wrath Classic or Retail? Because in Wrath Classic, that's actually a really good number. I don't even have that many yet in Wrath Classic, but... Uh, in retail, that's definitely a good start if you're, like, just getting into mount collecting. I think I only have, like, 400 on uh, retail. And there's, like, a lot of uh, really easy mounts to get if you know where to look. I mean, hell, there's a million clickbait YouTube videos and like, the top 10 easiest mounts to farm and stuff like that. Because 
you know, for people who like collecting that a lot of times it's easy to grab a bunch i forgot the quartermasters up here i know there's one in borean tundra i never knew there was one up here huh neat um you did literally nothing during brewfest in terms of brewfest activities uh yeah i technically should have but the thing about Brewfest is I was hoping to have this character leveled up to 80 before Brewfest so I can do it for the easy trinkets, which in hindsight doesn't really matter because I was thinking, oh, I kind of want to get the Brewfest like stamina trinkets and stuff for tanking if I need it. But the reality of like getting gear right now on a tank, especially with the random dungeon finder, I wouldn't have really needed that anyway because you can just buy death choice, which yeah, okay, of course I'm going to get that. There's really good tank trinkets. You can buy, like, the stamina trinket, the PvP trinket, the one that I've been using on my Paladin, like, the unused stamina. There's so many good options for gearing in Wrath Classic right now. I just don't think I would have needed that from Brewfest. I still wish I had had the toy now, hindsight, but it's not a huge deal. Um, The reason it's hidden is because the realm didn't show us having any characters. Oh, interesting. Wait, that is weird. Wait a second, I, I actually kind of wonder if I have any characters like that then, because if it wasn't actually showing up on your character list, I generally speaking remember all the characters I created, but there could be like one or two odds and ends characters. The last like big discovery I made on one of my old characters is towards the end of Shad or toward the end of Shadowlands, I um I found an old Death Knight that I had on Area 52. It was an Alliance Night Elf Death Knight. So when I moved over to A52 uh, to raid with um, Occasional Excellence at the time, I remembered that I had that old Night Elf Death Knight. And I didn't think much of it, but then when I went on that character, it turns out I had a bunch of items that were like now removed, including multiple gray transmog items that were worth a lot. And I'm still trying to sell them because some of them are worth like 1 million gold. And I've been posting them ever since gray items could be sold on the auction house. But uh, none of them have sold yet. But we'll see. Maybe one day. Uh, but that is like the latest example. Something that I've been uh, telling my dad he needs to do is he needs to dust off his characters and find it. And he said like apparently a few years ago I looked through his characters to see if he had any valuable items. And he was like, oh, I don't think there'd be any point in doing that again. But, like, I tried reminding him that a lot of stuff has changed in terms of what's valuable. Like, gray items, as of three years ago, were completely worthless. Like, if you had a gray pair of pants in your bags, you might as well just fender that because there's no value. But now, suddenly, you have gray transmog items that are no longer obtainable, and they could be worth a fortune. And you don't even realize that you're sitting on them. That was the case with the Death Knight that I found sitting on Area 52. So... Uh, I want to check my dad's character again, because I remember I did find a few, like, neat little collector's items. There wasn't a ton of stuff, but I also wasn't nearly as knowledgeable the last time I checked his character for, like, certain removed, uh, transmog pieces. Blizzard has brought a lot of them back, but some of them are still even to the day, to this day, with the buff drop rates, uh, pretty valuable. And who knows, a few of them haven't been brought back, so maybe it would be pretty good. Um, retail normal wow. Ah, gotcha. Yeah, in that case, there's a ton of mounts that you can still collect to boost that number up. Uh, a lot of the, like, the easy faction mounts and stuff you can get there, and there's definitely a bunch of, like, very easy to get, like, free dungeon mounts that have a fairly high drop rate. Um, but yeah, early on mount collecting, like, back in... Back in Wrath and Cataclysm, when I first started really getting into the game, because I've technically played since vanilla, but I, I played in vanilla when I was five years old. It doesn't really count. Like, it wasn't until I was, like, 12 or 13 in Wrath and Cata that I was really able to, like, start to understand the game and really engage with it I was, as it was meant to be played. And it was around that time when I started farming mounts. I still, I managed to farm the, um, the Swift Zulian Tiger back in, uh, like original wrath and that was like one of the first rare mounts i ever managed to collect i was really happy about that one i still need to do that these days maybe after the stream uh i, I might like uh, once i've gotten coffee and like rest and stuff i, I might go ahead and do more zul grub farming runs 
it's really tedious because like I have to kind of multi-box it. I have a second account with um, Wrath Classic that I've been using, and kind of need to do that for uh, like farming Zul Grub. Unless I were to have a friend help me farm, but obviously then you have to share it with them if it drops. Uh, but I'll have to um, do that at some point, because I feel like if I start farming now on multiple characters, like I could probably get the Zulian Tiger before the next expansion comes out. Because uh, one of my friends in my retail guilds managed to get it on Classic, but they spent like a few months farming it, so I'm a little bit behind there. But we have probably a good half a year, I would say, until Cataclysm, bare minimum. So, um, in theory, I should have time. Especially if I actually start leveling up alts, which, with these changes, I definitely plan on doing. Negan said, I bought new toilet paper at the store today using Apple Pay on your phone. <laughs> nice. I feel like that story was a bit more tame than the normal ones about, like, your grandparents. Um, Maldraxxus was not easy with the weird slime serpent thing. Oh, yeah. The one with, um, yeah, as Naomi said, soloing Plaguefall. Yeah, I mean, soloing Shadowlands dungeons, I think if you're still learning and you don't have, like, super good gear, I could see how that would be, uh, not the easiest thing on the planet. And especially if you don't know the mechanics. Like, Plaguefall definitely has some weird, unintuitive mechanics. Uh, did it on your Paladin when you were, like, 425 item level, just never bothered in Shadowlands? Yeah. I... I don't think I have it either. Pretty sure I never bothered. But I mean, it was Shadowlands, right? I just, I couldn't give a shit at all about collecting stuff. I have a decent amount of collection items from Corthia and Zareth Mortis. But all of those were like, if I happened to be doing the content for gear, sometimes I got them out. All right, cool. And at this point, like, I have almost all of the mounts from BFA Warfronts and whatnot. Just because I've done those zones so many times after BFA to get, like, the experience potions. That at this point, every single time I swing through there to grab the badges for the potions, I just kill all the rare mobs that drop mounts because it's, like, a very slight detour. And I think I'm missing one mount in Darkshore, and I have all of the ones in uh, Arathi Highlands, so... But definitely soloing it on a Paladin, of course, like... Paladin's pretty broken. Uh, especially Prop Pally. Like, Prop Pally could probably, s like, solo that with a blindfold, but depending on your class, it could definitely be a little bit tricky. You can see it being a little harder if new and just not knowing the mechanics. Yeah, for sure. Uh, definitely, yeah. Playing a tank spec for any sort of old solo content is, like, ridiculously busted. Definitely. All right. Uh, I have, uh, we've almost hit eight hours. This actually ended up being longer than I thought. And it's past midnight for me. Uh, so you can see here, local time, 12.05. Oh boy, this is what happens when I start the streams too late. I end up just having, I, I was gonna say, end up having to end early. But I think midnight isn't really ending early. Midnight's kind of like ending super late. Um, so I'm gonna stop it here. As I said, I'm gonna be uploading more Wrath Classic videos over the next week, because, like, most of the retail stuff at the moment, like, the pressing things have been finished. I have a few long-term retail videos, like the, uh, temp or the, not 10.2, the general, like, Dragonflight 60 to 70 full leveling guide is still in the works. That will come out, um, much closer to patch 10.2, and, of course, I'm doing a lot of testing for, like, dungeon and raid guides, etc. So you can definitely expect that closer to the patch, but I mean, we don't even have a release date for 10.2 yet, so at the moment, I think it is still better to focus on Wrath Classic stuff. So, I'm not really going to have enough time to fully script and put together the Titan Rune Gamma video by later today, on Monday, but it will come out on Tuesday. So, all the ICC dungeon guides are finished, they're posted, uh, That it it's every single Wrath Classic dungeon. All of them are done, finally, thankfully. But... Uh, tomorrow I'll be uploading, or tomorrow is in Tuesday, specifically, uh, the 17th, I'll be uploading a video for, uh, like, a mini guide for the Titan Rune Gamma dungeons. There isn't a ton to cover, it'll probably be, like, well, it'll go over the new mechanic of the Sun Reaver Warden. I will quickly summarize a lot of the, like, balance changes that have been made since the time of me making my previous Titan Rune beta video, 
And I will, of course, discuss the reward structure briefly. I don't like to go super into the rewards because, quite frankly, that's the kind of thing you can just wowhead. But I'll at least give like a basic summary. And there's a few little tricks you can do with the Defiler Scourge Stones that I think I haven't seen a ton of people talk about. And it's definitely very nice for uh, optimizing your gearing process. So that's the kind of thing I'll mention. Probably a short guide. I'm thinking it'll be like eight minutes at the moment, tops. Um, maybe not even that. But I think like eight, ten minutes is like pretty reasonable for a video like that. Uh, but I, I really, longer than ten minutes, I can't see it going any longer than that. Even if I manage to find like a lot of little tiny skips and tricks to include... The reality is almost all of the mechanics are exactly the same as my previous video. So what I'm going to say is if you want a summary of those mechanics, just go watch that video. It's like exactly the same. Basically nothing has changed. So that is the current plan for Tuesday. And then as I get this character caught up, I'm going to upload a video of leveling this character. I'm not exactly sure what the format will be. I'll probably just record my entire leveling process up to 80 um, in my free time and then stitch all that together into like a video with some of like the more interesting moments and like little things that you can do to help with leveling and um then when i start uh, gearing this character up at level 80 i currently plan on making a video that's basically how to get caught up in wrath classic which is basically the exact same format that i did for my retail catch-up guide but with classic right with um you know, all the different things you can use to get gear. Crafting, honestly, cheap BOEs is not a bad way either. Uh, and then, of course, Titan Rune Dungeons are going to play a huge factor in terms of gearing up. But the entire point of that isn't necessarily just to list out, these are the things that give you gear, but like, what order should you do it in? Because a lot of times, it's easy to look at stuff and say, this gives good gear, but should I jump right into it? Or are there other easier things I should do to get gear first? And I like to do those videos in the format of like outlining the process in which I took to get my character geared. And then as I touch upon a new method, I expand upon that and give like surrounding detail, but it follows like the general narrative of getting a character geared up, like the process of doing that rather than just like, here are the things that you need to farm. Um, and generally speaking, I feel like that format has been pretty well received for uh, retail because those videos have done exceptionally well, and I've gotten a lot of good feedback on that, so I think a similar thing for Classic would probably be very helpful. Anyways. Um, was a max level character, you still died a few times? Yeah, I mean, it's still, it's previous expansion content, so it's still not, like, completely old. Uh, super late for you, it's only 5 a.m. here, pretty early still. Yeah. I mean, hey, I'm probably going to be up till 5 a.m., but streaming is, like, always twice as exhausting as just, like, you know, doing stuff normally. And I also woke up pretty early today. I woke up at, like, 7 a.m. because I went to sleep early last night. So it has been quite a long day for me. Uh, Negan said, Your grandfather played three hours of Bellular videos during a road trip. The volume was quite loud, and your grandmother screamed at him to turn it down. Your grandfather shouted some heinous things at her. Ah, there we go. It's 9 p.m. here, early but late for you, past your bedtime. Oh yeah, I can't even begin to start falling asleep until it's like past midnight, past 1 a.m., really. Uh, that's when I start to like actually pass out. Um, Sounds like you did it already, but useful to know in the future. Yeah, basically any tank spec uh, class is good for soloing, especially prop pallies, blood DKs. Naomi said you ended up soloing the last chunk of assault in a pug on in Mythic on your Death Knight, had everyone sharing in Discord. Nice. That's always a fun feeling. Just like Blood DK being broken and soloing the entire fight. I assume you were managed to you managed to solo it even through like the door slam, because I think it does magic damage, right? So you could probably just let the boss hit the door and then AMS and death strike back. Jesus fucking blood DKs. Uh you're uh Worgen Druid, you just hate tanking. Yeah, but the thing about, like, tanks for solo content is you're just a beefier DPS. Like, I can understand not wanting to tank in groups, because tanking in groups is a very different dynamic, right? You're expected to hold threat, you're expected to know the route, etc. If you are doing solo content and you're playing a Guardian Druid, you still have, like, damage abilities that you can use, and honestly, Guardian Druid damage is very good. 
Um, they're like a beefier feral, but then you have so many like survivability things that you can use to reduce your damage. You have a like frenzied regen, which just does ridiculous healing and solo content. So honestly, soloing stuff as a tank, I'd say just try it. I think you'll find it to be very fun because you have all of the benefits of being an unkillable god with none of the pressures of having to like tank for a group. You just get to sit there and not die to anything and still do strong damage. I love soloing content as a tank. It's super duper broken. You did three slams? Damn. Yeah. Because if you let it hit the door, like, there's no heart and rage, I think, right? So the only thing is the barrier backfire, provided you aren't soaking. And I'm pretty sure the barrier backfire doesn't ramp in damage, right? It just does does like a fixed magic value to the entire raid, which obviously it's a high enough fixed magic value that it'll pretty much kill anybody else that isn't a tank. And if you don't have like fucking AMS and Death Strike, it'll probably one shot you. Like even Brewmaster Barrier Backfire does most of my health and I don't really have ways to recover that. But for sure. Uh, you'll try that next time you get, um, next time you got the Serpent just took a while. Yeah, for sure. Uh, it's just the debuff from soaking that ramps up. Yeah, the debuff, like, when you, uh, split the damage of the door. It seems kind of like an oversight. I'm surprised they let it ship like that, because most fights have some sort of built-in hard and rage that you can't live through as a tank. Because I feel like it's weird that you can just let the slam hit over and over, but now that you mention it, yeah, I really don't think there is any hard fixed timer to assault. I'm not even sure if there's, like, a hard, hard enrage where he just, like, does 500% increased damage. I, yeah. I mean, maybe? But it's like, you would have to go through so many door slams to even see that. And it's not in the journal, so... Honestly, I have no idea. Either way. Um, I'll stop it there, because I could keep, like, rambling, talking, responding to the chat. It is always fun to talk to people. But I gotta stop it somewhere. Um, so I will stop it here. But thank you everybody for watching. I hope you enjoyed the Frost Mage speedrun. And sorry I didn't get to do as much Wrath Classic as I liked. But I got to show some hard mode dungeons. Maybe for people who haven't tried it yet. And I don't know. Maybe you found that interesting. Um, but I will stop it here. And next weekend I will be streaming again. One day as usual. Uh, for right now. I'm not sure if it will be Saturday or Sunday yet. I'll let you guys know in Discord and in a YouTube post as always. Um, but yeah. Thanks everybody. Uh, good night, and I will catch you next weekend. <laughs> Remember to promote Rage Shadow Legends. Oh my god. Alright, good night. Peace.